All right, hello and welcome to the Metaverse Super Series. This is Sean Emery, the co-founder of Avery and Company, an investment firm out of Miami, Florida, investing in structural growth stories and transformation stories. Today, we will be breaking down the Metaverse from different angles. The series really will focus on the ecosystem, future opportunities, and even more importantly, what is happening today. We have tons of special guests that include all aspects of the ecosystem. We think for the industry to get to its potential, uh, it'll require a thriving ecosystem of not only developers, but partners, users, and enthusiasts. So today we have many of those to help us think through this with a balance of perspectives. Now, before we move on to the sessions with guests, let's broadly define this oftentimes obscure term, the metaverse. So let's begin. At Avery, we believe that the term metaverse is an imprecise term that actually perfectly frames the industry's future. Now, for any investment and the analysis around it, it really starts with what problem is trying to be solved. We believe that that's ultimately the best way to communicate the definition is by problem solving. So today you'll hear a lot about that. The world is filled with many physical tasks, structures, processes that do not necessarily demand a physical solution. That really helps articulate the potential commercial use case here. So if you take things like the process of building an airplane or furnishing a home, for years, you know, that process has been done via physical prototyping and ultimately trial and error. We think creating a digital twin of your home with precise measurements uh, really can lead to future advantages for many constituents around that process. You know, the metaverse, quote unquote, is the technology, the ecosystem that allows and will continue to allow many of these processes to be digitized in a way where communities come together to build many of the digital solutions. So here's a simple example, Skip using Meta, Matterport uh, to capture the digital version of a home or quote unquote, a digital twin and designing a full home during the pre-renovation uh, process or a pre-construction process. It is a tech forward renovation company. We handle the end-to-end -end renovation process for kitchen and bathrooms. We went with Matterport because with the data capture that we could get from the digital twin, we could really transform very quickly the possibilities of the space and with the right technology, really help to streamline the entire pre-construction process. When it comes to renovations, customers are really looking for convenience and quality of service. It's not uncommon for homeowners to visit multiple showrooms, get multiple bids, have repeat visits from different professionals. And from a single Matterport digital twin, we get to remove all that. We can produce accurate renderings, full breakdown of costs, materials, including labor, construction documents, and we can do this all really within just a few days. 
a customer can come to Skip and very quickly they can book a Matterport 3D professional to visit their home. We collect some information and preferences from the homeowner and very quickly in just a couple days, they receive multiple layouts with rendering and full breakdown of costs. So it really is a tremendous amount of value and it really helps us solve that fundamental problem. Now take physical objects such as the computer screen. The big question, do you need to carry a laptop from Miami to New York or buy multiple kind of computer monitors to ensure our productivity? The solution is quite apparent. A single device that occupies little to no physical space that allows the ability to move between our virtual realities, our augmented realities, and simple real life in a way that we do and work today. Here's Marquez Brownlee, one of the most important tech influencers slash analysts. He's known for covering Apple incredibly well in extensive ways. Check out this clip of him using a Quest Pro pass-through whole metaverse and the future of VR stuff, but this is just a single laptop and the new Quest Pro paired together and with this real-time pass-through. I mean, <laughs> say what you want about the whole vision, but I don't know, if you throw enough money at something, you can make a pretty technically impressive thing. It's just taking three monitors with you everywhere you go. Um, what you can see here is, you know, he is essentially, you know, replacing many of the physical objects and using a computer screen with multiple computer screens around it. So replacing physical objects with digital renderings, that is available today. Uh, and we think again, over time, that will continue to improve. You know, that is pretty impressive. But if you think about it for a moment, the cost of these three monitors, that would equate to somewhere around $500 to $1,000 just for the monitors. If you go for the high end side of monitors, you know, each monitor could cost up to, you know, $1,500. Do that times three, you get to some pretty large numbers there. If we put this into some perspective, and really around you know investable opportunities. The size of the monitor market today is somewhere around 160 billion to 200 billion alone. That's just the monitor market. We are starting to get some pretty interesting big numbers with some pretty interesting and tangible use cases that are the lowest hanging fruit. So let's move on. Outside of business tools, there are social and entertainment networks that already exist. Roblox obviously is a powerful example of this. It has individuals building social communities where the community is not only the creator, but also the participant. And that's important, all of this in a digital realm. This concept or that concept of a digital environment world, it tends to be taken to the extreme. And we hear parallels to a dystopian society. Now at Avery, we believe a small sample of individuals will constantly immerse themselves in the virtual world. That is far from the big picture of what we see. As these commercial and social experiences grow, we also think it's pretty easy to think about how the second and third order economic impacts will occur. Products on top of products and layering and layering as we saw across other devices before us, the mobile device and the computer. So far, we have spoken about the concepts that are often included in the realm of the metaverse and that list can continue to grow. You know, use cases we are seeing around training our education, that is, you know, training pilots, training in the surgery room, training for technicians. We have some of those companies that are building those products today on this series. So make sure you listen to those. We have heard use cases for things like wedding planning, specifically wedding planning outside of your hometown where you can see and feel and touch what that experience would be like without actually having to travel to that location. These are small samples, yet taken together, the sum of the parts is quite large. There's many others, but you know, for us, the best way to think about this is that anything that can be digitized to improve outcomes and reduce costs, i.e. the computer example, will do so. And in order to do this, it'll take a heavy dose of computing power, uh, i.e., you know, the infrastructure side of the metaverse. It will require an operating system or platform similar to the app stores we see today. It will require developers to build tools for tangible use cases. Those are the important stepping stones to this reality of which part of that reality already exists today. Now, again, this is happening today. And today, what we wanted to do was bring on a series of guests to help attach us to the real world examples and all of the creative minds that are building and thinking about all the different use cases around the metaverse. So let's get the show rolling. We'll start with Amal Dorai from Anorak Ventures. We'll bring him on here in a second. His, he's the partner at Anorak. His partner was a seed investor in Oculus. They know this space well and have been part of this story since the origin of the one of the most successful devices, uh, companies that have been part of the metaverse concept. So with that, let's bring on Amal and I hope you enjoy the entire series. All right, so we're here with Amal Durai. He is a partner at Anorak Ventures. Welcome, Amal. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, so let's start with uh, you know telling us a little bit about yourself. 
uh, and Interact, you know, the origin story and, and also, you know, where you specialize. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you first about Anorak. So Anorak was started by Greg Castle, who's the managing partner. It's just the two of us. Um, so Greg was a seed investor in Oculus. Um, and that uh, investment obviously, you know, sold to Facebook for $3 billion within, uh, you know, a couple of years of being founded. Incredible success story. So coming out of that success, um, he um, did some angel investments and then started Anorak Ventures. Um, Anorak is a British slang for someone who's incredibly obsessive about something and, hmm. and um, kind of a, a more extreme version of a nerd. And uh, those are the founders we tend to invest in. So we invested in, we invest in differentiated technology um, and, you know, companies with a technological advantage. And, um, you know, we have, I would say about a third of our portfolio in VR. And we also invest in what we call computing in the third dimension. So bringing in intelligence from the physical world, computer vision, AI, um, sensing, and then outputting into the physical world from the digital world, um, robotics, connected hardware. Um, and so we, we've been around since 2016. And my personal story is I was an entrepreneur in enterprise software. I started a collaboration company called uh, Live Loop. Uh, we sold that to Microsoft in 2015, where I came in and kind of helped integrate the Live Loop tech into the fabric of the Office 365 real time collaboration platform. So I was always thinking about enterprise collaboration. And kind of last year, I was thinking about starting another enterprise collaboration company. And I sort of started to break the problem down into first principles. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're talking to each other like this. I don't particularly enjoy it. And I was thinking, you know, what is it that makes in-person conversations so much more pleasant, engaging, fun than, um, than remote work? And that's when I started to get into, you know, what is the real difference between seeing someone in flesh and seeing someone on a screen? And that 2D to 3D gap is where I started to think about VR. And then as soon as I put on that Oculus Quest 2, um, I said, you know, this is where I want my career to be. So I I started writing about VR, um, connected with Greg, and I joined Anorak um, earlier this year in February. Awesome. Yeah, no, obviously a, an incredible success story for you both. Um, the, you know, I think the, the, the foundation of this conversation is really around some of the stuff you're investing in, specifically mm -hmm. around, you know, the concept of the metaverse. And I, I think... Yep. One way we like to kind of frame the question, which is, you know, what is the definition? We know there's a lot of definitions that go in all different ways, but really it's around the use cases. Like what mm -hmm. use cases are you seeing? What tangible value is being created? And I think that's ultimately what allows, um, you know, this concept to come together. Right? You know, the media has some version of the of the metaverse, but like from your point of view, obviously you, you have an investment hat on, so you're seeing something there, right? Tangibly. Yep. Um, t talk us a little bit about, you know, your, your general definition in the lens of using use cases as, as the, the proxy. Yeah. So definitely the word metaverse has been overloaded from a marketing perspective. Um, when Mark Zuckerberg said he's all in on the metaverse last year, um, I think everyone who was marketing something decided to attach it to the word metaverse. Oh, we're, we're, we're metaverse -y. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know. I will leave aside any conversations about cryptocurrency and things like that because it's not where we it's not where we're involved. Um, the way I think about the metaverse is two things. One is the 3D aspect of it, the VR, AR, and then just the 3D aspect of you know you can have a 3D experience on a 2D screen like a video game, um, and this makes a huge difference in how real something feels to someone. So when we're playing a video game online, you know. It's, it's much different, and you have to really try it to feel it than if we're interacting with each other in these three environments. And the other aspect of metaverse that I think is pretty important is, um, you know, the massively multiplayer, multi-user aspect of it, that, you know, it's like Times Square in New York, everyone in one place. You can hear, you can see, you can't smell yet, but, you know, maybe for Times Square, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so... That aspect of it, that social aspect of it is also incredibly important. Um, so we make investments in areas that um, either do one or the other or do both. You know, I think one, you know, one thing that people say is, oh, that's not real metaverse because it's not a decentralized platform. That's not real metaverse because that's not in VR. That's not real metaverse because it's not ma massively multiplayer. 
to me, it's not so important whether it's like officially metaverse or not. The word the word means very little anymore. To me, I think of it from kind of more first principles. Is there good business here? So there's good businesses in in VR that have nothing to do with social, like uh, industrial training for hazardous materials, right? You know, um, instead of just reading a book or watching a video to actually practice handling these hazardous materials in VR. And there's real, there's there's big games. Um, there's there's big businesses like our our investment rec room. Um, which has a lot of VR users, but is not exclusively VR at all. And you know, more of the users are on mobile than on uh, than on VR. And that's powerful because it's massively multiplayer. So I think each of these aspects is important. Each of these aspects can create values in different ways, and we don't get too hung up on what the actual definition of metaverse is. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's our same point of view as well. Um, you know the stages of development in the, in the ecosystem. And that's kind of how I like to frame it as well as the ecosystem um, is, you know, from your lens, cause you're seeing a lot come your way, which is, you know, what's already happening versus, you know, where you think the space is going. And I, I think the point of that question is really to understand, you know, where are we today versus, you know, where we, you think we're going and tangible kind of um, value creation that's happening. And you talked about rec room and some others, um, just anything else you have around, you know, what's happening today uh, to level set that, you know, we hear the term metaverse and generally speaking, what people tend mm -hmm. to think is, you know, that's 10 years out. Um, yeah. But there's some of the aspects of this space that is definitely 10 years out, but there's a lot of it that's already happening and, and kind of already started happening at that original investment, you know, that your partner made in, in Oculus, um, yeah. which was kind of the, you know, the, the seeds to, I think, where we are today. So just, you know, where we are today versus where you think we're going. Yeah. So definitely there are you know businesses today in quote metaverse doing tens of millions of dollars of revenue that and growing very fast so you know founders should know that there is a real market here right and that there are real businesses to be built here um and even if you look at something like fortnite that has a that is you know that encompasses a lot of the ideas of metaverse multiplayer massively multiplayer online social gaming, right? Um, when it comes to the VR aspect of it, I think that um, the perceptions of this market have been excessively shaped by Facebook uh, or by, by Meta because of how much Meta is investing in this space and how, how dominant that narrative has become for them. So people in a way have lost, like a lot of the tech journalism around VR is really takes on Mark Zuckerberg, right? And um, I would say VR is much, much bigger than Mark Zuckerberg, right? So he is the biggest investor in this space. He's putting billions of dollars in it. He believes in it. I, I think it's great. And and everyone in the in the industry benefits from it. But, you know, the, if, if you don't like Meta or you don't like Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, that has nothing to do with VR. This is a massive technological revolution that is happening right now. And our founders are building businesses that are already big in it right now. So we have a company called Oso VR, and they do surgical training for doctors. Um, so you can imagine for any doctor out there, any surgeon, someone has got to be their first surgery. You know, you don't want it to be you. Right. But it's got to be someone. And what Oso VR does is it lets them practice that surgery in VR uh, on a patient who's obviously, you know, not going to be injured by it. So they can practice the motions and the and the and the, um, you know, physical aspects of his surgery hundreds of times before they do it on a real person. So is this good for the world? I mean, obviously, it's good for the world. It helps doctors be better. It, there couldn't be anything more un, uh, you know, undisputably good. And is it a good business? It's an incredible business. They just raised $70 million. A, a study just came out that said that they improve surgical um, training by 230%. So, you know, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't a small idea. This is a huge idea that's revolutioning, revolutionizing a major part of medicine. If you think Mark Zuckerberg has a weird voice, if you don't like him, that doesn't change the fact that Oso VR is changing the world right in front of us, right? So uh, I think the narrative around and you and I'm not a meta shareholder. So, you know, I'm not I'm not thinking about this from is, is it good? Is it bad that Mark Zuckerberg is doing this? You know, that's a question for 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 the equity analysts. My 
what I want to make sure people understand is that the VR market is real. The, the, the change that it's representing is real. The power of the technology is incredible. And, um, and I believe very strongly that, uh, that it will be a major part of how people interact with each other um, in the future. So I'm a huge believer in VR and in founders building in VR. And we've, we've invested in incredible companies in this space. Good. No, that was a good uh, summary of, of all that. And the Oso example, um, you know, I, I love the examples that kind of steer away from the gaming side. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. it's much more like commercial use and, and real world kind of mm -hmm. value for, you know, you and I. Um, yeah. I, I think one of my next questions was really going to be around, um, you know, whether you thought uh, Zuckerberg was actually directionally accurate here outside of, you know, dollars spent or anything like that. But, you know, he has, yeah, you know, he, yeah, he's put up, uh, you know, some of those things around. And it's our it's our belief as well, which is, you know, again, and I, I use this over and over again, which is, you know, we all have these physical things. And, and I, mm -hmm. we think, you know, the concept of the metaverse or whatever is really just digitizing all the physical things that don't need to be physical um, yep. in many ways on plus plus. Right. Because there's, you know, mm -hmm. there's other there's use cases that come from this that don't even have a physical kind of uh, counterpart uh, mm -hmm. to compare to. Um, so, again, yeah, that was, that was that question. You know, they announced the Quest Pro. What do you think about, you know, the product in general? Uh, what do you think it, you know, ultimately signals? This was much more of a mixed reality device, uh, mm -hmm. which has the pass-through capabilities. You know, this is the first one from them. Um, yeah. Quest Two was obviously a a, a home run uh, device from them. Um, now they're they're signaling something. So I just wanted to get your point of view of the device plus the signal that uh, you're kind of pulling from it. Yep. So directionally, do I believe that Mark Zuckerberg is correct here? Absolutely. I think he's seeing what a lot of other people aren't seeing and what a lot of other people don't have the courage to invest really strongly towards. So I think when you think of the founder CEO and the conviction that that enables and the kind of confidence and um, you know unflappability of Zuckerberg, I I'm, I'm uh, in strong admiration of it. Um, now with the Quest Pro, you know, they're definitely signaling their um, interest, Meta's interest in professional applications. Um, the device is much more comfortable, much clearer optics. It's definitely a super premium device, vastly better controllers. Um, and most importantly, the device can reflect your facial expression to the person on the other end, right? So normally, if you're just shut out from the outside world, the other person can't, can't see you. And what I think is, um, what I think people don't quite get yet about VR is that the single greatest thing it can do is connect you to another person. And I've talked to people in VR chat. I talked to a 16 year old boy who said that he, you know, had social anxiety. He had depression. He didn't like going to school. Um, he kind of, he, he was having a lot of um, problems in his physical life. In VR chat, he was he came to life. He was a, the most entertaining guy in the room. He he was a great storyteller. And then after some while, I you know I got into this conversation about him and found that this guy's living a great life with this technology, right? So why? Because it's helping him connect to another person, which is what Facebook's mission has always been since day one, right? And so I think what Facebook found is that if you just connect people over over a two D screen. Um, it kind of brings out the worst in them. But what I found in VR is that when you connect with someone in 3D, you know, it kind of brings in those social norms that we have when we meet someone in real life. The kind of things that people say to each other over Twitter or Facebook, they never say to someone in real life, right? People, when they meet someone at the grocery store, they're, they're pretty chill with each other. And so, um, and so the Quest Pro is really the vanguard device for this remote connection. Um, and I would say that it's not just a substitute for um, it's not just a substitute for a physical experience. It's not just, hey, I can now do in VR, you know, what I could do by flying. It actually enables capabilities that have never existed before. An example, one of our companies in our world, they do coaching um, in um, VR, like cognitive behavioral therapy. There's a group of, um, of people in there who get to participate completely anonymously. So their avatars, they, they speak as their avatars, but they can get coaching in a way where the other person never knows their identity. They never see their real face. That helps them open up in a certain way. 
Um, and the CEO of Interworld, Noah, um, was talking about how um, in, in some cases, first responders, you know, paramedics, um, uh, police officers, firefighters, there's a culture of not wanting or not being not wanting to be seen as seeking this kind of help. But doing it through VR lets them kind of open up in a way that they couldn't otherwise open up. So there are these experiences with that that VR enables that you couldn't buy for any amount of money in the physical world. It it cannot exist. Um, another example I'll give for you is a is a company that we've invested in called Numinos, which is doing travel in VR. So um, the CEOs. Um, Daniel and Marcelo, they operate walking tours in Prague. Now with their VR walking tours, you'll be able to go on a walking tour in Prague, but also put on your VR headset and see what was happening here in Prague 300 years earlier. Hmm. You can't buy that. You know, if you're, if you're Jeff Bezos, you can buy a trip to space, but you can't buy, you can't buy a time machine. So um, these are the kinds of experiences that, that are going to be enabled. But number one, it all gets down to connecting with other people. Um, and the Quest Pro is, um, is the business, business tool for that. This technology will eventually get into consumer headsets. But I think it's incredibly important. And we have, company, uh, we have a company called Arthur um, building kind of remote meeting spaces in VR, like Zoom for VR. Um, traction is incredible. Companies growing very fast. And people are, people are doing this. Boards are having you know, board meetings in VR. And... And the feedback is always that this was much, much better than doing this over a screen. Is it better than I, doing it in person? No, but um, you know that's not possible. I mean, uh, a lot of times you can't get together in person. So sure, and yeah, and, and you know, board meetings can have hybrid schedules now, where you know they meet once a year for kind of you know uh, much more a bigger event as opposed to you know four quarters uh, or something like that. You know, talk about the talent. Uh, this will be kind of the last question, and then I have you know, three, three, uh, you know, questions I'm asking everyone, but, you know, around talent, where, where's most of the talent coming from in this space? We've had some people from, you know, Nigeria on here. We've had, um, um, Iceland, uh, we've had, you know, um, Croatia, uh, different yep. areas uh, of the world. It, it sounds like, you know, the talent in this space is less purely, purely, you know, s traditional Silicon Valley and, and much more just widespread across the globe. And, and that that's yeah, encouraging to say the least. That is definitely true. Um, so the talent in VR, in, in, the talent in VR entrepreneurship comes from two different places. One is the people with an experience with experience in building 3D assets, and that's usually been for games. So there's all these game developers that that are supplying a lot of talent to VR. But there's also the domain experts. So our education investment, Prisms of Reality, the CEO Anurupa, she um, she ran math curriculum for. New York City public schools for the middle, New York, uh, middle school math for the New York City public schools, which gives her the domain experience to build uh, education company. So if you just came in with pure game development experience, well, you wouldn't know how to sell a product to schools, right? So I think it's the confluence of these two skills. One is the domain expertise in a particular, you know, line of business. And the other is the actual ability to, you know, build these 3D, um, to build these 3D worlds. Third is um, the ability to build the actual VR experience. And that's smaller. That's a smaller group of people, but it is widely distributed all over the world. So the two platforms that, that these are built in are Unity and Unreal. Um, and they are, Unity and Unreal developers are all over the world. Um, you know, our companies, we see, you know, oh, I have, an, I have an engineer in Chile. I have an engineer in Peru, one in France, one in, um, one in Slovenia. Um, you know, it's incredible how, um, how broadly distributed the technology is. The, the talent. Yeah, the talent levels. Cool. So, yeah. So three questions. I'll uh, I'll I'll leave you with. You know, mm -hmm. in, in terms of baseball, uh, you know, what inning do you think we are in terms of you know quote unquote metaverse uh, one mm -hmm. through nine? We are in the we are in the warm up pitches. So, the warm up pitches. Yeah, that's the first one I've heard there. Cool. Um, you know, what's one project? And again, you've said a lot, which is pretty cool. Um, what's one project that you've seen that excites you probably the most, or I'll even twist this question a little bit because you've given so many examples where mm -hmm. it was like that aha moment. You kind of elaborate on that too, but you know, anywhere around, you know, one project that really excites you an aha moment, maybe, um, anywhere you want to go with it. Um, I think one thing that really, really excites me is, um, the ability of VR and education. Um, and I've talked about this earlier, 
But I really think that um, there's a tremendous lack of most kids are not getting the best education they could be getting. And I think that um, I think that what the results that we've seen early on from VR education are so strong, and the, the the teachers are providing so much feedback about how strong this experience can be, not just because it physicalizes things and makes them real, but also because it shuts out all the other distractions and kind of puts you entirely in this headspace of learning this one topic. I'm incredibly um, excited about this space and. I'm excited about this space in terms of how it can benefit people all over the world. So I think it'll be a huge market. You know, ed tech spending, one of the things that I think we don't recognize as U.S. investors often is how how much private education spending there is all over the world. Um, you know, people spend, you know, essentially their life savings on their education, on their children's education all over the world um, to give their kids the skills that they need. And um, and this can be just incredibly good business and incredibly good for, for the world. Yeah, we, yeah, we love the ed tech space. Um, you know, number three is the hype around the metaverse. You know, overhyped, underhyped, or kind of like perfectly hyped uh, uh, in your in your lens. I I feel the hype around the metaverse is something that operates kind of completely independently to what I do on a day to day basis. When I think when when I look at when I talk to you know. Companies like Oso VR, Prisms of Reality, you know, surgical training in VR, um, education in VR, dating in VR, travel in VR. None of it, none of it succeeds or fails based on the hype in VR. It it succeeds or fails based on you know solving the problem for the user. So if you come in and you tell the surgeon, you know, um, we can improve your surgical training by two hundred thirty percent, they don't come and ask you, oh, but I heard like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, <laughs> I heard Meta stock is down forty percent. That's not what they say. They right. say, "Wow, great, give it to me." So, um, so I think this hype is what moves newspapers and gets clicks on blogs, but it's not what moves the needle for a lot of the companies that we work with. For us, for our companies, it's around you know um, solving user problems and giving them something that they're willing to pay for. So, um, ir irrelevant. Yeah, no, greatly. That was well put. Um, you know, let's stop there. You know, uh, you're a great follow on you know Twitter. Where can anyone find more about you know? yourself, interact. Just wanted to give you a second there. Sure. Um, you can check out our portfolio of companies and get in touch with us um, at anorak.vc. And if you're a founder raising capital, seed stage or pre-seed capital, um, you can submit your company there right on our website. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Amal Dorai, A-M-A-L-D-O-R-A-I. Thanks, cool. Sean. All right, Amal. Uh, appreciate you having on and we'll, we'll, we'll speak soon. Thank you. All right. So thanks again, Amal, for coming on. Um, you know, that was a very interesting conversation in general. They see a lot of kind of uh, companies in the space, which show actionable kind of use cases again. And again, you go back to the use case concept. I think that's vital and important as you continue to listen through uh, some of the, the Q&A that we have with many of the guests on here. You know, now I think it's important to turn even to a higher level, which is bringing on Q Harrison. You know, he ha currently works with kind of Mark Cuban and, and uh, growth initiatives there, but also you know, he wrote the Metaverse Handbook, which is a sim simple version of, you know, what's going on in this space. So let's go ahead and bring him on here to discuss what he views this space as and some of the uh, substantial use cases he sees. So let's do that. All right, Q Harrison, Terry, great to see you today. So I'm glad to have you on here. You know, we have a super series that we're putting together all around the metaverse, we have VC, founders, builders, you name it, really focused on specific industries. Uh, we'll have different individuals talking about that. For you, you know, it's really around a broader perspective. You wrote the book, uh, The Metaverse Handbook. Um, that's out right now. For the purpose of everyone, before we kind of dig into it, uh, is really give us the elevator pitch of yourself. I know you worked on growth initiatives with Mark Cuban. You wrote the book that you're highlighting there, and, and uh, you got it right here as well uh, for everyone. And, you know, tell us a little bit more about yourself and kind of what you're doing in this space and, and prior to. Yeah, by day, I mean, I work with Mark Cuban and work on growth initiatives for just growing the company. So growth marketing and all that. And then by night, I'm a future thinker. I like to think about the future of technology and the impact it has on our lives. And in the past few years, we've seen the emergence of some pretty spectacular digital technologies, one of them being NFTs. And that led me to the whole consensus of 
maybe we should make non-technical guides for people that want to innovate in these spaces, but don't necessarily know how to get started. So that was the impetus for the NFT handbook that did pretty well. And we got, you know, like, I don't know, like 12 or 13 uh, international translations within, not oh, even wow. within the first year. So the book was translated into several different languages. And I was like, wow, there's actually an appetite for this. And in the NFT handbook, uh, chapter nine, I detailed the metaverse. I was like, you know, your NFTs, they're not just going to exist as fidgetals um, where you're, you know, buying a digital object and then trying to figure out how to give it life in the real world. It's going to actually have some existence and permanence in these things known as the metaverse. Got a ton of questions about it. Went back to the publisher and said, hey, what if we did the metaverse handbook? And my co-author, DJ Ski, is actually the chief metaverse officer at TSX. They're spending about $25 billion in Times Square on probably the largest uh, Web3 digital activation. They're thinking about, you know, how does Web3 meet Broadway in, in, in Times Square? And how do you give some permanence to... Uh, the big drops that some of the, the, the celebrities like The Weeknd and others uh, do and when they do these big takeovers and how do you give life, like how do we rethink the the show? And so having some conversations with him and knowing that he was building metaverses, not only at that scale, but even other, installation, other installations with Snoop Dogg and Paris Hilton, I was like, all right, like I think we have something here. And so I started writing the, the metaverse handbook and quite frankly, the metaverse handbook to answer your, your first, first question in my mind is like the TED talk to the metaverse, right? It's like, if you want a little bit more than a 14 minute uh, speech and you need to know kind of in a non-technical way, what is the metaverse? Who's in it? Why are people even talking about it? Why did you know Mark Zuckerberg change the name of his company formerly known as Facebook to Meta? And what is really the opportunity for people of all sizes? That's what the book does. Now there's other books too. If you want to go super in depth, you want to get it at the, the protocol level and things of that nature. And I, I consider those like some of the metaverse Bibles but for the, the non-technical person that just needs the, the quick brief, whether you're a decision maker at a company or you're an entrepreneur in college just seeking out and finding your riff, or maybe you're a mid-career professional and you're trying to figure out, you know, what is this metaverse? Why are, are all these companies talking about it? I created the book for you to just pick it up and, and you know, quickly, if you read 10 pages a day in two weeks, you'll, you'll, you'll have a primer on the metaverse. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So Let's go there. Instead of really trying to, let's say, define the elusive metaverse, let's go straight into kind of what problems are being solved here uh, from your lens. What are you seeing from a problem solving standpoint? I think that is the big question, specifically in the world of investments is, you know, what problems are being solving, solved and the technology will enable. Um, so anything you're seeing there? I mean, there's a lot that the metaverse is solving. And I think that that's what it gets a bad rep for, because the question is, like, what is a metaverse? That's sure. oftentimes... Uh, regarded as like the, the 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 point, that's the stale point. That's the point that everybody like gets stuck on and then we never get past to like what examples work. I think the metaverse is really good at creating digital twin environments. Digital twin environments are spaces that exist in a digital world that replicate basically what we're experiencing in the real world uh, with some modifications, uh, Abby, if, that, if that's what you want to have. And so when I think about the metaverse, I think some of the first interactions that we're going to have that are actually going to be like super, super impactful are probably going to come by way of training, probably going to. So like when you think of like, like flight simulators, like the fact that like there's there's instruments that used to cost like half a million and more uh, can now be realistically achieved with, you know, one of these, uh, a flight, a flight that control and <laughs> a uh, maybe a thousand dollars on the table to gear, put all this stuff together. And now you have the. You have competing, I mean, and then plus your computer costs, but like, let's just say all in for two to $3,000, you could get a flight simulator and you could teach yourself how to be a pilot. That's absurd, man. Like, like that car, that like the barrier to entry is just drastically decreased and you're going to see, you know, an uptick. Now you can make the argument that like planes are going to fly themselves, but you can apply this to many other pro pro professions. That was just one example. I mean, I've seen racing simulators. I've seen baseball simulators. Like there are some really good training simulators in these environments, whether you're trying to be a pilot, a baseball star, uh, a tennis star. And, and when I say training, I mean that these are things that professionals can use that will actually get you some real world experience. And so that's like one area that like actually does excite me. Um, another area that excites me is like the whole concept of connection. So when we think about the metaverse and like the definition I like to use is like one, it's the evolution of the internet and the internet's evolving. And as it evolves, there's this whole new uh, paradigm shift that we now are working with because technology allows for it. And that is known as the spatial web or literally the spatial internet. And at its, at its core, at like when we actually 
like hit hit that 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 equilibrium and like we've reached this hologram should be possible so what we saw in the sci-fi movies when they're making diagrams appear in real world or you're you're beaming yourself to someone's uh television or living room like the technology will go from what we're doing right now like of of a 2d virtual zoom chat and it will be something where it's a lot more like like i can we can we can we can look like princess leia in star wars and so like when we get there the question is like what what how many steps does it take before we get there and like what 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 is the route to that to that space? Like, what's going to change? And I think one of the things that we have to do right now is we have to get comfortable with the technology. So there's a lot of technologies that exist in the metaverse as we speak, um, not just talking about the headsets, but some of the software on it that do give us a little bit of a glimpse as to what this could look like at scale. Um, I always look at VR chat and some of the communities that have uh, ensued within VR chat because it's it's a it's a space that largely is only visited with you know a, a headset. The headset doesn't matter so much to make model, so you can get in. Um, whether it be a Meta headset, whether it be a HTC headset, whether it be a Valve headset, like there's, there's, there's like it's an agnostic platform, which is cool. It does still sort of look like a video game, but there's some elements in there that actually uh, show us the way forward. There are people starting businesses in there, whether it be a translation business, whether it be dancing, whether it be uh, people uh, creating movie theaters in, in the space. There's people like you know that create whole movies. We saw that, uh, and I talk about that in the book with uh, Joe Hunting. Uh, we met in virtual reality. It's now available on HBO Max, but when we were writing the book, it was only you could only see it if you went to Sundance. And so what's fascinating to me is like the cultural connections that we will see. Like there's gonna be a whole new generation of creators the same way YouTube introduced us to vloggers, the same way that uh Instagram introduced us to the the influencers as we know them today, where you're taking selfies and you're doing it for the gram. The metaverse will create content creators that are empowered by non-player characters and bots and uh, have uh, have like spatial awareness to, to like the, the the spaces they've been in. Like, it'd be really cool when I go to a restaurant, if I could just uh, have a device that like allows me to capture myself in a spatial environment and then allows me to leave a review at the restaurant. Like that like sounds really futuristic, but it's probably doable today. Like the technology we need to make that happen is there. Maybe the bandwidth as far as uploading and compressing those files, that might be the hardest part, but like we could build that network today and you could have a Yelp where it's not just a review. People can talk and they can express and they can show what was going on. And like that is captured there. So when you go there, if you have, you know, seven friends that have also been here and they said, don't order this, order this, but it's like a visual thing. It's not something you have to read. I think that that would actually be kind of cool. And that's just like me uh, ruminating. But at the same time, like that's the cool thing about the metaverse today is like the innovators can create experiences that just weren't had it possible uh, just 10 years ago. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's there's almost the social communication gaming side of the equation. There's there's also the commercial side of the equation where you talk about training. Uh, we're seeing some of that, I think, at the Meta uh, Connect uh, um, event. They basically highlighted how uh, Accenture had uh, roughly 60,000 Oculus Quest across its company, um, which just shows you how one of the biggest consulting firms out there is actually trying to empower their users to then obviously go out and consult I don't think they would be doing that if they didn't see real interest from their co customers or basically the biggest companies in the world, mainly, mainly all the companies in the world. Uh, on the gaming side, again, kind of to just further uh, illustrate what you're talking about, which is, you know, you have Roblox sitting here with 50 million plus users on a monthly basis, talking using the same type of experiences you're talking about, maybe not in VR per se, but in virtual worlds where they're doing things and creators are building. Um, talk about, I don't know if you, you got a chance to look at Medico the Connect. Um, do you have any like basic takeaways from that event? Did it kind of further emphasize your views of where we're headed? Uh, did it keep that at the status quo or anything around kind of the event or takeaways from like the Quest Pro or anything that you wanted to share? Yeah, I mean, like, I think that first, you know, it's it's exciting to see a company like uh Facebook or formerly Meta, formerly font. I'm just going to refer to them as, as, as for the sake of confusion, because I feel like if we call them Meta, like, and we're talking about the metaverse and you don't know what the metaverse is, uh, you might get, you might get confused. So I'm just right. like, uh, Alphabet, Google, you know, yeah, we, <laughs> exactly. Like we still recall, yeah, like their parent company is Alphabet. That's a great example. So the company formerly known as Facebook, now known as Meta, I think has done a good job of keeping the hype alive around this whole notion of the metaverse. I still think we're in probably the first inning. Like we don't have 
the headsets aren't powerful enough, right? Because if you've been in true metaverse environments, so I'm talking about like desktop powered VR, and then you look at what is available on a standalone, standalone gives you accessibility, which will no, undoubtedly get you the, the numbers that you need to see in order to make uh, substantial investments and bets. But the thing that we haven't gotten to is we haven't moved too much, too much beyond the needle in gaming on the standalone side. Like some of the coolest things that you were talking that we were seeing at Meta uh, Connect was like the Iron Man VR game now finally being ported over to the 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 Meta uh, Quest platform. Uh, they announced a partnership with uh, Microsoft and XCloud, and I thought that that was fascinating. But again, you're gaming in 2D, so it's like if you have like a 20 inch screen, maybe you want to play an RPG game on a, a screen size of your choice. You can connect the controller and have fun, but that still is it's still not exactly the metaverse that we've been promising. Like that's not the spatial environment I was just talking about. I think the fact that they have a fitness API uh, on the fitness side was cool. Mm-hmm. I thought that that was a really strong yeah. um, demonstration of them understanding what the the use case, the active use cases for the quest today are. I do think that like the quest is probably one of the, the it's a better device than a Peloton. Um, my opinion on that is a Peloton is one dimensional. You buy a Peloton bike, they have different programming and, and you can access that programming, but you can really only do one thing and that's bike. And then and they have different Peloton offerings and they have the treadmill and some other things. But when we get to it, they're very one dimensional devices. The reason why this succeeded is it was multifaceted. And so if we take a look at the quest today, the fact that I can put this on, uh, go into it, uh, have an experience that allows me to work out and do different types of workouts, whether I want to do a beat saber or I want to do, you know, a boxing workout, or I want to do some crazy cardio fitness thing, like a hit. There's all that in there. If you even want to play a virtual game of tennis, like not the, not the simulators, but like just a game of tennis, you can do that and get moving. And in a, in a world where I think we're all very sedentary, like this is, this is the way forward and having it connect with Google fit and Apple health, I thought was just like, you know, a genius model. I think the avatar side that they talked about at, at Meta, Meta, Meta Connect or yeah, Meta Connect is, um, I think it's like, we're still very far from people realizing the importance of an avatar. I think we probably, I don't know when that shift will be, but the avatars that I really do appreciate the most are probably the ready player me. Cause they, they're not like that ecosystem just feels to me like the right space as it, uh, as it pertains to like what the metaverse could be like. So it's like, think about a handle. Like if you're a verified professional, you probably have your handle and your handle is probably the same on all your, your channels. Like at least in the perfect world, that's how you would, you would do it. So your Twitter handle is the same as your Instagram handle, which is the same as like your YouTube handle, etc. cetera. Uh, if you can't get that to happen, it's not, it's not the end of the world, but like, I think the avatar is pretty much the handle. And so I don't think mm. we should live in a world where, you should have to change your avatar in every single environment that you go in. You need to be in a space where you design an avatar and they're, comp- they're cross-compatible uh, against these different domains um, that we'll be experiencing just because there's going to be way too many uh, way too many environments and like the username and password fiasco, we're largely getting around that in the metaverse. Right. Do appreciate, but the avatar thing is like the rebirth of a problem we've already solved. And so, yeah, that's an interesting concept. I haven't heard the uh, username avatar kind of uh, comparison or analogy, which is uh, I, I find actually somewhat fascinating going forward. Yeah, like that's it. the interoperability of avatars matters a lot. That's why I kind of really do rock with what Ready Player Me is doing in the sense that they're saying, "Hey, we have these. You can use them wherever." And we're in, we're we're telling developers to like integrate our our SDK so that way uh, you don't you as a user if you have a wallet or if you have a login. That that avatar is associated with it, and there's a connect a way to connect it. Um, obviously, the the biggest the biggest biggest thing in the room, like you talked about with the Accenture, was Meta talking about workplace and productivity. Now, I think that that's probably the most exciting use case for all of the Meta headsets is the fact that they have pass through. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the Quest Two, the current Quest that most people have, is like a and pass still- through. Pass through for everyone listening is is essentially being able to replicate kind of the real world around you so that I can literally be sitting here at my desk, see a digital screen, but also see the room around me, which I think a lot of people hate. Some, some people, a subset of the people hate the experience of, of being in a device and not understanding what's happening around you. Yeah. So so I, I just wanted to clarify that. 
No, I appreciate that. Like that, like sometimes when I'm flowing, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I try <laughs> they, to, they, I try to make they it didn't write the meta handbook. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I try to, I try to make it as accessible as possible, but sure, sure. I'm, I'm in my meta bag right now. The, the meta, the former, the former Facebook company. So, um, <laughs> The question, so the question I have about workplace pl- productivity is like, until either the headsets get lighter and the fit is better, I don't really see anyone having extended use, 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 usage in these headsets. That's part of the reason why um, there's a Kickstarter campaign where they're making the first custom interface for uh, the, the Quest platform. You got to check that out. It's by the Magic 5 on Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, they just launched it about a week, a week ago. And like what they do is they have software that analyzes your face and then you can take out this insert right here, like I just did, and they give you a new insert that's custom fit to your face. So they make like mm. some of the world's best swimming goggles. So like, like triathlon, tri- triathlon athletes and um, Olympians and things of that nature, they all use their like their, their tech and their, their products. But the way they make those gog- the, the swimming goggles is they actually do face scans. And so they were like, what if we took the same method and approach to the headsets? Now, I think technology like that is super exciting because when we get to workplace productivity, I'm expecting you to use this headset and battery concerns aside, it's got to be comfortable. And that's sure. one of the things that if you spend any reasonable amount of time in VR or just the metaverse, as we know it today, these headsets, they do, they get heavy. They leave these marks around your eyes. It's not uh, a fun experience. So fixing the comfort element and seeing the third party marketplace kind of get into that, that to me is super exciting. The next thing I think is like just genius and, and, and what I'm, I'm most excited about on the the just workplace productivity side of MetaConnect is the fact that pass through does exist. And so now on the Quest 2, you have pass through and it's pretty much like that of a, let's just say a, 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 a black and white TV. Like pass through there is just what black and white TVs were uh, in 1970s. Where we are with the the pass through on the 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 new meta quest pro it's like a color tv so life is it's gonna come like with what life. color can come to life and <laughs> yeah. so i think that will be much more exciting i think that collaboration and a color environment with pass through is gonna be one that is 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 actually enjoyed I have this right here yeah that right there exactly and then the pri- the the privacy element is actually something that i don't think meta did a really good job of talking about if I have an employee and they have, you know, four or five screen monitor desk set up at, at work, pretty much unless they put privacy screens on all those monitors, pretty much anyone can see what they're working on. And so there's some privacy concerns, especially at companies that are working on, you know, sensitive information or, or big data projects that, you know, you, you, there's 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 some risk. If I put you in here, mm. I know that, you know, who the intended viewer is of those displays and, and, and documents are. And I think that that is a great selling point for some of these on these these enterprise companies that do value security and do want to be a part of the future. So I think that that's one thing with the color and just the the upgraded RAM on the Quest Pro. That's going to be exciting. I thought it was fascinating that you know Microsoft and um, Facebook kind of decided to come together and provide a lot of the workplace um, productivity acts. Acts. I really would have wished to see Google and Facebook do that. I think that that would have been a, a better collaboration for many regards, but Microsoft feels like the safe, uh, the safe bet. I think yeah, if you want to land the enterprise, the enterprise customer, Microsoft has a good grip on those. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I think strategically, like when you think about the the metaverse as we know it, Google is probably the one. Like, if you have to compete against Apple, so if we say Apple is going to win this, like uh, whenever Apple decides to make their headset. They're gonna they're gonna have market share, right? And everyone's gonna have to compete and contend with it because this is a company that made the MacBook, the iPhone, and the iPad, yeah. etc. King of hardware, exactly. Google has a bit more software integrations that I think uh, that could be exciting to the metaverse. Remember, Niantic was a former Google product, so there was Google engineers that built Niantic. Niantic would go on to give us uh, Pokemon Go and uh, several other XR experiences, which you can hands down say is one of the best. Uh, probably one of the best uh, in my mind. I think you know Pokemon Go is probably the best example of a metaverse uh, that we all that was accessible to all. Right. And like that happened in 2016. So when we get back to where this is going to go in just the next few years, this gets really exciting. And so like I think that that experience combined with the social elements and the social graphs that Facebook would have access to 
I think they could have just did more more cool stuff like Google Maps. If I could do interactive things again in in, in the, the Quest 2 platform there, I think that that would have been exciting. I don't think Google's that great at hardware, right? They don't really, I mean. Yeah, the, they've struggled. Yeah, the Pixel phones, like they're just now finally figuring that out. And phones are pretty much going the way of, uh, you know, phones aren't phones aren't that innovative anymore. Like, smart, like if they had figured it out 10 years ago, it'd be a different story. But like, it took them a long time. I think Microsoft, when they merge with like Facebook and and, and, and and join forces like this, they kind of are throwing the towel in on the HoloLens, right? Like, let's not forget they spent, you know, billions of dollars, several billions of dollars on the HoloLens platform. And we did have a, a, a start to cut you off real quick, is we did have a, a, a someone we spoke with, the head of a Spark AR, or um, MetaSpark, one of the leaders um, in terms of leading instructors, basically highlighted that he was hearing anecdotally that HoloLens at some point was going to get shut down, um, which this is, I, I guess, quasi evidence of at least them de-emphasizing that platform from the hardware side and re-emphasizing um, their software abilities. Yeah, that's kind of lame because the HoloLens, I don't know if you've ever used it, but it was actually, a, it was really dope. Like the HoloLens was the one. It like, had a good name too. It had one of the cooler names out there. One of the cooler names and like the experience, like the fidelity was actually good. Like right. and the power was, it was actually a PC on your face. Like right. they, whatever you could dream of, you could do because you had an actual computer. This was not, you know, a, a, a skin version of Android per se. So right. not, uh, you know, I think that, that this was a big loss for Microsoft. I think that maybe uh, they, they will get more, more users in their cloud for sure. This is an extension of their cloud. And we know that Microsoft is spending a lot of time on thinking about how the cloud can help keep them relevant in the next a couple decades. And so sure. I think it's for strategically for that, it makes sense. But as far as like them being a big player and, and one of the best players in the space, uh, it, it sucks to see them concede. Uh, yeah. Beyond that, uh, the future interface stuff that Mark Zuckerberg talked about at uh, Meta Connect was actually probably the most exciting. The fact that they're thinking about how to do these interfaces without these controllers is like most genius thing to me because it still is imperfect. And I think having a, a platform where you just have to buy tons and tons of accessories, to me, that feels like the Wii. And the Wii was successful, but it didn't largely work, um, largely because they, we couldn't get one controller to rule them all, right? And right. you know, Nintendo really dialed in on that with the Switch. And that was a much more successful platform in the sense that you had the Wii functionality, but there was a lot more dexterity that you, that could be accomplished and achieved. And so, like when we look at just Meta Connect, uh, I know Lucky Palmer had some some thoughts. Uh, I didn't get a chance to actually watch that yet uh, prior to us recording this, but I, I I would recommend people check that out and then go check out what Lucky Palmer had to say because usually that's the best way to like cut through what's reality yes. versus uh, the mic mar the the marketing the speech. Sure. Cool. You know, we have another minute here. Um, basically, this was awesome kickoff of, uh, you know, the super series around the metaverse, the one that the individual that helped out and, and wrote the uh, the metaverse handbook. Um, you know, three questions for you real quick is in terms of baseball, you know, what inning are we in? We, you spoke about it before. Remind the, the, the listeners, viewers. What inning? Man, this, is, this, is, this isn't even the first inning. We're figuring out who's at bat. I mean, we're getting the batting roster right. And so if you want to get in the metaverse, literally show up, grab a bat. And just start practice swinging because the is. game hasn't started yet. Got it. Number two is, you know, one project that kind of comes to mind that you've seen that just kind of blows your mind. There's a lot. There's tons. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple because I think that there's there's it's it's not a one project thing right now. I think Beam is doing some incredible stuff. They allow, I think that they're probably going to be big on the Apple ecosystem if you see what they're doing there. So I think Beam VR or Beam AR, I think is the, the name of that company. They're doing crazy stuff. Dogamy. Brilliant concept, uh, being able to raise a pet in the metaverse uh, and, and getting actual user share enough so so much that, you know, Gap would go and partner with them and make clothing for said virtual pets. That's 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 crazy. It's kind of like Pokemon, right? It's, I mean, not Pokemon up. Uh, to whoa, whoa. Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi. It's go. way, way better because it's like. More immersive and everything. Remember yeah. uh, Nintendo DS and Nintendogs? Or remember that, that game? Yeah. Uh, yeah, vaguely. So, I mean, I it's like. It yeah, like Nintendogs was like a huge thing, especially in Japan. Uh, like we've seen what this could be on a Nintendo DS. Let's see sure. what this looks like in, a, in an interoperable metaverse environment yeah. where like you can go to a dog park with your friends and like watch a movie and let the dogs play. Like <laughs> the future for that is like very, it's something that I think will bring a lot of people into VR because they'll be not just uh, XR, I'm going to say XR, but VR too. Um, it'll be, be something that brings a lot of people into these metaverse environments because dude, that's a use case that, 
I think people can get into passively and it'll bring them back every day. You know, that's the thing that's missing is everyone has uh, uh, any, everyone that's an innovator has one of these headsets. I don't know which model they have, but they have a headset or they have access to a headset. The problem is there's not a lot of experiences that bring them back. And so they try it out. They do the boxing game once they, they watch a little bit of a movie once uh, they go check out a social environment. They, they get sick of filling the weight on their face. It's not like mind blowing because it's standalone. And then they set it down, it collects dust until like someone makes something new and that's six months to six to 12 months later. And then the cycle repeats itself. There's not many experiences that bring people back daily. And so that's what like I'm watching. The last thing that I think is really fascinating that I think about almost daily is CK Bubbles. Do you know who CK Bubbles is? I don't. They created an environment where by day they're an actual nail tech in New York City. So they actually create uh, nail art and for famous people and just people that want to get their nails done. It doesn't scale well. And celebrity nail tech, what do you do? You go on the metaverse and you allow wearable art for your avatars to be sold. And they're they're killing it. Like, I mean, it's not like millions, do- millions of dollars today, but these are some of the small signals you have to watch. And you sure. see them evolve into to really big things. It's kind of like everybody knew Travis Scott was going to be big, right? It was just a matter of when, right? The guy had, you know, joined... T.I. early on and did the Grand Hustle thing. Then he was working as a writer and, and producer for Kanye West for many years before he was Travis Scott, as we know him today. And so if you were paying attention to like who was the innovator in the space, who had the unique sound, you would have probably been able to really see the tra- like Travis Scott being a, a really big deal. Um, CK Bubbles, they're in the same bucket. It's like, if it's not this project, it's going to be one of the projects because they're independent. They're just a creator. They're making headwind and like, they're not doing anything that I feel like is corny. Like I hadn't seen that before. Joe hunting was exactly when we were writing the book, it was kind of like, this is why I'm writing this book is this, this dude redefined what it means to make a screenshot, like, and then monetize a screenshot, right? Like (laughs) he, he got paid to do a screen recording of a video game environment and, uh, sold that to HBO max. Like that is crazy. Anybody could anybody watching this can can press screen record and like tell a story. But that's why I say the metaverse is not even in its first inning. It's like you're trying to figure out your, your swing and like right. uh, and, and what and, and, and what you can do with the bat. Got it. Last question. Is the hype perfectly balanced? Is it uh overhyped, underhyped? That's a good question. I would say like right I now the metaverse is too- yeah, it's too buzzwordy, right? Like, so it's it's way too overhyped. It's way way too much sauce in this in this pot. Uh, we've got to we've 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 got to do great work as the actual innovators that are building experiences that are on the ground of communicating what's happening and and setting re, readjusting expectations and telling people that look, this is not going to happen tomorrow. This might take six to ten years, but those that are working on this now, when this gets big it's going to be really, really big. And, and I'll close on this. If you don't believe me on that, you know, I'm just going to give you some stats that, 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 that came from MetaConnect 2022. There was an emphasis on one in three apps in the Quest store is making 1 million plus in gross revenue. So one in three apps is making 1 million plus in gross revenue. There's money on these platforms, right? Especially if you're any developer and you just spend some time figuring out how to build and you make something that people can use, your odds of getting a million dollars plus in gross revenue are pretty high. On top of that, there's 33 apps that are making 10 million plus in gross revenue. And that's up from February of this year where they only had 22 apps. So there are apps that are figuring out how to get the scale, how to get you know $10 million in gross revenue. And the thing that really stood out to me was some of the how fast some of these apps are making money. Uh, Walking Dead, uh, the Saints and Sinners game on, on Quest generated 50 million plus revenue on just the Quest platform alone. That's absurd. It means like if you have a big brand and you have like a, a story to tell and you can bring that to life in an XR environment, like there are people that will pay to experience those those concepts. Um, and then Resident Evil earned $2 million in 24 hours. Like they dropped it and it was like, all right, cool. Here's Resident Evil 4. A lot of people wanted to play that in VR. There was a shock factor because, you know, it's Resident yeah. Evil, so it's scary. And it's a game also that's nostalgic. Like, I mean, I remember when Resident Evil 4 came out. It was a big deal. Like that was the... That was that was in the, that was in the heyday of the consoles as we knew them. Um, so before next gen consoles came, like Resident Evil Four was a big deal. So I look at it and say that like there's a lot of opportunity for developers and innovators and business people and people that have hobbies and you know people that just want to explore the interest of the metaverse to make real money. And even though it's super early, 
there are these these headsets aren't cheap. So you're dealing with kind of an iPhone persona where, sure. you know, Android, it was harder to make money on that platform. Whereas iPhone, people were spending six, seven hundred dollars on a phone. So asking them to give you three dollars wasn't that that big of a deal. Makes a lot of sense. I agree. You know, Q Harrison, go get his book. Number one. Number two, again, appreciate you coming on. Uh, I think, you know, learned a lot about all the different aspects of, you know, what you see from the metaverse from top down and even some of the bottom up stuff that you, you spoke about. Um, you know, as we move through this series, I think a lot of people, we're going to have gamers on here. We're going to have VC firms on here. We're going to have builders on here. Uh, and I think what you're going to find is a lot of what Q Harrison just said, uh, you're going to hear from the mouths of the individuals actually building. And there's going to be that synergy between the two. Again, Q, appreciate you coming on. Uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks again, Q Harrison, uh, for coming on here. Um, make sure to go get his book. Uh, you know, now it's, let's turn to Archeo, which is really around architecture and design. Again, very much similar to the opening remarks that we had. I think this space has a lot of tangible use case to it. Um, and the team at Archeo is building some pretty impressive stuff. I've seen kind of some of the webcasts and webinars they're doing, and I had a conversation with him uh, as well prior. And I think, again, what you'll see here is a pretty impressive product. And again, it's day one. So let's go ahead and bring on Archeo uh, to the series. All righty, we're here with Hilmar Gunnarsson. Welcome uh, to the series. Thanks, uh, glad to be here. Yeah, so you are the founder, the CEO of Archeo, or Arc.io. Um, yep. You know, watched your demo event on the Meta Quest 2. Pretty interesting uh, product that you guys have built and continue to build. You know, I think for the audience, what we're always trying to seek here is, is really use case. Like, what is the tangible use case that could happen in this space? And I think you guys have a clear use case. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you guys are doing, who you are, uh, so we can understand kind of where you are and, and where you're going. Sure, be happy to. So uh, Arcio is a collaborative design tool uh, where it's focused on spatial design. So Arcio is all about designing spaces, buildings, environments, um, anything where it's value uh, valuable to you to kind of be immersed in the space while you are designing it. And uh, we have built this product from the ground up for VR and AR, for immersive use. And uh, the reason for why uh, Arcio brings a lot of value is that it is very different to design something on a flat screen, on a 2D screen, and try to imagine what some space will look like or feel like, as opposed to be able to actually stand inside the space as you are building it or modifying it. So, you know, your sense of the space, kind of the spatial awareness is totally different uh, when you obviously can be inside the space itself. Um, we are pretty unique in the market because we are the only kind of authoring tool uh, focusing on architecture, uh, architecture de design in VR and AR. Um, and now uh, we have been expanding to go from kind of working in VR into working in mixed reality. So we can not only be kind of creating these virtual spaces or like buildings in virtual reality, but you can start to even modify the physical world around you, uh, you know, place buildings in the physical world or modify uh, the space you're in. Interesting. So you guys started when? So the company was founded in 2017. So we've been doing this for a while. Uh, we are kind of back in the early days of kind of the, the, the kind of the current phase of VR that we're in right now. And uh, we've been taking a while to build this product because we have built this again from the core up uh, for kind of immersive use. But also we develop our own modeling kernel or modeling system to uh, allow people to do exactly this. You know, it's it's really challenging to build a modeling tool that has to run like on devices like this at you know 72 or 90 frames per second. So we've taken a while to bring this to market, but uh, now we're here and we're starting to see people you know use it in all kinds of interesting ways, actually. Yeah, let's see if we can bring up a video, uh, if you guys could bring it up, of there you go, of your actual product and just simply walk us through kind of what we're we're looking at here. I mean, this is a again, I'll leave it to you to kind of describe anything that's happening here that we should uh, kind of pay attention to? So the key thing here is that this is fully collaborative. You can have up to 24 people working together in a virtual environment to design buildings, uh, you know, look at different design options uh, and so on. Uh, and if you could like start this from the beginning, we can take a look at some of the kind of the mixed reality use cases. So there you see us working like together in mixed reality, uh, actually in my living room. 
this is a good example of how you can kind of blend the physical and the virtual world, start to modify your physical environment even. So that's your real, that's your real living room right there. And you're putting yeah. digital objects in there. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, and carving holes into physical walls and things like that. I mean, this is uh, showing things that really haven't been possible before, you know, placing buildings in, uh, in the real world. In this case, actually, uh, I'm carving a new window into my living room and looking at my scenery outside. So it, it allows for all kinds of collaborative experiences, whether you're working on interiors, architecture, um, you know, even like game environments and so on. Uh, it's all about kind of this uh, real-time hands-on collaboration that you can't really get if you're working on, on a flat screen device. Interesting. So basically, you know, what's fascinating there is really around the ability to carve out, you know, a window and, and look at who are the users, like who, who are you selling to? Um, who are the users of this? Kind of like, how do you envision them using it? Uh, whether it's like day to day, you know, are they making something similar to how, like when they're designing a property or redesigning a property, talk us through that experience, maybe today versus what you envision or what, how people are using it uh, with your product. Sure. So, um, when we first started Archeo, the idea was very much to target the professional architect uh, with this tool uh, and to really kind of, you know, uh, add the collaborative layer on top of the, the current workflows. And we've been fairly successful in doing that. We've been working with the kind of the uh, architectural design community now for a few years, developing the product. Uh, people are using this for anything from, you know, massing out a building to massing out, you know, urban environments. Uh, or even like working on something that is fairly like a detailed design. You know, we had one architect that designed an entire apartment building in Archeo and then just like exported it to one of his design tools to kind of finalize the documentation process. So uh, the, the professional architect can use this in a number of different ways. And now what we're seeing is we're seeing more and more people, anybody from like a hobbyist that wants to kind of reimagine their living room to game designers start to pick this up as well because the technology is applicable to anybody that wants to do spatial design, be it a professional uh, or a consumer, uh, in a way, because it, this can be so intuitive when you're working in VR, you can just like work with your hands, you can pick up things and move them around, and you don't need to learn like uh, some complex UI for maybe two or three weeks before you can get started. Interesting. And the the hardware, you know, so yeah. obviously uh, Meta came out with the Quest Pro, you guys were using it in this demo. Um, you know, I think from, I don't know if you were using the Quest 2 before as a product for this type of, uh, for, for your company, but in general, like the step to the, the Quest Pro, what, what is kind of, what have you seen there and, and what does that open up for you uh, as a company? So um, we are a fully cross-platform uh, application. So we work both in VR. We also have applications for even phones and tablets and desktop. Because we want to uh, make sure that as many people as possible can join in on a design meeting in Archeo, even if they don't have a headset. Uh, in terms of the headsets that we are focusing on, uh, then the Quest 2 is by far the most widely used uh, you know, device for Archeo. Uh, we went live on the Quest App Store earlier this year in partnership with Meta. So people on Quest 1 and 2 can use Archeo. What the Quest Pro really brings to Archeo is uh, the call of pass-through. I mean, that's like the primary, primary feature that that device brings. You know, overall, this is a more like comfortable device. You know, the, the device is a bit slimmer and kind of it's more comfortable in many ways. But the color pass really is what's taking kind of the mixed reality design to the next level. And uh, what we showed yesterday was just a glimpse of like where this is all going. There are so many use cases and possibilities that even we haven't thought of yet that, you know, it would just be interesting to see what happens in the future, how people apply Archeo to their uh, different workflows. Got it. Um, customers for, for your, yourself in terms of, you know, how many of them, and maybe you know this or not, like, so using kind of the tablet versus the actual like uh, VR headset um, and just like the different use case there, you know, maybe it's the, it's the tablet as the kind of final step, or maybe that's the starting step, or is it kind of um, VR is when they start. Um, and then I'll, I'll stop there. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the future vision from yourself in terms of, the new potential form factors, whether it's smaller, you know, eyeglasses, which are much more, you know, mixed reality glasses where AR comes into play. Um, just first and foremost is the device usage today is how are you seeing them actually use it um, uh, across kind of your customer base? So the bulk of the use is in uh, VR, which is uh, pretty exciting. 
yeah. the other devices like the tablets and the phones, they're more to kind of participate in a design session uh, to see what's going on. You can actually do some authoring even on these other devices. But the primary experience is and will always be to be immersed like in the headset because we believe this is the future of spatial design. Like this is where everything is going. And even if it's still a little bit early in that sense, there's like no question in our, in our minds that this is where the industry uh, you know, is heading. And then who are you replacing in terms of, uh, you know, like the, what's the legacy here? So uh, we sometimes jokingly say that our competition is just like the pen and the paper because that's what people just used to kind of scribble things and everybody knows how to do that. Um, right now, uh, we are, you know, adding value on top of the existing design tools that are out there. You know, if you take some of the design tools in the AEC industry, which is architecture, engineering, and construction, you'll tools like Revit, or Rhino, or SketchUp, for example. And these tools aren't really collaborative. Uh, they're not built for kind of rapidly kind of mocking up things together with other people. So we add like a collaborative layer on top of them uh, in a way. Now, as we will, of course, become a more and more capable modeling tool over time, people may gradually do more and more of the modeling in ArchGIO than in these other tools. Sure. But for now, like we are really focusing on augmenting these existing workflows uh, and kind of you know adding value with the immersive and collaborative uh, you know features. Got it. And then do you ever see kind of like your product or this part of the space going to the consumer? I mean, you talked a little bit about it uh, in terms of, you know, whether it's games or self kind of creation inside your own home. Um, do, do you see this more or in general, like the, the commercial use case versus the consumer use case? Um, how do you feel about we'll, we'll just start with the consumer use case? So uh, I'm a big believer uh, that uh, practically anyone with a headset should be able to use Archeo to, uh, you know, mock up designs in their physical environment, uh, you know, explore different spatial designs. Uh, we are trying to make Archeo uh, as accessible as possible so anybody can pick it up and within a span of like uh, 15, 30 minutes, something like that can, you know, do things. And uh, in a way, uh, we are trying to, you could say that we're trying to democratize kind of this design process. You know, if you want to try to imagine, like, what if I would punch a hole through one of my walls in your house? You should be able to do that without calling in a professional architect to, like, sketch that up for you or do, like, a professional render. And now you can do that, actually, with Arcu. Sure. You can add walls. You can add furniture even to your house. And there's no reason for why that power shouldn't be in the hand of consumers, just like it's in the hands of professionals. And that doesn't mean that the professionals are going away. You know, there will always be a need for them. Like they have kind of the unique eye to how to do these things beautifully and make spaces work. But simple sketching of some interiors should be in the hands of practically anybody with a headset. Got it. Makes sense. Talk about, you know, the ecosystem. You know, obviously developing in the ecosystem. There's different ecosystems out there currently. Um, you know, obviously Meta is a big player here because of the device sales. How are they from a, obviously you guys are on the, on the platform, launch the app, um, just your, your general feedback around, you know, the different platforms that are out there and, and yeah. which one you see kind of, you can rank order them. I know obviously you don't want to necessarily rank order them, uh, all the time, but, uh, you're just feeling your, your initial thoughts around some of the platforms and developer ecosystems that exist out there. Sure. I mean, uh, there are quite a few, um, you know, we've been working heavily with Matt, obviously on the quest uh, and the quest pro, um, I think that in many ways, like they are, uh, you know, leading uh, this industry and in terms of adoption and what they're trying to do. And and uh, in some ways, I feel that they almost don't, you know, get enough credit for what they are trying to achieve here. You know, people kind of, they, they blast Meta for various reasons or like for what they're doing be it with some of the technologies. But people have to understand that if it weren't for standalone devices like the Quest, Quest 2 and Quest Pro, the industry would be in a very, very different position. So, like you know, you know, respect to them for everything that they're kind of pouring into this ecosystem to kind of to push it forward. Now, we are of course seeing other players, you know, be it like Pico or HTC, and and you know, who knows what, what Apple will do. Uh, and and there are some some kind of other players out there. So, overall, I will just say that it feels to me that you know we are at the beginning of something that is just going to you know grow in size. You know, this ecosystem will just continue to expand from this point. Because with the devices we have on the market today, you have real tangible value uh, in people's hands, be it like for consumers or for professionals. And uh, people often kind of say, and they've been saying this for the last few years, well, like, you know, the year is dead, nobody's using this or something. And, and you know, many people are kind of proclaiming that, that this wave, you know, kind of will fade. 
but I, I have uh, like uh, no doubt that you know this will just continue to, you know, we'll see increased adoption as you see more and more capable devices being brought to market. And there's a clear trend now with devices coming out with like uh, more comfort with the pancake lenses again with the pass through. Uh, so I, I'm pretty happy about like where the overall ecosystem is is going in general. But you know, I apart from this, I'm not going to like rank people or like sure, you sure, know sure. Uh, anything like fair that. Enough. I mean. No, that's fair. That's fair. So, you know, we'll wrap up here, but basically we try to have like three questions for everybody. So in baseball terms, you know, what inning do you think we are in terms of, you know, the quote unquote metaverse uh, one through nine? Well, you know, we don't play baseball in Iceland. I have no clue how that even works. <laughs> but but like uh, I would say that we are probably in like, you know, like one or two. Like this is like very, very early. Got it. Yep. That's a. Uh... That's what we think as well. So one project that you've seen uh, that excites you, obviously Arkeo has one clearly, um, but other projects that maybe, you know, you run into in terms of, you know, other founders and, and such in this space that kind of excites you around what's happening. Wow. I mean, there are so many, so many exciting things happening. Um, there was this, this app launched on the, on the, on the Quest Pro, it's called uh, World. Uh, which is pretty pretty fun. It's like this social experience where you kind of you know travel the world with other people and you you look at cities and stuff and and that's a pretty pretty exciting one. Um, there are obviously some some great design tools out there. You know I think the guys at Gravity Sketch are doing some excellent work when it comes to like immersive design when it comes to you know automotive uh, you know product design and so on. Um, but, but, but I think actually Matt is doing a, a pretty good job with with Horizon Workgroups. Uh, if you try that out, it's it's a pretty yeah well-crafted experience. They're trying to kind of, you know, reimagine what meetings should be and feel like uh, when doing, being done in an immersive way. Uh, and that's actually like, because I was talking about people blasting VR and saying VR is dead, you know, they've gotten like criticism on like who would want to meet in like boring like workspaces like, like they have in, in work groups, but they're kind of missing the point I get. Like you were trying to kind of rethink how, how meetings should work. And of course the spaces will evolve, but it's everything how you can kind of use the headset and you connect it to your PC and you can scribble notes and like, you know, put them on like a shared whiteboard and bringing stuff. You know, they've done a lot of innovation in this area, for example. Yeah, I agree. Uh, number three, the hype, the hype around the metaverse, you know, is it overhyped, underhyped or perfectly, you know, right at that equilibrium of hype that uh, is earned or deserved um, your opinion? So, so that's, uh, that deserves uh, maybe a bit of a complex answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, the the metaverse is in many ways uh, vastly overhyped uh, in the sense that uh, people have been trying to claim uh, or make all kinds of claims about what the metaverse is or will be when the reality is nobody really knows. Um, I, I think the hype is in a way warranted because I think immersive uh, computing will be huge. It will be much bigger than anybody realizes right now. So, so that's why it's kind of both overhyped and, and kind of and justified. What, what I will say is that when I think about the metaverse, uh, I almost think of it more as, you know, you could call it spatial computing or the spatial web or something like that. You know, this will be a technology that will be used. You will be in like virtual social spaces or you will be in your physical living room looking at kind of a small thing in augmented reality. It's going to be like anything in between and everything will be like the metaverse, if you will. What I, what I don't think it will be is I don't think it's going to be 2D. You know, there will be viewer applications uh, that will be used to look into this, uh, this universe or metaverse that will be run on 2D devices. But like uh, this will be all about, you know, being spatial and being like immersed in a space, be it like part of your physical space or a virtual one. Yeah, um, that's kind of where I see it. And like people are making all kinds of claims that they have problems today that they call metaverse, which is probably not fully justified. But that's kind of the name of the game, I guess. Yeah, no, I get it. Uh, we kind of feel the same way around the concept of the metaverse, the actual, you know, marketing and, and thought around uh, a single word to describe a whole ecosystem is probably overhyped. But the actual tangible things that are going on there are pretty incredible. Uh, I think you guys specifically are doing a, a pretty uh, incredible thing where it's clear to see what the value add is here. Um, and it's the spatial technology that's allowing it to to happen. Um, and whether you want to call that the metaverse or not, um, is is to each their own. 
Um, but at the same time, there's, there's real value being created. So, you know, with that, um, we'll end there, you know, Hilmar, appreciate you coming on and, and talking about Archeo and, and all the good stuff that you guys are doing there, uh, sharing your product. Uh, and with that, good luck and we'll speak soon. Thank you. Appreciate it again, Hilmar. Uh, good luck. And, you know, I think what you saw there was something pretty fascinating, the windows and looking outside of the windows, uh, in a digital format. I think it's just a big deal conceptually as we think about the future of, uh, whether it's construction, pre-construction, renovation, um, so many use cases that I think can be attached to that. Uh, you know, now let's look to bring on uh, Tipitat uh, from the VR Fund, another investment firm that's really highly focused uh, in many ways in the AR VR space. Let's bring on Tipitat to learn a little bit more around, you know, what he's seeing at the developer level. Uh, I think this will be a pretty good conversation for sure uh, to go along with everything we've heard so far. All righty. So on to our next session with Tipitat. He is the co-founder and GP of the VR Fund. Welcome, Tipitat. Hello. Yeah. So, you know, you've been in this space for a while. You, I think you were a VR artist. Then you, uh, you know, director of product at a social gaming company. Uh, you were AR and uh, VR developer within, I think, a Samsung Accelerator. If you can just share with, first, anything we missed there, um, but also, you know, why did you really go out and think about starting a, a fund firm that's really focused on many areas, including AR, VR, and a little bit about yourself as well, obviously. Yeah, sure. So like you mentioned, I started off as like a, a artist, designer, developer, prototyper, you know, wearing many hats, you know, the jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. But really, I just very curious, love experimenting, love new technology. And it was, you know, backing the Oculus on Kickstarter and playing with the early versions, even like the DK2 really was the one with positional tracking that really set my mind racing. Like, oh, what, what can you do? What can you experience? Where do you want to go in you know, the VR, in the metaverse? And it was definitely like, oh, if I could go anywhere, I want to go into the Matrix. I want to be Neo. I want to meet Morpheus. I want to you know, dodge bullets, jump across buildings, do all of that, right? So nights and weekends, so friends and I, we just built this simple little demo, ran on my MacBook. It was, you know, it, I thought it was slick for you know the amount of time we put into it, but it wasn't, you know, AAA, it wasn't the most fanciest thing ever. Just built nights and weekends. And in the process of making this, especially the jump program where you have to jump across the buildings and you fall and you bounce 40 stories off the, off the pavement, I somehow cured myself of my real-life fear of heights. Hmm. And that was my aha moment of, wow, the idea that, you know, I've had video games or movies kind of trigger the fear. It's actually rewire my brain, hack my brain, and overcome the fear. That meant that, again, this was a medium that was on a whole nother level. The way it gauges with us, the way it tricks our mind and, you know the power it was going to affect the way we not just only how we play but how we live how we work how we heal and that's when i realized this opportunity was bigger than just entertainment and gaming and that you know again if people working just in their spare time could do something so profound imagine what millions of developers could do for billions of people and that's when i really uh, realized i want to do something more than just make you know games in this ecosystem and i wanted to help impact it and guide it to, towards this future that i saw and this was, you know, back in like 2015, 14, something like that. Interesting. So you started uh, the VR Fund. You guys focus specifically, or generally, what is your focus? So the Venture Reality Fund, we like to say, you know, we're, the Fund One was focused on the future of computing, which we considered like VR, AR, AI, these fundamental technologies that were going to be the next big computing revolution. And now with Fund Two, we take the next step of that. So what comes after computers? It's the internet and what's the next step of the internet and that's the metaverse and so again we do look at vr ar ai but also look at web3 blockchain and this idea of you know virtual worlds but especially with a user generated content element and we're looking a lot at like generative ai things like that all this thing that will empower more of the users or players to become the creators and create you know more of these 3d experiences that will be you know can be fully immersive or could be viewed on your phone but this idea that again how do we live a more complete and fulfilling digital life? I think that's to me the north star of the metaverse. Interesting, yeah. So let's let's start there, which is the metaverse. And uh, you know, we've everyone we, we we bring on, we basically ask them what is the metaverse. But instead of asking them specifically what's your personal definition, which feel free to do that, um, it's you know what problems are being solved here. And I think that's ultimately what really defines any category is what what's the problem being solved in terms of the longevity, the opportunity set, things like that. You know problem solving definition, however you want to frame it, um, kind of metaverse uh, from your, your point of view. Sure. And the way I think about it too, is like, there's not really one definition, but we're all putting out there our 
hopes of what the metaverse should be and that we should all be striving to reach towards a best version of the metaverse, right? And I think it's going to be amalgamation of all of the different people's uh, ideas here. And what, what I really think is interesting is, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, oh well, I guess I'll just pause and just go back to like the fundamental idea of community on the metaverse is that merging of the digital world to make it feel more like the natural world so that everyone can benefit from it. And you can think about what we have with the internet today. We have a lot of consumers, but the people that create and contribute is still a small amount. The people that actually profit from the internet is still a pretty small subset of, of the people out there. And what's really interesting is that VR, AR really makes the digital world feel like the natural world. It's very intuitive to interact with a 3D digital world in VR, or AR, right? Where I see a glass, I know to pick it up. I know, you know, I know how to use, it. I don't have to like scroll through or try to, talk, like, it just makes sense because it's presented in a natural way. And that's the real power of saying, okay, now you're allowing people to interact. And that means people will create, develop in a more intuitive and natural way. And I think that's the exciting thing that I see is really enabling economic opportunity, allowing more people to be part of the digital economy, which is infinite and ever growing and giving people like, honestly, this is the evolution of computers, right? It's like, how many more people can we help benefit, provide a better way of life, uh, you know, better opportunity. And I feel like the metaverse is the next big, and honestly, the ultimate fulfillment of that. Right. So there's, you know, there's, you really see two different sides, which is the social side. Mm -hmm. There's also the commercial side. Um, in terms of using AR, VR, you know, XR, uh, mixed reality, um, talk about, you know, or what do you think about the social side versus the commercial side? Commercial side being, you know, everything from training to education to uh, mental health. You, you elaborated on kind of the mental health, the concept of uh, having being afraid of heights and all of a sudden, you know, uh, totally removing that. And I've heard a lot of anecdotal kind of highlights from kind of people using VR or other experiences to calm themselves down in different ways from a mental standpoint. Um, but again, that's more on the commercial side, you could say. On the kind of social side, you have more of the games, the communities, the networks that are being built. Um, if you could just think about those two independently and talk about the opportunities within each. So what I think is, is what's really interesting is the metaverse will be the fusion of the two, right? And, and you'll say like Roblox is the best example as a proto metaverse, right? And this idea that, okay, right now the metaverse will be fundamentally on the, on the consumer side based on gaming. Gaming has become the biggest, largest entertainment sector, right? And the metaverse is, is the natural evolution of that. And what we see, especially as you combine like, you know, the social experiences of it, but when you look at a Roblox, almost, I, I believe all of the content is built by their users. Yeah. And so when you think about, okay, how many game developers like Unity or Unreal developers are out there, right? Like that would be in the hundreds of thousands. If you think how many Roblox developers there are, there's millions, right? And these are, you know, 10 to 15 year old uh, kids today building 3D immersive worlds, selling it selling digital goods and experiences to their peers, they're already living in a you know proto metaverse, in a metaverse. And as they grow up and they age up into adulthood, you know, will they be satisfied with the 2D internet? Will they want to work in the way that we've worked in the past? And what is work for them? Like right now, you say like a lot of people that make content for the internet, they're making like 2D media. You already have millions of people making 3D media already for Roblox, they'll be making, they're, they're used to making 3D content. They'll be making 3D content in the metaverse. So that's this idea of like, you know, as we shift the future of working, and this is honestly where I think meta kind of gets wrong, where they're like, oh, working in the metaverse, is not about 2D knowledge workers doing multiple screens. It's no, no, the fact is the world is changing into 3D and there needs to be more people doing 3D work. And that's where VR, AR immersive really makes sense. And so that's one side of it and have the fusion of the consumer and the enterprise come together. But like you said, there's this whole other category of enterprise, you know, VR, AR metaverse work that combines like digital twins, these more intuitive interfaces that are affecting every industry from fashion, healthcare, and so many others. And what I think is really interesting is the first beachhead of it is definitely training, training to do work in the real world in a virtual safe environment. But the bigger opportunity and what we're already seeing happening is doing the work using these VR, AR immersive tools. And I'll give you an example. Like, so, you know, there's a lot of great companies out there doing surgical training or, you know, training doctors, healthcare workers. That is fantastic work. But the next evolution of that is surgical navigation. And the idea that doctors can now have x-ray vision when they're doing surgery, and that can almost reduce uh, errors, surgical errors to zero and speed up healthcare, uh, you know, surgical operation times, not just for efficiency, but honestly, that makes it more, way more safer for the patient. 
And so these are the things that you know, are already in clinical trials and seeing amazing results. A company called Proprio is doing that and others. And it's just amazing to see. It's like, yeah, these technologies are really changing the game and democratizing the highest quality of healthcare to everyone. Yeah, you know what's fascinating as I th- hear, hear from you is, is really, and it's really why the term metaverse doesn't have a clear definition is because you've just literally spoke about a, a many different kind of a- opportunity sets that in reality, none of those really relate to one another in terms of, you know, we think in the, the world we live in today in, in terms of verticals, you know, there's, there's this vertical and this vertical and this vertical, and we, you know, we, we, everything is highly structured um, in kind of the world of digitization of everything, you know, what you're seeing now is we're trying to formulate the definition of a digital world. And today what we have is essentially, you know, the metaverse, which is not very clear to many. Um, but when you start to beat up some of the, um, use cases, I think it becomes more and more clear that, you know, you're, you're checking boxes along the way, which ultimately at one point, like you said, we'll have a fusion where it's all connected uh, into one seamless, somewhat experience, either one network um, that exists um, that allows you to do many of these things. You know, let's talk about the hardware side, which is really the gateway into all of this. You know, you have glasses, call it Ray-Bans and spectacles and some others. Where are the um, Ray-Bans right now? There you go. You know, I didn't even, I couldn't even tell, you know, it's <laughs> like, which is good. You couldn't even, uh, you can, you can set the difference, which I think is one of the objectives of this space, right? Which is a seamless experience into the real world with, uh, some of these, uh, native tools. Um, then you have like the Oculus, where there was the Oculus Pro that just came out. So we'd love to hear your feedback on just like the general oh, thought about it. This there is you the go. Quest Pro. <laughs> there you go. So let's start there. So um, talk about the hardware space. You're wearing basically all of it. <laughs> you yeah. have all of it within feet of you. Um, I mean, so honestly, your thoughts? it is amazing how fast it's gone in the past, you know, five, six years since from the first commercial VR headsets to now something like the Quest Pro. And, and what's really interesting too, is like a lot of people are like, oh, the Quest Pro, it's just so expensive. It's It's crazy. And it's true for a gaming VR headset, it's very expensive, right? Because like you know, the class is like you know five hundred dollars, and so here you're like oh three times the price. But if you compare the capabilities of it, actually, it's much closer to the Hololens and the Magic Leap Twos and these mixed reality headsets that let you blend the real world and are more you know geared for enterprise use cases. And then you're like, oh, it's actually cheaper than those. Like those tend to be like two to three thousand dollars. So this is actually coming in at, uh, you know, so as a device that can do both, it's very interesting that you know it's actually in ways more inexpensive because you know it uses a different technology stack. But the functionality of it is actually very robust and very impressive. And uh, you know, honestly, it's an engineering marvel. uh, And the amount of technology you get in is just insane. But the problem is, we're still talking about it as a technology and not a product. Right. And so it's like there's not pre-installed applications you know, by Meta that really showcase what it's good for, how it's going to be used. This idea of like everyone knows in VR and AR, some of the first use cases are going to be like remote collaboration, remote training. And the first efforts, you know, there's nothing really, really coherent. There's not no kind of value out of the box with it. You still have to design and build most of that. You have to go into the app store and, and, and try to buy some stuff. And so what's really interesting is like that's kind of the stage that we're at with this. And, and but if I can roll it back, I mean, what I think is really interesting is for me as an investor, what I'm looking for is not a hardware product. I'm really looking for a platform, right? And for me, a platform means an ecosystem where millions of developers are making millions of dollars. And what I think is most astounding that most people aren't acknowledging is Meta You know, recently announced that the Meta Quest app store has done $1.5 billion in revenue. And this is the first new viable app store since the smartphone. And that, you know, there's been hundreds uh, or not hundreds, but there's been products that have sold hundreds of millions of devices, had their own app stores, like smart watches, smart speakers. None of them had viable app stores where developers were making millions of dollars. And now, of course, we're only talking hundreds of developers, but the fact that there's more than one developer, like, you know, the, the, more, the fact that third party developers have a new ecosystem where they can make millions of dollars and a top grossing game in the Quest store can do 50 to 100 million in revenue. And so you're like, okay, this is where large companies can be built. And, and even though it's, it's a slow growth, it's the fact that it's already happening. It, it's like kind of reached that tipping point. I feel like, again, it just proves that you know, VR, AR, spatial computing is the next computing platform. And it's already a viable one. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's super interesting to hear all of the, uh, the stats that they laid out at the, uh, the Connect. Um, talk about, from, from our point of view, is, is really understanding you know, some of the projects that you've seen that uh, 
kind of are interesting, excite you that maybe it's not as mainstream as maybe some of the stuff that uh, we spoke about uh, moments ago. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, kind of tying back into what I was talking about, where it's like, oh, this idea of doing work in 3D, what does that mean and how is it better? It's like, right now, honestly, like, you know, very few, few people want to do 3D work cases, you know, CAD, computer-aided design. It's, it's very complicated to create, to think in 3D with a 2D interface. And so one of our portfolio mm -hmm. companies, they're called Shapes XR. They were highly featured by uh, Meta at the Meta Connect, and they really showcase, okay, doing 3D work in VR is so much more intuitive. It's like playing with Legos and everyone can do that, right? And so this idea of like, okay, this obtuse CAD thing where you're thinking in 3D spaces on 2D screens to now you're interacting with a 3D world. So a lot of, you know, game creators building 3D worlds, 3D levels, doing prototype work. I mean, they've really become the figma of 3D and uh, like Logitech uses them, other sure. customers too. I, I don't know which ones I can actually mention, <laughs> but, but, but there's a lot of great work that, that's showcasing that example, right? Um, another really interesting uh, company uh, that, that, that just launched one of their experiences. It's a company called World, W-O-O-O-R-L-D. And they're also showcasing the Meta Connect that they just launched uh, this week. And it's this, uh, it's exploring the world with street view images, but more importantly, also with photogrammetry 3D worlds, very much like a, a, a social version of Google Earth that you can view in a headset. And it's amazing to go explore like places that you grew up with and just feel like you're there from the comfort of your living room and doing it and sharing those places with your friends. And then also the best part is so you can do like VR graffiti and like draw, annotate, leave notes for others. And it's just, it's, it's one of those things where when we think about this idea of like virtual tourism, of going to places, being there, I think this is like one of the first steps in really actualizing that, that dream. Got it. Question. Do you think, um, these devices, specifically the Oculus uh, chain of products, line of products, will eventually replace kind of the desktop or laptop or yeah. you know screens. But, like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think so. Again, not necessarily the Quest line, but like in the sure. future, right? Yeah. This idea of like, hey, okay, are we going to get there? Yeah, like if you can have screens close to your eyes and they can emulate any kind of screens everywhere and give you information, you won't need any other screens in theory, right? And and will will it be you know right away? Probably not. But that's kind of the future that we're all kind of working towards. But what I think is really interesting, and sorry, just going back to the devices, right? Like, I think the Quest has done a great job of proving VR can be a gaming console. Now you're like, okay, I think the Quest Pro is trying to prove, can VR be a desktop or a laptop replacement? And that's where, okay, the price point does make more sense. But I, but I do think, again, where it's not like saying, hey, no, no. It's not trying to emulate just by being a laptop and giving you multiple screens. Like, that's not how it's going to win. It's going to, if if it can fulfill the role of a laptop of productivity but right now the laptop's one of the best productivity devices for the internet but the headset will be the best productivity device for the metaverse and Got that's it. how it will replace it right not by trying to be a laptop and let you do the work of a laptop but as work the nature of work changes right and we won't need laptops because they're not the best device for making 3d design that's when it, the, meta, uh, the headsets will really take over that makes sense. It's basically using your your example of shapes VR or shapes, uh, yeah, I think VR. Yeah, shapes and uh, they, they essentially can't you can't replicate that in a laptop. You have to use the, uh, the other device. And as more and more use cases like um, kind of three D objects and the building blocks that you're you're referring to, as more and more of of that comes to life, you start to segment and and call it re replace your your legacy products, i.e., laptop. It's probably why, again, you see a lot of lap laptop makers creating these devices to protect their own chair, whether it's yep. Lenovo and some others. Yeah. You know, so we're rolling up to the end of, of this session, but I tend to like to ask three questions. Uh, you know, number one, in baseball terms, what inning do you think we're in? One to nine in terms of the metaverse. I think we're probably in like the third inning right now. I mean, again, still very early, uh, but we're, 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 we're already seeing huge gains. We're already seeing a lot of people, you know, going in, not only, you know, rebranding your company to focus on it, but, but other companies as well, all kind of like trying to figure it out, trying to, and again, it's not saying they want to own the metaverse, but I think they're all trying to like prove out what their vision of the metaverse can be. And I don't think one vision necessarily will rule. I think it's an amalgamation of all these visions. And we think back to the internet, right? And the internet's kind of the same way where we all had thoughts of what the internet could be. It started out as, you know, virtual catalogs and it's evolved because of so many brilliant people putting in the work, putting in the money to kind of evolve this thing. And so... Yeah, you know, I, I love the talk about the metaverse because again, everyone's just theorizing and putting it out there. But then seeing the companies put in the work and shape it, I think is the most fascinating part of it. 
Okay. Number two, you've already laid out a couple of projects, but mm -hmm. given that you uh, see plenty of projects, oh, sure. I'll ask it again, but what's one project uh, you've seen that excites you? Well, okay. So this is one of the projects to me that like, I'm so surprised people aren't talking more about, but when we're talking about like VR, AR technologies and, and, and metaverse technologies, you know, we have a company we invested in called Apprentice IO, and they do a remote collaboration and, and digital workflow solution for life science laboratories, drug manufacturing. They help fast track several of the COVID vaccines. So knowing that these VR, AR technologies that, again, are still very early, but are already being used to solve the world's biggest problems, already saving millions of lives. Like, to me, that's why we're like, okay, well, where are we? What inning are we? It's like, we're a lot further than a lot of people think in certain ways, you know? Yeah, no, that makes sense. A lot of places are, are kind of in that seventh, eighth inning, and, yeah, and yeah, some yeah. are in inning one, right? And that's yeah, kind yeah. of the interesting aspect of all this stuff. Number three is the hype around the metaverse, overhyped, underhyped, or perfectly, you know, hyped at this moment. I, I think it's exactly that famous quote of, it's like, you know, the immediate impact might be overhyped, but the long-term impact is underhyped, right? And this idea that, you know, again, there's so many different aspects to the metaverse, right? Whether, like, the way I kind of think about it is like the immersive VR, AR side of it is more of the front end. Then there's like the Web3 NFT blockchain crypto component that's more of the backend infrastructure. And there's like unequal hype on both sides of that right. equation, right? Uh, but the way I, I view it is like, absolutely, this changes everything. Is it changing everything today? Not necessarily, but should everyone be planning for it and, and thinking about it? Yes. And do you want to be involved in the conversation? Do you want to help shape it? Absolutely. Right. So I, I think there's this sense of, you know, a, a lot of people are like, oh gosh, you know, Meta's spending too much money. You know, is, is this really, you know, the right way to do it? And it's like, honestly, they're still not spending enough to do this, you know, the way it needs to be done. And, and everyone needs to spend more to, to really achieve this and to get it faster and to help, you know, fast track this. But in terms of, you know, it's it's weird. I, I feel like, especially in different sectors, right? Like it gets overhyped, and then the bubble bursts. Then it goes it goes like that, and then it slowly builds up. People start making breakthroughs. Then it gets hyped up again, and we see this all the time. Whether it's with metaverse, VR, AR, or you know, blockchain and crypto, or now with like AI, and now there's like this huge hype for generative AI. And remember, like you know, the hype bubbles of AI before. Yeah, it's very similar to what we're seeing. Okay, cool. Well, TB Tat, appreciate you coming on today. You know. Thanks for everything and providing us all the different uh, kind of use cases and things like that. It's much appreciated. Uh, with that, we are going to move on. Uh, thanks for joining us and good luck on everything. Excellent. Thanks for having me so much. Take care. All right. Now, that was a, uh, obviously a great conversation with Tibi Tat. Um, let's turn to Lori Mazur. Uh, she is, you know, the CEO and founder of Slim Synthetivity. Um, and, you know, she is someone that is an enthusiast in the space is building a company around this space in terms of, uh, uh, from a consultant standpoint. Um, and she's doing a lot of great stuff specifically in empowering women around the metaverse and web three. Uh, and she'll talk hopefully a little bit about that as we look to bring her on here, uh, part of the series. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, Lori Mazur, welcome today. Thank you, Sean. I'm so excited to be here. And and honestly, um, this is like my father's dream come true that I am on a podcast about finance. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My dad is an engineer, but at 62, he became an intern and got his uh, Series 7 exams and uh, has been trading uh, for the past 20 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> that's quite a, uh, you know, uh, evolution in life, um, to yes. say the least. Oh, that's fun. That, that that sounds pretty fun. So it's it's great to have you on here. You're you know you're a consultant. You're a founder, CEO of Synthativity. I want to know exactly what that means, but I guess the areas of focus for you and and the company is around you know technology, education, other areas. Just for the audience today, I think share more about yourself. Um, you know what you do on a daily basis, weekly basis, and you know we can get into all the other stuff uh, thereafter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm trained as an architect. Uh, and I, no matter what I do, I always think of myself as an architect. So I solve problems and I build things um, in space. And it started out early in my career that I was building those things in physical space. And I've continued to do that throughout my career. But as technology has evolved, I've also been building things in digital space. And, you know, it has been Web 2.0 for the past few years. So when Web 3 came up, I just got really excited about what the possibility would be for us to think about. Uh, what that means for both the physical and the digital world. 
Sure. And so putting together the word synthetivity, where did the origins of that come from? Yeah. So, you know, as a creator, um, we often use the word creativity, but truth be told, we don't create anything. Um, you know, all that we do as artists or functional artists, you could say, comes from the world around us. So there's a really awesome term called synthetivity in genomics. That means that everything comes from the world around us, right? We're processing the world around us and we're then kind of spitting out what we interpret that to be in new and innovative ways. Um, so I, you know, most recently I'm doing, you know, AI generative art and, you know, I find this is actually quite the same process as I've been doing my whole life as an architect. Interesting. Yeah, no, no. Now it's much more beautiful of a name. Uh, has much more meaning to it. Uh, we have, Avery has its own, you know, origin story and stuff like that. That's that's for another day. But you know, yeah. in general, you know, I think the point of this is really to you know start thinking about what's top of mind today, which is the metaverse, right? And you know, we've had a, a plenty of guests from you know uh, Tech Radar to Archeo, which is architect uh, kind of in a three D kind of virtual world. Uh, in a sense, you know, highlight or share with us what your view of let's say the metaverse. And for us, I think. The best way to think about it is less around, you know, what is the definition? Because again, I think, and I've read some of your posts as well, where, you know, there's so many definitions. It's really around the use case. What is actually, where's the value add in this space? So talk about, you know, maybe the value you're seeing created, some of the unique projects you're seeing. And then like within that, we'll obviously get kind of your flavor of what the metaverse is today and, and what you think it'll be in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm really new to this space. Um, and so I'm discovering along with everyone else. And I, and I say that because, you know, there are not a lot of women in Web 3.0 on a mission to make sure that there are more of us um, who are there and, um, and have a voice. And, you know, you don't have to have come from the tech world and you don't have to have been a gamer to have a voice in the metaverse. Um, I first got turned on to the metaverse by watching Ready Player One, right? I mean, that for me kind of like visualized the whole thing. I went back and read the book later. Um, and, you know, what I'm really interested in is I'm interested in how technology can make us better as humans. So, you know, we're only as good as we are as humans, whether we're in the analog world or whether we're in virtual space. Um, but I'm really interested in the potential that technology has to make things that should be easy, easy, and also to tap into our imagination, right? And I think this is something that we've we've kind of lost as a culture, the ability to dream, the ability to play, the ability to imagine. And, you know, I'm not a gamer, but I'm really excited about all of the technology that's come through the enthusiasm of that community that has potential to do other great things in the world. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely gaming is, is, has been, I think the centerpiece of, or the origin of a lot of kind of VR, AR mixed worlds. Um, it's, much more immersive than kind of the 2D gaming that exists today. And that's ultimately what's been driving. Obviously, Meta has sold, you know, 17 million headsets primarily around gaming. Um, and they announced like the Meta Quest Pro, which is much more for commercial use. Where yeah. companies, again, like Arkeo and some others are building some stuff. You know, what projects, I know you talked about art. Uh, you do post a lot of things around art. Some of the stuff is, is pretty interesting looking, um, yeah. to say the least. Uh, and a lot of this is like digital art. Like, what, what's your thought on that space? Um, yeah. Is there a tangible value? Obviously, Web3 connects to this in terms of maybe things like ownership. Um, just yeah. your general thoughts on, you know, use cases and areas of, of interest that you think, you know, the metaverse or just, you know, spatial web is what some people like to call it, where Absolutely. there's real value add there. Yeah. So a lot of the work that I do is in helping communities imagine the future. And it's very difficult for us to be able to talk about the future, to be able to, you know, a lot of times when you ask people about the future, what they say is, technology they're using today, right? People always think technology is the future. Well, technology is today. So how do you get at imagining things? And so I'm really interested in the potential of AI in the hands of anybody to tap into our ability to imagine things that don't exist, right? And so, you know, one of the things I've been exploring is how do you take that technology and use it in community engagement around projects that are happening in real estate development? So for example, in New York, they're putting the BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, underground. And, you know, there are lots of efforts to go out and engage members of the community to say, you know, what would you imagine here after that project is completed? Do you want to see a garden? Do you imagine swimming pools? You know, I'm a triathlete. So I did a few uh, AI studies about what it would be. Uh, like. conversation. 
Yeah, a whole nother conversation, but it's all related. You know, I, so, you know, what would it be like if you took the BQE and you made like one level swimming, one level biking, one level running, right? So we all have, um, we all have our imagination. We, we all have the ability to communicate that. Um, but I kind of look at the AI as a dopamine reward. Um, and in a way of getting people to really start to use specific language to describe what they imagine. And so that's in terms of like applications, that's really what I'm working on right now. Um, and then I'm also interested in how you can then use that to distribute um, the creator economy to a larger segment of the population, right? So, you know, imagine you went through a process where you're doing community engagement, people are developing their own AI art, and then that art can be minted. It can be put up on a gallery. There can be an auction, and people can be rewarded for having contributed to that process, right? So there are some incentives. And, you know, I think that for me is what's really interesting about Web3 and the metaverse is, you know, also the ability to reimagine our systems, right? To reimagine our economy, to reimagine how we organize ourselves. Um, and I'm particularly interested right now, I've been doing a lot of reading on DAOs. Um, and, you know, how that might replace what we call the committee um, in a lot of like university and non-for-profit organizations, right? Like anytime someone asks you to be on a committee, it's like, oh, <laughs> no one wants to be on a committee, right? <laughs> right. And there's always a few people who do all the work. And then, um, and, you know, frankly, if you're somebody who's working two or three jobs, the last thing you're going to do is volunteer for a committee, right? So we don't get a representative population. Um, so I think there are a lot of things here that have value to us in society beyond specifically what the tech does. Got it. Now, there's two areas that I think um, I've seen you write slash comment about, which are education, yep. um, two use cases or two uh, kind of events that have occurred. I think Zoom announced kind of a, a center at you know Arizona State. Then you yep. have like the Parsons School of Design uh, also kind of announced, I think, a partnership with Roblox around you know design and education around kind of building 3D virtual, uh, I guess, design techniques. Anything yeah. around that, you know, those are, I think, two yeah. pretty interesting announcements in general that I think validate some of uh, the momentum that has taken place over the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, look, I think Stanford has been out there, like, at the front of doing virtual reality and getting students engaged in, like, platforms in the classroom. And, you know, I've, I've actually been quite surprised at how slow to the table, or at least slow to publicizing um, what's going on in universities, colleges and universities um, has has happened. And so, you know, look, I really commend those people who are out there taking risks and experimenting, right? And I think like you can see like really amazing stuff coming out of Morehouse right now, um, particularly with um, uh, one of their faculty members who's a chemist. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things we're going to find is that the use cases are not what we think they, they're not what we first think they are. Right. Um, I think right now there's a lot of emphasis being placed on, you know, workplace. And, you know, I think I call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but, you know, <laughs> Meta, Accenture, Microsoft um, and uh, and Adobe. Right. They're all kind of doubling down and kind of waiting to see what happens with Apple. Um, and look, I, I, I appreciate the efforts there. There are huge issues around privacy and security. Um, and honestly, I just don't think it's that inspired. Right. Like, I'm not that excited to go sit in a, in a virtual world with people around a virtual conference table, right? I'm really excited to do a lot of other things. The potential to have a chemistry lab in your living room, to me, is game changing, right? That's where I see the potential, right? And, and I think Stanford has a really nice framework called DICE, which is like, you know, what do you want to do virtually that you can't do physically, right? You want to do things that are dangerous. You want to do things <laughs> that are impossible. <laughs> You want to do things that are counterproductive if you do them in person. Um, and you want to do things that are uh, expensive, too costly to do. And frankly, you know, colleges and universities are, there's a clear and present danger. Um, they are being disrupted as we speak by big tech, right? And so, you know, there, I think there's a, a serious call to action for colleges and, and universities to, to step up and to really be in it at all levels right? To be drawing upon the expertise across law, business, to be living laboratories. Yeah, I think that was an interesting framework, actually, in terms of uh, thinking through the potential use cases, danger, costly, um, and what, inconvenient or something? Uh, 
I'll probably go back and, you know, summarize that, but, impossible. uh, you, impossible. right. Yeah. Impossible. Impossible. There you go. Uh, yeah. inconvenience, impossible, you know, they're kind of brother and sister, you know, so you were, you, you were just part of web three, uh, forum for women. Um, that was going to be something I wanted to talk to you about, which was, yeah. you know, what are you seeing in this space? Um, specifically, oh, how is it opening the door to women to now move deeper into like the technology realm, um, where maybe it wasn't there, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I think a lot of that has been publicized now. Uh, but yeah. I saw a huge, I mean, I think the list of, of women part of that forum were, was, was pretty massive. Uh, yeah. so just wanted to understand, you know, what happened there, you know, what is the, the origin story of kind of that forum and, and, uh, yeah. kind of any takeaways. This is all credit to Lauren Ingram. And, you know, the, Lauren's one of these people that I've like met, you know, in virtual space, not in physical space, mm -hmm. but I've been watching what she's doing. And, you know, she came up with this idea to create a marketplace to showcase women who are in Web3 and to be able to have companies post jobs that they need. So, you know, it's it's a marketplace for exchanging talent. Um, but, you know, the other place, I'm a member of Chief and, you know, we've got a whole bunch of groups at Chief. You know, we, women, we like to organize ourselves. Um, so, you know, we have a, a blockchain Web3 group and we've been doing a series and, you know, some of some of the weeks um, I'm teaching, right? I'm teaching people AI art. Some of the weeks I'm learning, you know, last week I had no idea what a faucet was, what a girly was, like what a test environment was. Um, I like didn't know how to buy crypto. Um, I still am kind of astounded at the regulations in New York around buying crypto. Like I can't use my MetaMask. Um, mm -hmm. I've been waiting like seven days for my like crypto to come through uh, Coinbase, right? I mean, there right. still are there still are some like a major a lot of friction, a lot of friction. Um, but you know, we're it's like we're we're our own think tank and we're helping each other learn, right? And we're helping each other come to the table. And you know, look, I think you know, for I'm not in the venture world. Um, but you know, one of the things that I see is there's a lot of money that gets thrown at things that are duplicative, or you know, we're all kind of fighting for the same territory, right? To be in the same space, but I see this as a place where there's so much that needs to be done, right? And so much opportunity for, you know, what um, Adam Brandenberger calls co-opetition, right? I mean, I like to say, like, rising tides raise all boats. With climate change, that might not be a good analogy anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know- Especially like, down here in Miami. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but the people that I think are really inspiring in this space, and, you know, I, I'm really curious to follow Lamina One um, and Neil Stevenson, just kind of like, throwing his hands up and saying, okay, nobody's going to build the railroad, like, let's do it. Um, but not doing it in a way that you're inventing everything from scratch, right? Like finding where the tech exists that's really good and and lacing it together, right? And I think this is the thing that women are really good at, right? We're really good at connecting the dots. We really get good at like organizing in advance. And, you know, so I'm just going to use like a Thanksgiving analogy here because, you know, everybody comes to Thanksgiving dinner and this podcast will probably go up around Thanksgiving. <laughs> And, you know, it used to be we all came for the turkey, right? But truth be told, we all come for the sides. So, you know, look, big tech is like chasing the turkey, but there's so many sides. And, you know, women, we like, we get or organized around potlucks, right? And we make sure that somebody is bringing the mashed potatoes. Somebody's it has to be bringing, mashed potatoes. It has to be mashed potatoes. Somebody's bringing the roasted potatoes. Somebody's bringing the squash. You know, you don't need everybody bringing a pumpkin pie, right? So, you know, I think you could kind of take that analogy um, and and spread it to to venture, which is like, let's make it a Thanksgiving dinner that's about the sides. Like, we don't have to be stealth about everything that we do. You know, it might actually be helpful for folks to disclose what they're intending to build, so that we don't have five companies building the exact same thing and nobody building something else. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. There's definitely power in that. Um, there is also the power in, in them investing so much, which allows, you know, the ecosystem to prop up, get bigger, um, yeah. meaning there's power in actually the idea of having a, you know, a turkey at Thanksgiving, which brings us together to allow Absolutely. the sides to, to be cooked, to, to come uh, for the analogy purpose, purpose, you know, so let's start ending there where we, we tend to ask everyone three questions. Um, mm -hmm. I'll ask you four, cause there's another question I wanted to ask in terms of, uh, which running, I think swimming, what's the other one, uh, biking, which, which one of those three are you strongest at, uh, for the triathlon? I am definitely the strongest swimmer. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've been like, literally I was born and they just kind of like dropped me in the pool. Um, <laughs> You're fish right away. <laughs> yeah. Everything cool. else is good for me. 
Nice. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I've never uh, even attempted a triathlon or even thought about attempting a triathlon. So uh, kudos to you. Um, in baseball terms, what inning do you think, you know, the metaverse, uh, baseball's one through nine, uh, what inning do you think we are uh, in terms of the metaverse? Oh, that's so, that's so interesting. Um, look, I mean, I'd, I'd say we're probably at three. You know, we, we're not at the seventh inning stretch yet. Let's say that. There you go. Um, Never you know, know who you're talking to. You're a baseball fan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think there's like, we're how many years in, like barely 10 years in, right? Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of groundwork that's been laid. Um, there still is an opportunity to change the entire game, right? We got, we have a a lot more innings left. Um, good question. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, one project that you've seen that, you know, inspires interest, uh, that really is kind of like that aha moment either before or now or anything, uh, along your way. Um, in the meta, in the metaverse or like, in yeah, business? just around the, yeah, just around that ecosystem of the metaverse. Um, oh gosh, what's gotten me like most excited. Um, you know, I, I've been working with a doctor, um, who like literally draws on people's heads when they want to do surgery. And, um, you know, I was like talking through, he got really excited about the metaverse. And I was like trying to explain that the, a lot of the tech was there. It's just like he would need to figure out how to build the specific product he was looking for. Um, but I, I am really excited about um, Magic Leap. I, I mm. love how the company pivoted. Um, I think there really are viable use cases in medicine and in industry. And I think being able to develop those things that are really tangible like that um, and see tangible benefits so that it's not just something that's so um, mysterious um, or esoteric I, is really important. I think it will be really important important to the future of the industry. Yeah, I think training within uh, that space is uh, a valid use case. I mean, you can see like some of the stuff where you're, you're reviewing a, a skeleton in, in 3D and and I've seen some of the videos, again, where you're clicking off like, uh, you know, muscles versus bones and, and things like that and, and going through it all. Now, last question before we go is, you know, the hype around the metaverse. Is it, you know, overhyped, underhyped, perfectly hyped relative to the opportunity um, from your point of view? Um, you know, look, I think, you know, we're we're tracking the Gardner hype cycle. Like, I don't need to reinvent the wheel on that. Like, all things are going to, they're going to hype and then they're going to like come back down and then there's going to be a slow build. So. Yeah, you know, look, I think that we we hit um, the hype, certainly with one component of the metaverse, which was like, you know, uh, blockchain, crypto, NFTs. But I think we're just beginning, right? I think we're just beginning. And I think we haven't seen this all get pulled together. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of opportunity. Cool. Okay, so let's stop there. You know, go follow Lori on LinkedIn. She is a you know great follow. Uh, if anyone wanted to learn more, I guess, about you or just contact you, what's the best method? I wanted to leave with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I LinkedIn, I live on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me there. You message me. Um, I accept everybody. Table's big enough for all. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks again, Lori, uh, for joining us today and we'll catch up in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks again, Lori, for coming on. Um, I thought that was a fascinating conversation to have with you and we'll speak uh, in the future. Now let's bring on Jeremy Kaplan, you know, the content director at Future, but also the part of Tech Radar. Uh, you know, this company has so many brands underneath um, their uh, conglomerate, you know, 200 plus brands. So let's go ahead and bring on Jeremy and understand, you know, his take and, and views of what's going on in the space in general and his beliefs. So let's do that. Let's bring on Jeremy. All right. So bringing on our next guest, Jeremy Kaplan, the content director at Future. They own 200 plus brands, including Tech Radar, PC Gamer, many others. I am Sean Emery, founder and CEO of Avery and Company. Uh, welcome, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's kick it off. Um, first off, you know, give us a background of yourself so we understand, you know, who we are talking to in terms of the landscape of tech, in terms of the landscape of AR, VR, metaverse, all the things that are, uh, you know, top of mind today. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, thanks again for having me on the show. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a huge technology fan. I've been doing this for. 20 or 30 years. Uh, I started working at PC Magazine years and years ago. Uh, I worked uh, for a long time uh, at Fox News. I was the technology reporter over there. Um, worked uh, for Digital Trends for a long time as the editor in chief. And now I'm here at Future, working with a lot of the big brands we have. Future, a lot of people don't know it, but we're sort of this conglomerate that owns most of the biggest tech brands. So Tech Radar, uh, Tom's Guy, Tom's Hardware, Laptop, 
Android Central, I'm more on and on and on. Everybody. So I'm a huge, huge technology enthusiast, lover of all of this stuff. Um, and you asked me to talk about the metaverse, and I said, oh, gosh, here is a subject that I would just love to discuss briefly because, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to do is separate the hype from the reality. And I feel like it's nowhere is that more important than we talk about the metaverse. Yeah, no, it's exactly why we're bringing you on. You know, so lay the foundation for us. What do you think? So, so we often ask the question about what is the metaverse? I think that's the question that's obviously asked to everybody. For us, we want to take it another route and say kind of what problems are being solved with the metaverse. I think that's ultimately what will drive the future of this space. Um, so from your lens, obviously, I can allow you to define it in your own terms, but also, you know, talk about the problems being solved here uh, that you think are actually meaningful to society now and into the future. I love the way that you cast that, Sean, because that to me, that is in a nutshell, that's exactly what we need to do here. Um, I spent a long time uh, looking at that smart home content, for example, smart home products and, and services and whatnot. And if you think about it, like if you ask somebody, do you want a smart home? They're like, what the heck is a smart home? Why would I, do I want a smart home? No, I don't want a smart home. What they want is a solution to a problem. So, for example, you know, a camera that can watch your dog while you're at work, a key, key part of the smart home, but a solution to a problem. Or um, it's get, doing it with, uh, with physical keys and getting smart locks so you can get into your house easily. Or you can pass that code on to somebody else. Or if you're you know, renting a house out, you can easily hand out fresh codes and delete them. Easy and obvious solution to a problem. But a smart home, I don't, I don't really want a smart home. So then you have the, the metaverse thing. So, so what problem are we solving here? And I think fundamentally, that's one of the biggest issues, that, that there isn't actually a problem that is being solved here. The metaverse, to me, and let's be clear, I think the whole thing is kind of a boondoggle. Okay, so let me put that down there as a foundational, foundational point. I, I'm not sure what problem we are trying to solve. Uh, if you ask Facebook, the problem is that people haven't bought enough virtual t-shirts and they want to sell you a whole bunch of virtual clothing. Like, that's not a problem to me. That's an a business opportunity for somebody else. Um, it, it, the, the the technologies that we're looking at that might define what a metaverse is haven't really been built yet because there isn't really a problem to solve. It's this loose agglomeration of, of various other existing technologies. And the existing technologies do solve the problem. So, for example, virtual reality, a key backbone, a key part of what the metaverse is, that's solving a problem. The problem being my virtual games, not my, my, my video games, not immersive enough. Right. I remember the first time that I uh, I played a, a, a PSVR and it was just amazing. Like I'm leaning out the car window to get a better beat on some guy that I'm shooting with. And I was like, I'm in a, I'm actually in a store in a chair, but it just felt like an amazing experience. There's a problem being solved there. When it comes to metaverse, what problem are we solving? I don't see it. I don't know what it is. Yeah, no, I, I get that point of view for sure. The, um, so the gaming space, like you said, is is really where a lot of the interest has come uh, over the last, let's say, you know, call it five years. Um, and being that in that immersive kind of environment, that's definitely uh, seen a lot of traction. Now, you know, interestingly enough, what we've heard more and more lately is really around replacing the kind of hardware that exists today, whether it's, you know, the PC market, the laptop market. Um it sounds like, you know, I'm sitting here staring at a screen as opposed to, um, well, multiple screens, right? As opposed to one single screen or one single device that, that unlocks the, the ability to have multiple screens. Are you hearing, seeing anything in that realm where the, call it quote unquote metaverse or just simply virtual reality and or, you know, augmented reality or mixed reality, many of these different types of, you know, uh, uh, different experiences can actually be where the problem is or, or the solution to a problem which is too much hardware in the world uh, where you don't necessarily need it. So it's, it's almost like one of those things where we didn't think we needed the iPad. We didn't think we needed the Apple Watch with a computer on our wrist. And both of those are the number one selling devices in their categories specifically. Do you think this possibly could be one of those moments where we're simply not looking out just far enough of the, uh, the kind of uh, forward where maybe there is something here in terms of kind of the shift from hardware to much more digitizing some of the hardware we have today? You're looking at a, at, a, at a horizon point that I think is a very important one to look at. You know, so there's a there's a point when technology increases far enough, miniature, miniaturization gets far enough that we can have some devices that will enable some things that we're not even thinking of just yet. The, the, the basic ideas that people talk about with metaverse, I think, are fundamentally amazing. Like I said, I, I love technology. I'm, I'm Fox Mulder over here. I want to believe. For sure. You're Mr. Um, Tech. So. 
when Google Glass first came out and I could take these things off and put something smart on my face instead, absolutely, count me in. The, the concept, you want to be asking about the, the, the reason for having a metaverse. So the concept for, just as one example, of being able to walk down the street and get directions right here in your eyes, like augmented reality type stuff. That to me is amazing. And we don't have devices that can do it yet. What we have are things like the Oculus Rift, which frankly, I'm not going to wear for more than two hours. And the concept of being in a metaverse and wearing that full time, <laughs> absolutely not. The, uh, right. the headsets that Microsoft has come out with as well, um, which are amazing and arguably even more advanced than some of the Oculus stuff, also really uncomfortable. And I'm just not going to wear that. So, you know, eight years from now, once we've gotten to a good point and the technology has been miniaturized and you can have something you can wear over your face in a comfortable sort of fashion, I think then we can start more realistically saying, what are the good use cases for this? How are we going to apply this? And also, I mean, we'll get to this at some point, I hope, but what's the right balance of this in my own life? Because sure. technology should solve problems for people, um, but it's very easy for it to become overly addictive. And, and we all do this with our, small, our smartphones today, right? Like well, if we have this in our face around us at any given time, yeah. um, there's a real potential that, that becomes just hugely problematic. So finding a balance for something is going to be a challenge as well. But anyway, we, we need the right devices. And I just haven't seen anything that's anywhere near close enough yet. Yeah, I agree. I, the, the headsets, they're definitely for gamers. Some individuals that will sit there for hours on end uh, and don't necessarily care um, about it. For for me personally, yeah. I mean, I have the Oculus Quest, but it's not something I want to sit in for for too long. Um, now, the pass through technology is an interesting one that obviously the the Quest Pro has, and that allows you to obviously see the space around you. But again, you talked about miniaturizing these devices. I think that is super critical to go down. You need to go down the cost curve and the weight curve and the you know the form factor curve um, for this to go hyper mainstream, uh, where people are willing to accept both the cost solution, but the comfort uh, of it. Now, you wanted to talk a little bit about the balance, and I think that's an important uh, take here as well. You know, the iPhone does solve a lot of problems, but it does uh, create new problems that then have to be solved, likely by the iPhone kind of prompting us to get off our phones, um, ironically. Now, just talk about that balance and, and what you think about whether it's this space or just technology in general, given that you're 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 so embedded in, in tech more broadly. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think it's going to be a huge problem. I think we already have a problem in society with people doing too much online, um, being too immersed in their phones. I, I'm a huge part of this problem. <laughs> it's one of the things that we as journalists have to keep in mind is how do we convince people the right level of use of things like this? And, and this is why you said solutions. I, I, I can't stress that enough. Like, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, and when it comes to metaverse, the, the, I think it's creating it has the potential to create more problems than it solves. You know, one of the problems in society today is that we become a little bit less distanced. Uh, I'm sorry, a little uh, further away from from the people in our lives. And that, I mean, our, our loved ones, our family, but even just our colleagues, right? You know, we're, especially today, we're, with the uh, coronavirus, we're, we're working from home more, more frequently. We're interacting with other people uh, on, on less of an immediate level. And increasing that through metaverse, you know, having more virtual experiences where we can interact with people less, I think is going to be problematic. So I, I, I very much worry about what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to establish. Um, and there's a very real potential here, especially when we start talking about avatars. You know, one of the challenges with sites like Instagram or Facebook is we as human beings tend not to express the bad stuff. We want to create this glorified version of ourselves with only the good stuff. If you build yourself an avatar, you're not going to put pimples and warts and you know, a little black eye on the thing, right? You're going to show yourself in your best possible way. And maybe you've got cat ears because you like cats. And maybe you've got like, you know, a big pink mohawk that you wouldn't do in real life, but you've got in your avatar. Because you've created this idealized, stylized version of yourself, I think you're probably more likely to, to embrace it. In which case, maybe you're going to be in that world 18 hours a day. Like that's definitely the vision of people like Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I think we need more time outdoors breathing air. I think we need more time shaking hands with our friends. Um, yeah. so I, it just it feels like it's going to create some challenges that we as a society are going to have some problems with. Yeah, I mean, look, there's definitely definitely two um, parts of, let's say, this space, which is really the commercial side and the social side. Uh, the social side being, yeah, very similar to what we already see in gaming, uh, which is communities and, and kind of, you know, social... VR apps that are out there where you're actually in there for probably way too long. Then there's the commercial side, which ironically is probably the most advantageous from um, a 
market size and also, you know, the economics for many of these businesses that are going after it. I think we just saw that whether it's the Microsoft uh, Ignite conference, the Google conference, the uh, Oculus uh, Connect conference, really the emphasis around the commercial side. So again, I, I tend to agree a lot with the social implications of many of this. Um, but I also personally can see the commercial aspects where, you know, anything from training, training a pilot, anything from, you know, um, digitizing a, an office building so that uh, you have a what's called a digital twin of that office space um, where the you know electrician and plumbers and everything know exactly where everything is and use AR kind of glasses to, to quickly solve those those problems. I see those two aspects. Can, do you think there's a way for, you know, the metaverse is a single concept, yet that single concept has so many different paths. Um, and do you think the using one single term to describe, in theory, just the digitization of everything was the big mistake of, let's say, the those players inside of the metaverse? Yeah, it's it's tough because you do it's it's a, a great idea having this one big catchphrase that everything gets lumped under, yeah. and then you know there are so many different elements that we're lumping together that it becomes uh, a lumpy mess. <laughs> You know, right, right. it's hard to figure out exactly what we're talking about, especially when so much of it is is pie in the sky stuff that down the road would be fantastic. So like here's a great example. So when uh, Meta first announced that they were going to become Meta, they put out this video showing some of the things they hope we can get to in the future. One of the examples was you being a, at a concert virtually with a friend of yours. I love this. This is amazing. There are so many concerts I would like to go to, but I can't get to whether it's a different country or different state or. I'm just home doing something and I can't make it out that night. And if you could be at a concert virtually and interact with your friend who's there in the flesh, amazing. Like this is technology solving a real problem. However, we don't have any of the technology to do anything remotely like that today, sure. right? Like we don't, the holograms don't exist that we can interact with. We have hologram concerts and they work from afar, but not somebody sitting right next to you. And if you're beamed into a concert, as a hologram, how are you listening? You're not listening to your friend right here. This and you can't speak because you're just a hologram. Like it, it's it's impractical based on existing technology. And then to just lump that in next to VR and AR things we currently have, we know what they are. And it just becomes this smushy mess. <laughs> what right. Are we it's talking a, about? It's What's a smush of like 15 years down the line, but also things that are happening today, and people are having a hard time separating all of it because some of it is so far fetched, and some of it is so already happened. It's already happened. Like Roblox already exists. Um, yet, you know, the metaverse in itself doesn't even have like a, a real, um, you know, meaning to it. I mean, there's a meaning, right? People have actual definitions, but uh, well, I think every well, person I, I you talk to, to. Down, I wanted to come yeah. to your show with some numbers because it felt like an, an important moment to have some numbers. Yeah. So I saw a, a study that came out that said this year, the metaverse will have generated $62 billion and that by 2027, it'll be $427 billion worth of a thing, an economy. So I reached out to the firm that created these numbers and I said, where, where did this come from? And I've been reaching out for several days and they aren't getting back to me because it's a made up number. There is not $27 <laughs> billion, or $67 billion worth of, of stuff right now. You know, there's a, a virtual reality market that's pretty robust for what it is. And there's a small augmented reality market that's doing some, and there's some other stuff that they're lumping in there. But metaverse, to your point, like it's just, it's a lumpy mess and we can amalgamate technologies and call it whatever we want but the reality is what they're describing isn't there yet interesting so switching over to like the the actual headsets that are defining this space you know the quest pro that just came out the the, the um, quest the the original ones um that were before that the uh, you know tiktok's coming out with one you know snap has some of their augmented reality uh glasses um you know Anything that you have in terms of the Quest Pro, the announcement there, um, the Quest event, I don't know if you participated in it at all, but uh, Quest Connect, they, they had a lot of announcements with everything from Accenture, uh, uh, doing a, uh, basically providing 60,000 of their employees with Quest uh, Quest. Yeah. Um, just your thoughts around the, the announcements. I think it's very telling how early on we are in this whole thing. Um, the... the the announcement that we finally have legs for our avatars, uh, which we didn't have before, like that shows you where, where how <laughs> how new this technology is, right? Um, some of the stuff that Meta announced I thought was great. Um, the new avatars, pho photorealistic, those are astonishing. And yeah, those are wild. I, I couldn't, at first I was 
I didn't believe that it was an actual avatar. It was just it's that good looking. Um, so I think I think Oculus has been doing some great work there. I think we're, we're really getting a lot further along. Um, I still find it very disappointing that the Microsoft HoloLens hasn't really pushed further. I feel like the d design was nicer, and I some of the um, augmented reality experiences that they've created are just mind blowing. I remember the first time that I tried that thing on, they showed me a demo of using some of the footage from the Mars rovers, and you could just walk around on Mars. And it, it was just astonishing, just jaw dropping. I remember like, I'm, I'm looking at a rock, I bent down, the shadows bend down with me and change and alter around me so I could look underneath, so, like, astonishing. That just astonishing. Doesn't mean that I wanna be in the metaverse for 18 hours a day, however. Yeah. Um... The, in terms of the Quest, the actual Quest Pro, do you think, um, so, so the, the new device has pass-through, um, which again, allows you to see around you, which I think somewhat removes that, that siloed version of VR. Uh, it's much more of a mixed reality is what they're calling it, right? right? Which is where I can literally have, you know, a screen and that will be my, you know, my desktop screen, but then I can see everything around me. It, it still doesn't obviously improve the fact that this device on my head is, is still fairly heavy. Um, but it does, I think, unlock some of that experiential, uh, real world experience that, that we all want and love, um, while also combining that with some of the other stuff. Have you heard anything from, you know, any of the people that have actually received their Quest Pro here recently or have trialed it, uh, prior anyone on your team or anything like that, that has, uh, kind of communicated anything around the comfort and quality of the device? Yeah, uh, Tech Radar had some people that tried it out for the initial uh, go rounds there, and it is slightly more comfortable. The experience is definitely a lot more immersive because of that past past their experience. Yeah, um, and that is just as we get towards metaverse, that's going to be a necessity. You're not just going to be immersed in one world; you're going to be able to see the world around you. You know, painting technology into the real world, painting the real world back into technology. That's the whole thing. That's the nut of the metaverse. So this is a huge step forwards. Um, still feels a little to me like we're beta testing some hardware that's not there yet because this what well, this is what we need we, we need glasses we don't need right. a giant headset there's just it's unrealistic at present so for the next five years we're still going to have headsets uh it's so so this is definitely a step forward a step in the right direction and look it's good enough that uh facebook meta oculus whatever you want to call the company has sold 17 18 million of them so far so it's not a bad product it's just it's easy for you and I, for, for anyone really looking at it to say, I, I see where we are here. This is just a transition between here and there and where, where we get to. And look, sure. there's, there's, there's a path past that as well. I've talked to a couple of companies that make um, digital contact lenses where you can mm -hmm. just have metaverse, uh, whatever information it is, just painted directly into your eyeballs. Um, that feels far-fetched, mm -hmm. but they're not far off. So another you know, five years past that, we'll have something like that. What we do with this technology is really the hard part to figure out and how right. deeply embedded in our lives it becomes. That's going to be the big question. Okay. Well, we are wrapping up here. So we, we like to uh, have three questions um, in baseball terms. Uh, what inning do you think we are in terms of, you know, we'll put a couple different uh, words in there, but we'll just say metaverse as the, uh, as a, what baseball, what inning, one through nine. Bottom of the first. Bottom of the first. I tend to agree. We're, we're definitely on that side of the, uh, of the game. Um, What's one project that you've seen that excites you um, in this whole space? Whether again, commercial, social, uh, gaming, anything you name it. Uh, honestly, I, th I think the, the I mentioned the um, the Microsoft Hololens experiences. I feel like some of those were the most ex immersive experiences that I've ever seen. They have that same sort of pass through technology, so you can see the world around you as well as have an overlay of technology on it. Um, but that just felt like the most immersive version of virtual reality that I've ever seen. Makes sense. And then that they haven't sold more of those devices. They've sold, you know, 300,000 of them versus the tens of millions of Oculus devices that are out there. I've heard a rumor that potentially they're going to be slowly, slowly winding that area down, at least the investment area, which is um, could That's be true, could be not. I mean, I think there's uh, when you saw Microsoft at the Oculus event uh, uh, and really leaning into the other uh, systems, I think uh, that potentially is a signal. Um, Number three, the hype around the metaverse. I think I know where we're going to go here, but is it overhyped, underhyped, or you know, perfectly hyped uh, from the lens of uh, Jeremy Kaplan? Perfectly hyped. I love that. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to picture something that is perfectly hyped. No, uh, resoundingly overhyped. Um, it's it, this right now. We're at this phase where 
marketers are using this term more than anybody else. Technologists aren't using it. Uh, there, are, there aren't a lot of products that you can get that's just, this is 100% hype at present, which is, I think, a real challenge because there, there is some potential down the road at some point. All righty. Well, that is it. You know, thanks for coming on today, Jeremy. I appreciate you joining us uh, for this series and good luck on everything. Thank you. Pleasure being here. All right, cool. So that was Jeremy um, Kaplan from Tech Radar Future. Um, obviously appreciate having him on here. He had a slightly different view on it, which I think is great to have, you know, these counterbalancing perspectives. Um, next up is, is Steve Grubbs, and he is the co-founder of, of Victory XR, and they're doing a lot of stuff in the education space. I think this is uh, an interesting area for the concept of, you know, VR, AR to come together to improve outcomes uh, within the education system. As you know, we're big believers in, you know, digitizing a lot of what happens in education. Um, and they're doing some interesting stuff. Hopefully we can get some uh, pretty good insights into what they are building uh, again at Victory XR. So let's bring on Steve. <music> Alrighty, on to our next session. We're here with Steve Grubbs, the co-founder and CEO of Victory XR. How are you doing today? Doing great, Sean. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, um, wanted to bring you on here. You guys are doing some pretty exciting stuff, uh, specifically in the education space. You know, the purpose of this event is really to understand, you know, some of the use cases that exist in the metaverse, you know, instead of going down the rabbit hole of defining it to some form of precision, what we want to do is essentially, you know, have you define it for us in using use cases as an example. So tell us a little bit about you, what you're building and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. So I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Victory XR. And what we do is we build education in the metaverse, uh, metaversities, that type of thing. And so what that really means is if you think about how higher education and, and all education generally is, is moving, remote learning is skyrocketing. So you look at the schools with the, uh, the, the greatest growth. It's like, Western Governors University online, University of Maryland Global, Purdue Global, Liberty, all these schools that Purdue, that pursue um, online and remote learning, it, their, their growth is, is very high. But what do you, how do you deliver that education right now? It's mostly delivered through like Zoom or a, some 2D experience, which, which is fine for some subjects, but for most learning, it requires hands-on kinesthetic learning. And so uh, you've got to find a way to deliver that better. And so what we provide are, for some schools, a digital twin replica of their actual campus. For other schools, they just use our labs. But let's let's think about some use cases and jump in if you want to clarify anything I say. But think about some use cases. So cadaver labs, for example. You're learning anatomy. Maybe you're in health sciences, nursing, whatever the case might be. Very expensive, uh, very difficult to maintain. And, uh, you know, people don't like to provide uh, their bodies to, to science. So... Um, we created a one in virtual reality. It's synchronous, meaning all the students can be in there at the same time with their professor. The professor can take your hand, plunge it into the chest, pull out a human heart, hand it around for the students to hold, and then they can expand that heart until it's 10 foot tall, step inside, examine the ventricles, cavities. Then you can produce a diseased heart and do the exact same thing and compare the two. So that's one use case that's been very popular, but we also allow students to go on global field trips. So think about learning history, learning D-Day. It's one thing to read about D-Day or even to watch a movie like uh, Saving Private Ryan. It's another thing to be able to stand on the beaches of Normandy and the, the beaches in England where they, where they took off, departed, and, and to hear the story while you're looking around to actually be in a German pillbox. These are the things that, are, that really bring learning to life. And what we have found is students love to learn this way. Yeah, no, that is um, the D-Day thing. It sounds pretty interesting. You know, talk about how when you do go to these universities, these education systems, you know, what is how are they looking at it? Are, are they looking at it as a, a kind of a nice to have or a future version? You know, I think there's there's different campuses out there, universities that have truly embraced digital. Uh, you know, Arizona State's been known for kind of the stuff that they're doing there. Um, just in general, like what how are they how are you positioning it, I guess, and how are they adopting it? Uh, across their entire kind of uh, uh, education system. Sure. So uh, Morehouse College was the first school to have a full-scale metaversity. And, and you know, what, what they understand is this. The Fortnite generation has arrived at college. This, this generation of students uh, have grown up inside group metaverses. It might be a 2D metaverse uh, like Fortnite, or it might be, you know, something similar to that, Roblox or whatever the case might be. But 
groups of students get together, they, they go to entertainment, they learn, they game, they play, whatever the case might be. So it's not a surprise that they have a similar expectation for learning. I mean, they're, they're, they can go and sit in a row of chairs in a class and listen to a lecture. But if you really want to address your enrollment decline, then the better way to do it is to create a way that you're delivering learning and education in a way that students love it. And that's what we find in our surveys at the end of semesters, that students love learning this way. So we position it as this. You have a new generation of students arriving on campus. You need to meet them where they're at, and you need to deliver remote and online learning in a way that's better than what you're doing right now. And, and that makes sense to a lot of schools because we're signing up uh, new schools every week. Well, so, you know, obviously like 20 years ago, it was the laptop, right? And having the experience on a laptop version and the students potentially having it, schools giving them out, you know, in this uh, kind of format, what is the um, what is the, the, the platform of choice and how are schools thinking about, you know, having their their students adopt, whether it's, you know, an Oculus VR headset or some of the other versions of it all? Well, if you think about the tech stack that makes all of this up, you start with a platform. Uh, we have our own proprietary platform. We also use a platform called Engage and they both have different purposes. On top of that, then you have to have that layer of content that includes 3D models, uh, classrooms, like we can build whatever classroom we want. So we built a starship for astronomy. We built for paleontology, we built Dinosaur Island. You know, it's, it's cooler to go to class on, you know, a million years ago when you're learning about something right. like that than uh, in, a, in a brick and mortar class. Uh, so you have to have the classrooms, you have to have the 3D models, and then you have to have the professional development. So all of that sits on top of the platform. And then after that, the students have to be able to engage with that content. And that can happen with like a, a virtual reality headset, maybe one from Meta, the Quest 2, or Vive. Uh, HP's got a really high-end uh, version, Lenovo, Pico. They all have good headsets that can be used for this. Or you can access it through a 2D computer. It's sort of like um, if you think about playing Call of Duty um, on a computer. It's a 3D world, but you're able to interact with it through a computer. So it's the same thing with these Metaversity campuses. So that's sort of how the tech stack works up. We, we like to see schools provide students a headset to either check it out or for the students to own it um, because it's a richer experience than uh, accessing it through a PC. But some schools uh, don't necessarily go that route. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, potentially, obviously, because of the cost and, and, and use cases, at least up to today, how do you see, I guess, you know, there, there's clear use cases, um, l like you said, for different courses and subjects um, where it's really around, in, in some cases, using your hands, right? Um, and or looking, you know, there's, there's different dimensions uh, in some of the different subjects that you just talked about, whether it's, you know, uh, astron astronomy or, you know, uh, biology or anything like that, where, you know, what you're studying isn't necessarily, you know, just simple math. Um, how do you see kind of, you know, VR, AR? as it relates to a broad spectrum of the curriculum uh, across subjects, meaning, you know, you have a couple different subject matter that uh, there's definite use case versus some, maybe not so much. What's like your vision of, you know, merging all this together um, and the hybrid kind of environment that we're talking about in terms of how schools adopt it. And maybe again, you use a, a specific school as an example, how they're using it, you know, across their entire university um, in general. So anything you have around that. Yeah, let me let me give a specific use case, then I'll go talk about Morehouse College, how they have deployed it. So uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is a book that most students read in high school. And so you, you, you're not going to sit in virtual reality and read a book, but most people are familiar with either the movie or the book. And so what if, as you're discussing this book, what if you go into the courtroom from To Kill a Mockingbird? And some students sit on the floor level, some sit up in the balcony, just as it occurs in the book. Some sit in the jury box, one student sits in the judge's seat. And then you have the lawyers and, and you have a discussion from the perspective of of the of a scene in the book. You know, uh, we can do the same thing with all of the top uh, literature. So so even in use cases that people don't think about literature or reading, there's some really good use cases. So Morehouse College, they taught their first semester. They taught uh, world history and uh, or inorganic chemistry as well as biology. So, for example, on the week that they taught World War Two, the students took that class while on a battleship in the Pacific Ocean. And the professor was United States Navy retired. So uh, when class was nearing an end, he took them on a tour of the battleship and explained what all those different things that you always see on battleships do. So, so that's a way to make history come alive. Uh, in inorganic chemistry, where they deal a lot with molecules, the students were able to you know, hold a molecule in their hand, 
break it apart, put it back together and better understand it. Because molecules are a lot more complex than most people realize. It's not just like H2O. You know, they might have you know hundreds of atoms potentially. Sure. Uh, Biology 105, they took a field trip through a fallopian tube. That didn't happen very often. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the um, outcomes, you know, is there any studies, research yeah. that you guys have accumulated or have seen in the ecosystem that kind of can translate this type of method and potential outcomes? It sounds like it would, at least for me personally. Um, I know if I was on a, a, a field uh, on a ship somewhere uh, learning history, I think I would have been a little bit better at history. But um, yeah, anything that you can share on kind of outcome generation? Absolutely. Uh, if you look at uh, world history at Morehouse College, they taught the same professor, taught the same course in a brick and mortar classroom with lecture, and then through Zoom, and then on the Metaversity campus. And at the end of each of those semesters, they measured three things. They measured student engagement, student achievement, and student satisfaction. On all three measurements, the Metaversity came in head and shoulders above the other two options. And, and it, it was a significant improvement in all three. So what we know is at least in this one small comparative study that um, students love it, they're more likely to attend class and they get better grades. So yeah, so win, win, win. It sounds like, um, you know, how, how are, again, and share what you want in terms of, you know, the sale here. Um, again, we're an investment firm. So we always try to understand, you know, the financial outcomes, the, the also the outcomes that you just shared, which is the value being created to the students in this specific area. Uh, but then, you know, how are they thinking about this in terms of budget? You know, is this, again, experiential? Um, or is this something, again, that they're leaning into and they're, they're continue year after year allocate whether it's a little bit more budget or a lot more budget as they continue to see kind of use cases like you just shared. Yeah, I'll talk about that, but I also want to hit on the growth. A year ago at this time, we had two metaversities. Today we have 40. By the end of the, this year, to seven months, weeks from now, I think we'll have 50 to 55. So we're signing them up right and left. We don't call anybody. We just take incoming calls and then discuss uh, the, the options. So that's been extremely helpful. Uh, and, and the reason they do it is, first of all, if you land a student, and if you think about it, you know, tuition is going to be twenty to 30000 a year at most institutions, right? Uh, four years of a student is eighty dollars to $120,000 of tuition. So if they invest $100 per semester in a headset, um, and then a license is uh, $100 a semester, so at $200 of that per semester, that's less than my law school books cost. Sure. So it's not a big investment, but the potential to land new students is significant. Got it. No, that makes sense. So let's talk about the ecosystem. You know, obviously you talked about the different types of headsets. Um, you know, I think the developer ecosystem, specifically around Oculus uh, or MetaQuest, uh, has been enormous. And you've kind of seen that um, exponential growth over the last couple of years. The whole ecosystem has benefited. You go to the other headsets, you know, just can you counterbalance maybe your views on the different ecosystems, maybe a Whatever is the strength, the weakness that you see, at least as of right now? Yeah. So first of all, you know, there, we, we were sort of in the middle of this um, VHS versus Betamax debate. Now, you might not know that reference, but back in the early days of VCRs, you know, there were two competing systems. Ultimately, VHS won. We're looking at a similar thing with AR and VR. You know, I think that both will succeed, but Apple's betting heavy on AR. And, um, you know, we expect for them to really come out with some strong AR products probably in 2023. Um, Meta has bet heavy on VR, but their latest headset also has passed through for AR. So even though AR and VR is a little bit jargony, the bottom line is that you're going to have two metaverses out there. One where you're fully in and, and the second uh, where you walk around with your glasses on, there's this entire invisible world all around you that you don't see. You tap the glasses and suddenly the invisible world becomes visible. It might be for wayfinding. It might be for um, you know fun things to do. It might be cryptocurrency that's on the sidewalk that you can put in your wallet. So all of this is happening. We're building it all. We'll, we were the first to launch metaversities. We'll launch our AR metaversity sometime next year. And and so it really matters how that rolls out and who the partners are. Yeah, super exciting. Um, general uh, view on the Oculus or Meta uh, Pro uh, yeah. headset that they just came out with. Yeah, we, we, ours is on its way, uh, but uh, the friends I have in the industry who have used it, they love it. Uh, and, and here's what it does for us. You know, we've got this great cadaver lab that the universities love, but when you've got it on, you know, you are separated from everybody else, which is no big deal if you're in your apartment or your dorm room. 
But if you're all sitting around a table together, then what you really want is the AR pass-through that comes from the MetaQuest Pro. So we can all sit around this table in our classroom and we can see each other, we can talk to each other, but then in front of us is this human body. And, and that allows us to engage with anatomy and physiology and all of those things while still uh, being aware of all the people around us. So we, we really love that about the, the Pro. Nice. Man, you've, uh, you've given us quite a bit of a uh, use case ta and tangible, uh, you know, evidence of, of, of what's happening here. You know, for everyone, we've kind of given, you know, three questions. Uh, would love to hear them from you. First, you know, baseball game, one through nine, what inning do you think we are in terms of, you know, the concept of the metaverse? I'd say second inning. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, right around there. I think first to third is, is kind of your, your, your general views, even for people that are, that are in the industry deep, such as yourself. Um, Number two is really, you know, it could be your project, but any project that you've seen out there that kind of gave you the aha moment, you know, something that you think is exciting out there today. Um, anything you want to share about a project out there that uh, kind of has excited you or, or excites you today for the future? Yeah, there's a bunch of them, but, you know, Alan Smithson's Metaverse Mall, I think, uh, could be a game changer uh, as people begin shopping in the Metaverse. And then uh, I really like the avatar system that Ready Player Me has set up. We, we're using that in our VXR labs. Um, and then... You know, what we're rolling out with health sciences, our, our emergency room and our hospital room for nursing and med techs, uh, that's going to be a game changer because it's we're desperately in need of more healthcare professionals and we can't get enough trained, can't get enough practicum. So this is going to open it up uh, for hospital systems and universities. I got to I got to you got to keep going on that one. So what, what's exactly the, uh, the, the value there that you think is being created? So if, if you think about the problem, we've got. We, we don't have enough nurse techs, med techs, nursing assistants. And so in, to ask a someone to come to a campus is a challenge because most of these people have another job. If they can attend a campus at home and they can learn kinesthetically, they can turn the knobs on a machine, they can attach the, 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 the devices to the patient, and they can do it all from their home in the evening and get all that practical hands-on learning with a live instructor that completely changes the paradigm. And once it does that, it's going to open up a lot more students and, and uh, they can also actually get uh, their practicum in, which they need to be able to, to become certified to work in a hospital. Fascinating, fascinating. The, um, the, the last one is, you know, the concept of the metaverse, is it overhyped, underhyped, or perfectly hyped uh, relative to, you know, um, some of the buzz out there? Underhyped, the, the narrative that we're getting today all due to Meta's stock price, or most of it due to Meta's stock price, is that uh, oh, the metaverse isn't working, it's not going anywhere, people don't like it, they don't use it. This couldn't, this could, this is just not true. Uh, the bottom line is that it's going to happen, it's going to be big, we are all going to engage with it at one level or another, and it just reminds me of the early days of the mobile phone when, when the, the 50 year olds saw the 18 year olds all running around with their heads in their phones. <laughs> and they said, ah, you're not. And now, Everybody's like that. So uh, adoption will occur and you know, people, you have to be patient. You know, this is challenging technology, but it's uh, it's game changing technology. Impressive. Impressive. Yeah. The, um, I'll leave it there. You know, if, if people want to find out more about what you guys are doing, you know, where should they go? We have a lot of investors or areas that uh, follow us for ed tech in general, but, uh, just in general, like where should uh, people look to find more about what you guys are doing? So to learn more about the company, victoryxr.com. Yeah, our YouTube channel has over 200 videos. We're in the middle of our Series A. We're trying to close that out by the end of the year. Um, and, and you can just email me at steve at victoryxr.com or hit me up on LinkedIn. Awesome. Steve Grubbs, appreciate you coming on. Congrats on everything. And uh, I hope the rest of the year is, uh, is, a, is a good one. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Okay. Thanks again, Steve. Uh, yeah, go check out their website to see what they're building. I think it's uh, pretty interesting to go from, you know, 20-something schools to 50-something schools to on pace to, you know, 100-plus universities. Uh, again, if, if 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 that doesn't signal anything to you, uh, to anyone out there, kind of um, trying to understand the space, uh, I think that was pretty pretty clear evidence of of continued traction in terms of the education system embracing this, uh, specifically during these times. Um, now let's turn to more of kind of the gaming side. Uh, we're lucky to have Zim, uh, who you know he's a gamer, he's a podcast host. They do so many wonderful things in this space uh, and get the perspective not only as a builder but a podcast host that gets to see many of the different stuff happening. Um, uh, around it, you know, I think gaming is 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 integral to the foundation of what's happening here. And Zim has a lot of that perspective as as a gamer, user, streamer, but also you know being a host uh, on a pretty successful podcast. Um, I think you know 
he gets to see a broader perspective uh, that he can share with us here. So let's bring on Zim. All right. So welcome, Zim. Hey, how's it going, Sean? Good, good. You know, I really like your channel. We were just talking about it. You know, you really break down the ecosystem very well. Um, you know, start with giving us kind of the 30 second rundown of who Zim the gamer is, the person, the podcast host, the VR analyst, kind of anything you want to share uh, before we get into it. Sure. Um, so my background is, is is relatively simple. I started in 2014, around the time that Oculus launched their DK2, their second development kit. And um, I, I started streaming on Twitch. I just moved to Scotland at that point. And um, and essentially just kind of picked up and started engaging with audience. And I saw, you know, viewer count go from 20 to 200 to 2000. It was like, wow, okay, things are kind of starting to blow up here. People are interested. The common question we would get is, what is that thing on your face? Um, that was that was fun back in the day. So it's been eight years streaming. Uh, started off five years on Twitch, last three really on, on YouTube. And that's kind of, I made that transition uh, based on discoverability on Twitch. And then uh, for the last five years, we've been running the FBLA podcast, which is a now a fortnightly cast. Um, we just actually recruit up. So we have two new, new people as uh, hosts with myself and uh, those three others. And fortnightly, we get together and talk about everything VR, AR and MR related. So it's been a been a great kind of wave to be riding because um, if there's one thing that's really obvious to me is that, man, I'm a lucky guy to be able to be here at this moment in time when everything changes from having one reality to moving to having multiple realities. So yeah, that's, that, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah um, so you're on all the different channels. I think you're on Oculus as well, right? In terms of, uh, do you do a podcast in VR? Uh, we don't we we don't do one in VR, um, and that's actually by design. So we very much by design are here to be human faces, much like this cast. You know, it's like there's something special still about being able to see faces. Definitely. Now, I'd say there's there's definitely a challenger coming into that space when you got 3D volumetric capture of you know human body and all those nonverbal uh, bits and pieces. And of course, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg and others are, are talking about this now. How much that's going to be where we're going to, uh, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Right? I mean, nonverbal is something that you notice you lack when you're in that space. So doing it as a podcast right now, you have to stand on the opposite side of Uncanny Valley and look across and go, I don't really connect with that non-human avatar. So for us, we decided we're staying human for now. <laughs> I like I like the concept. And, you know, kind of going to the next point here is, what is the problem then, you know, that AR, VR, you think is solving maybe, you know, today and call it five years from now, something on the, the kind of uh, tangible time horizon as we think about, you know, where the devices are and or just the concepts around them. I'll tell you, five years is so much shorter now, having having seen the last like, you know, nine or 10 um, since this all kind of kicked off again. But um, right. in the five years, like, what are we going to be able to solve in that space? Hopefully to be able to get to a point where we can work and socialize in a place uh, where a plane fight flight isn't necessary to achieve the same kind of human connectivity. I think that's probably the main one. Um, and I say that as a guy who's got a golf date uh, with his nearly 70 year old father, Every week we we go on the putting green and he's off in Ireland, you know, and he's up until midnight his time. And I'm just after work here on the East Coast. And, um, you know, it, it keeps us in connection in a way that we simply couldn't if, if it wasn't that, you know, phone call, Zoom call, whatever you want to, you know, have it just doesn't replace, you know, standing next to your father in that space where you can see, you know, his physical form and he sees yours, even if it's a bit nascent now, that, that's what it solves. It solves connectivity really more than anything else. Got it. Um, now talk about the tools that we have today. You know, Quest just had a big event, you know, MetaQuest, yeah. uh, the, the the MetaConnect, uh, the actual event. You know, there was a lot of stuff that actually came out of there, whether it was game announcements versus, you know, the new uh, Pro headset that they're coming out with. Give us kind of your high level thoughts. I know you have an entire kind of um, uh, a couple of things on your channel that where you, where you speak about some stuff, specifically battery function and some others. Just talk about, you know, the starting thoughts around uh, the entire event. I, I think it's a really, I can boil it back into a really simple statement, which is, um, when we saw, you know, the CEO of, of Microsoft get on screen with, with Zuckerberg, who's obviously leading Meta, you know, ex, ex Facebook, you could call it, um, seeing those two, you know, behemoths kind of link up, join arms and look at the metaverse and say, we're going to take a stake at this game. Uh, it's a little bit daunting, uh, to be honest, because <laughs> take, take the devices that we have now or even in the next number of years, you know, let's put those aside. But when you've got, um, you know, in the face of governments and regulators and all that, the internet is already kind of the Wild West. This is really the Wild West, you know, squared or, or cubed, if you want to call it that. And I think out of everything else they announced, I mean, the hardware, the fact that people are kind of including these these big corporations are taking working in VR seriously and really taking a push into that direction. Um, yeah, that partnership between Meta and Microsoft, that that's that's like 
just hearing that live, um, that's another one of those events where you're like that in 10 years time, people are going to look back and go, wow, it all changed then, you know? And um, I really, th- I really believe that. So interested to see where it goes. I think there's pros and cons to be had anytime you've got new technology and big partnerships like this. But one thing I can almost guarantee is regulators won't have time to catch up. So the next 10 years, again, it's kind of wild west all over again uh, in this, in this new era of the operating office internet, you know? So. Yeah, I agree with you with that big takeaway. I mean, I think when I saw, you know, both CEOs on kind of, I guess, digital stage here, because Microsoft had their own event to attend, um, that, you know, it said a lot, you know, the a product announcement typically may be like the head of the department or division. Uh, in this case, it was the CEO literally going there and saying Microsoft 365 will be on and available on Oculus um, and really laid out. I think they, they gave them maybe five minutes of kind of communication time throughout that event. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Now, you know, when you think about the ecosystem today, uh, you know, what are some of the main uh, participants you see today, whether it's, you know, work, gaming, just highlight and share with kind of the listeners audience here around what you see from on the inside um, that maybe those on the, the side here, the metaverse, um, and don't really kind of, you know, put the two and two together. Mm. I think the one of the biggest um, one of the biggest applications of VR today is is actually the social side. And the thing that I think a lot of people don't get to understand or see in mainstream media generally is, you know, what has only in the last 12 months been branded as the metaverse, uh, what some people are calling, I don't know, the next internet, cyberspace, whatever you want to call it. Like, that's not something that's, um, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, it's five years ago, really. I mean, it's something that people already do. There's um, people get together for, you know, full body tracks, dance clubs. uh, And I'm not talking just, you know, 12 year olds and 16 year olds playing with their, their parents' headsets. I mean, it, it's kind of an adult venture, kind of like I have friends in the gaming space who like met up in second life and found their wife or, you know, partner life partner that way. Um, and, and, you know, they're still together. They had kids, whatever changed their lives like inexorably. That's the same thing here. Really. It's just that there's um, social ties that are, that are kind of using the technology and when it's good enough for someone to kind of just get in and stay connected with someone or meet new friends, have a language exchange, whatever the case might be that draws you in, then gets you stuck in there. I mean, I used to venture in a simple app in an Oculus Go headset called Wander, which is Google Maps in 3D. And you'd stumble on, upon people, just random people around the world, right? Someone at an army base, someone in southern Georgia, like all kinds of different people you'd, you'd run across. Um, and they're just looking for a conversation or looking to connect with another human being. And, you know, you're using at the streets of Poland or something in there. It's, it's so, so that is happening and it's not like a future thing. Um, it, that's happening now. What, what I think is, is not here yet is very much that, that picture of the future that's, you know, that's being painted right now, like this ubiquitous kind of all enveloped ringed garden, very much what Apple's apparently going after in augmented reality space. But we haven't seen any hardware from them yet. We've seen their AR kit come out and that's quite impressive as a stack. Um, and then, of course, Oculus kind of being the dominant party, uh, now called Meta, of course, um, you know, them being the dom- dominant party for this whole kind of virtual reality space and now kind of per- pushing towards a more mixed reality boundary, you know, bringing AR into their headsets, pass through into their headsets, right? And so I think we're seeing that kind of mix come through, but I think they've already tackled a lot of, not just the gaming, gaming is sorted, right? We, we, we've been convinced, we were convinced back in 2014, like we knew it was a thing we wanted to step into the game. Um, but really now we're seeing the change and the transformation to, you know, all day work. Um, and I, I'm not convinced that the new headset will do that for everybody, like an artist or an architect who needs, you know, long, long time in the headset. But for somebody who's doing a demo and you're like, you know, got someone walking in, they want to see their new Tesla in blue and not you know, silver on the show floor, you can pop them in a headset, they can walk around and, and actually see it in front of them. Those kind of applications, absolutely, you know, this new headset is the pro is going to be perfect for that, you know, a couple of hours of wear time and, and you're sorted. So yeah, um, last main question here before I hit you with the, uh, you know, the three questions we're asking uh, every guest on, on on this session, you know, last question is really around what needs to be done at the hardware level, do you think, or even the software level, it's up to you. Um, to further, you know, expand the universe um, that's out there uh, within this space. Jeez, expand the universe within this space through hardware or software. I'll pick software. Um, I think hardware has actually come a very long way. We've got hand tracking, leg tracking, all that kind of stuff, right? So I'll put that to one side. And I think that Meta have done a really good job in R&D on that and kind of pushing forward, leading the way. Um, But on software, like at a platform level, what I really am itching for at this point, um, it's kind of like, I'd love there to be the the Etsy of VR to some extent, like VR headsets. Um, so I say software, but I mean, I want to be able to pick up any OpenXR platform 
hardware device that's like thrown together with somebody, modular bits and re-engineered, whatever the case is, and experience something that's open and not controlled um, within just one ring fence. You know, so they've got these platforms and they're being built now. Um, I don't remember there being a closed wall uh, internet. I, w- I would certainly, you know, connect that with the thought of China, I suppose, is, you know, here's your internet, <laughs> here's the boundary. Right. Um, I don't want a boundary fence around my, you know, next internet. So I actually think that where we need to be careful is just, you know, safeguard and watch these platforms as they grow. And I would really like to support and see that software stage, that platform, that like next iteration of the internet in virtual and augmented environments. I'd like to see that spring to life and uh, and really take root. So that's where I think we need to spend a bit more time, energy, and just awareness, right? And support the efforts that are already driving in that direction. Got it. That makes sense. It sounds like your perspective is is more on that decentralized uh, arena versus kind of that centralized with the hope of interoperability uh, after the fact. Um, yeah, I would agree. Somewhere between all that is probably where it all lands. But, you know, three questions we're asking every guest, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in baseball terms, I'm a big baseball guy. What inning do you think we are in, uh, in terms of the metaverse type of concept or just the entire ecosystem in general? I think, again, the metaverse, um, word term in some ways has a, uh, I wouldn't say a negative connotation, but it, it's skewing on that side more than a positive one. Um, right. baseball in a nine inning game, where are we? Okay. Nine innings. Yeah, I'm not, nine innings. <laughs> I don't know much no about extras, baseball actually. No extra. Um, <laughs> one to nine. Ah, uh, third base. So, <laughs> okay, so or third, third inning, inning or whatever you're going to, um, there you go. Yeah, because, and I'll, I'll clarify that because I think we have proven that the hardware get to a point where it's enough for your average Joe consumer to kind of be willing to put it on and try it out. Um, I don't think that person on average walks away purchasing a headset right now. Um, and I think that we've got a bit of a ways more to go, as I said, in terms of how this all plays out in terms of those boundaries. I do think that we do need the pockets that are walled off and like Apple has done in the past, you know, with the mobile ecosystem. It's like you need those ring gardens for like quality and simplicity um but i also think that you know the wild west needs to stay wild to some extent so sure. looking forward to that the innovation kind of you know ecosystem to thrive um one project that you've seen uh that excites you oh jesus uh, <laughs> um that's gonna be a funny one this is gonna be a real funny one um a few years ago probably 2016 uh, i donned a special piece of equipment uh, that at the time was touted for you know south park um they they, they had a, a game out and they, they were they were mocking the Oculus Rift by releasing the Nauseous Rift, which was a <laughs> nose worn smell device where you smell something nasty every time something happened on screen. Anyway, uh, multi sensory perception, like I said, with the connectivity side, has a really strong uh, tie for us as humans. So, like you know, smelling fresh air, smelling recently raked leaves, you know, that kind of damp, weird <laughs> smell. All these things like really, really have a heavy tie for you. So, although it's not limited to smell, I think that sensory everything from like we're doing tactile now you can get force feedback and controllers and stuff like that but when you get to the stage where without going to the limit length of like neural link where you're tapping into your brain and giving you the senses all over your body and replacing you know what your brain's doing i do think some kind of exterior interaction um, is going to help kind of add to the immersive effect and so that's definitely gonna be a viral moment i know that whenever (laughs) you know that is widespread um i can already kind of you know think about some interesting things that people will be doing with that. You Pain know, and no, pleasure. <laughs> Pain and pleasure. <laughs> the last one here is around, you know, the hype. Is the hype, you know, just right? Is it underhyped? Uh, is it overhyped? You know, where, where do you stand on this? I think I have a good uh, perspective on where you probably stand. <laughs> um, but some of it is all relative to, I guess, our, our surroundings. Yeah. I think you have to answer that question on the, on behalf, almost speaking on behalf of, of others to some extent, because, yeah. I mean, from my perspective, you, there is not a better time uh, and there was no repeat of this timeline that's going to happen again, I think, where you know, I'm so lucky to be at a, at a stage in my life where I can afford the equipment. I've got stability enough that I can kind of enjoy this stuff for hours on end type of thing, share it with others. So for me, it's like one of those once in a lifetime, like lottery sweepstake wins. So that's what it feels like for being here at this point of inflection for us. Um, so for me, my hype level hasn't really reduced since 2014. I'm just super excited about it. I wouldn't be still doing it if I wasn't. And it's something that really drives me like every day and I'm touching VR most days of my life. So it's, it's, it's something huge for me, but in general, I think like your general consumer, um, I really don't think this is going to go the way of, of like the 3d television or, you know, um, watching gravity and 3d and the cinema, all this kind of stuff. Like, I think, um, I do think that we're at a stage now just in the last 12 months, um, where companies have finally bitten into and enough people have kind of gotten the fish hook that they're saying, Oh, I'll throw money at that. So you get all these 
you know, angel investors coming in, you get people kind of putting money behind it. And it's very similar to what happened in like crypto markets and stuff like that, where everyone's all of a sudden taking an interest. And so they're filling the hot air balloon and eventually it'll normalize. But for now, yeah, it's overhyped. Yeah. Okay, cool. You know, look, Zim, we're going to end there with this session. Thanks for coming on. You know, I appreciate you joining us today and, you know, good luck sure. on everything. Okay, so that was him. Um, now, you know, Brian Eppert is next from Noda.io. Um, this is around like mind mapping, so productivity communication. Um, it, it's really around, you know, a lot of people do mind maps in kind of 2D screens. And I think, you know, what Brian and his team are really building uh, seems very interesting. I want to learn more. Um, so let's bring on Brian to describe to us, you know, why this is a better solution in a, in a kind of virtual world uh, or 3D world where you, can, you actually have space around uh, building mind maps. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to understand a little bit more what that means if you don't use them already. But it's really just trying to, you know, you have an idea of something and then you have different uh, kind of offshoots of that idea um, to kind of control and, and understand, you know, the path of, of uh, or map of what you're trying to either build, learn uh, in general. So here is Brian. Let's bring on Noda.io. <laughs> All right, so let's bring the founder of Noda into the session, Brian Eppert. Uh, welcome today. Hey, Sean. Nice to be here. Thanks. Yeah, so so Noda.io uh, is a mind mapping, brainstorming, whiteboarding, uh, kind of uh, connected thinking VR <clears throat> solution. You know, mind mapping whiteboards are pretty popular today, generally. Uh, I know in the 2D world they are. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Noda, the origin, and honestly, why kind of in VR, you think this makes a lot of sense versus maybe a 2D version. So kind of going through that, that, that process and journey. Yeah, sure thing. There is a lot of uh, interest and in, in attention these days on what they call spatial canvas. And that's um, like when they say that, they usually mean the 2D version. So Miro is a great example of that. I think Apple's coming out with one called Freeform. And it's, um, it's a way to organize thoughts in a two-dimensional way versus uh, maybe a outliner format you might be used to from Word or other simple, simple outline or to-do list type tools. So a spatial canvas allows you to spread things out and you can use that to do things like mind mapping and communicate bigger topics, larger ideas that aren't as well structured as let's say a top to bottom list. So that's that works well in 2D, but it works even better in three dimensions because now you've got an extra way to move things around. And immersive technology really is completely different. It just flips the whole paradigm of computing from the person sitting in front of the screen and working with that interface to the person uh, being the center of the interface and the screens simulating a virtual world around you. So when I started working with this stuff in 2014, 2015, uh, the, the, one of the first things I wanted to do was express my ideas in 3D space. So just hold up a simple con hand controller or hand and speak and see my words appear and then speak again in another spot, and then put my ideas out there, and then move them around, organize them, and connect them. So that's what I've been working on for the last couple of years, and it's called Noda. Uh, it's available on the Quest headsets now. It's also available on Steam for PC VR. Interesting. You know, when you think of, um, so you're a developer, you know, at, at, at core, you also, you know, are the leader of Noda. Talk about, you know, what you're seeing in terms of, the developer ecosystem as it relates to, you know, some of the, the platforms you just mentioned, whether it's, you know, Steam or Quest or some of the other headsets that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, just talk about the developer ecosystem in general, what platforms are, are tend to be most appreciated. Uh, we're hearing a lot of good things across the board, across some of those. Um, just what you're hearing. Well, I, I've seen a couple of transitions. So the first was PC VR. It was like you had to connect it to a, a headset to a, a computer, it had to be a reasonably powerful computer which was kind of limiting in a niche kind of field. And then we moved to a standalone device, which was the MetaQuest, it was then called the Oculus Quest. So that's a headset you can just wear on its own. You don't need a computer. And that was the first revolution, I think, in, in this space, where now it just opened up to a whole new field of people. And the Quest ecosystem is probably the furthest ahead. It's the healthiest uh, of all the available places to make VR apps. And I think we're kind of heading into a third transition now where the headsets are, are featuring uh, pass-through modes. So you've got these VR headsets that have cameras facing the outside. They pass that video feed into the headset so that you can see what's around you. So they're calling it mixed reality because there's uh, the real world of surroundings that pass through the headset cameras. And then there's virtual content overlaid on that. 
So these are mixed reality devices and uh, the, the MetaQuest Pro, which just came out recently, is a great example of that. And I think there's probably a couple others coming out soon, which will open that field even further. Interesting. So, you know, there, there's this big debate between, you know, uh, use case and mm -hmm. what people are, you know, are we, are we truly sol solving like real problems? You know, I think you're a pretty interesting use case in general. But I think to validate some of that, you know, I don't know if you have any cu customer references in terms of like who's at least interested in your, your product, interesting ways they're using your product, um, anything you can share there to, you know, help us gauge, you know, what kind of activities happening behind the scene more at the, you know, this is a productivity tool, as opposed to a lot of the social stuff that's happening uh, in VR, XR, uh, AR, um, just share anything around that. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think about it like the problems to solve are the same problems people are using things like Miro to solve now. So it's um, brainstorming, collaboration, planning. Um, I mean, we have people using it for planning their own lives. Like, what am I going to do with my career or my personal life or where am I going to go to school? That kind of brainstorming. And then we also have people using it for project planning with teams. So creating a you can imagine a timeline in 3D space. We've got a, a one environment that's like a street. So people will make a timeline that goes right down a road and then they'll start putting items in that timeline when they're gonna unfold. So it's a, it's a very physical way to interact with information. And I think that helps a lot of people connect to it more deeply. So it's a tangible experience. You touch things with your hands, you speak out loud, you move your body around and you relate to that content in a more deeply felt way. So I think the problems to solve are a lot of the same problems we use technology now. It's just maybe a better way to solve it for some people, especially people who are spatial thinkers. You can usually see them because they're moving their hands around when they talk. Those are the kinds of people who really appreciate this medium. It's just a new medium. It's like, why was a color movie better than a black and white picture? I think because it's, it's a richer experience that's closer to how we experience the world. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense in terms of the experience that people are looking for. Now, speaking about that experience, and, you know, I think getting to the point where a lot of people at some point will require spatial type of um, uh, analysis or, or engagement with some of the products and solutions we're going to be using or using today. Talk about, you know, the form factor of the hardware and maybe as a developer, I think you have to build for the future, right? And, and, understand, okay, there's the Quest 2 and, and some of the other devices that are out there, but what's going to happen in the future? Is this going to be a smaller device? What does that mean? What does with, with and without controllers potentially mean? Talk about how you think about that roadmap, uh, ultimately, which I guess points to where you think you know the hardware is eventually going to go. Uh, anything around that, timeline thinking around that, um, anything you can share? Yeah, well, our our timelines are, we're, we're working kind of to where things are going to go. So we've been working towards the current generation of devices for the past maybe two or three years. And we're working now towards these mixed reality and eventually augmented reality glasses where it's a, a, a much more comfortable kind of wear all day format, uh, form factor. So ideally, we'd get down to a pair of sunglasses, it would look like. But uh, that's projected maybe five or ten years in the future. I think there'll be a couple stages as we as we kind of get there. So more, I'm planning for more comfortable, longer use sessions, better resolution, so that you could read smaller pieces of text, um, and more of that kind of mixed with reality sort of thing. I'm also planning for controllers to become optional or secondary versus hands, which are probably going to be primary. And uh, okay. one other kind of X factor is the. Um, is the sensors that may be added to the headsets. So there's some cool devices which are almost reaching the consumer level, which involve uh, brain and neural activity sensors. So you'd be able to get some, some rough readings on a person's emotional state, their interest levels, their focus, and those could be piped in back into the experience to sort of aid and, and, and further the person's uh, use of the technology. The recent one we've got now is a new sensor for tracking eye movement. And this is out in the MetaQuest Pro. Uh, so eye and face tracking is brand new to these devices, at least on a consumer level. And that's just, just now kind of coming out. So I, see, I think we'll see interesting things happen with that. We started experimenting with it now for zooming text at a distance. So if you look across the room, you've got a large mind map. Sometimes people make like room size mind maps of content. And if you're across the room, it's hard to read anything. So you've got to go teleport, but go over there to read it. Well, now we've got the eye tracking. So I'll bring the text up as you're looking around. And it's almost like a 
subconscious zoom. So you just look and gaze with your interest and you see content raised to, to meet you. So that's a really, I think it's not possible with any other digital technology. Uh, and I think that's one of the interesting areas that we'll see kind of explored further is eye tracking and potentially some sort of uh, neural interface or brain sort of awareness and sensors there. Yeah, that's pretty uh, interesting. Obviously, at the at Quest Connect, they they did talk about uh, control, uh, CTRL. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they acquired that company I don't know five years ago, um, and there were some interesting use cases around kind of what you're talking about. Uh, no controllers, no very no movement, and it's all just based on on you know your body giving those signals um, of what you are trying to achieve, which is pretty fascinating. It's at, at one level it's scary, but at, at one level it's it's fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. Talk about, you know, some other use cases, you know, around productivity. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think Noda fits in a pretty interesting productivity uh, place. Um, But there's so much to productivity, whether it's, you know, communication to uh, uh, things like uh, uh, tasks, uh, Mm -hmm. mind mapping, whiteboarding. What are other areas you think that are like low-hanging fruit within the productivity kind of uh, arena that stand out to you? Well, (laughs) I had been thinking about this and I kept getting um, sort of incoming requests to, to, uh, to partner on, on various applications and they were varied applications. So I, I wasn't sure maybe what, if there was a theme or not, but I, what I sort of came to realize was that I think there's a need for some sort of um, connector. So I think people are doing real world things with existing technology. They want to bring it to the, the metaverse or immersive tech technology. And they had something close with Noda, which was basically it's it's a it's a network diagramming tool in 3D. You draw shapes and connections. You can bring in pictures and video and, and websites, but it's basically a, a diagramming tool in 3D space. So people were asking to work together, creating different kinds of projects. And I realized what they really needed was a way to use this technology that made sense to what they already knew. So we have an integration API, it's JavaScript based, it's web technologies that people can use to create their own sort of experiences inside Noda. And we've seen that in use already for things like um, uh, psychology. So people doing therapy sessions based on a a room layout. Um, There's an interesting guy named Martin Butterfly. He's doing something called Innerverse, not the metaverse, but the Innerverse. So it's um, it's a gardening metaphor for, for mental health. And he's using the API to create those. And we've got an um, interesting project in manufacturing as well. So tying the Noda app into a bill of materials system. This is uh, David McKenzie at ITE is, is working on this. So he'll bring in a bill of materials on a web page, and then that'll blow out into a 3D space with all of the, all of the materials and all of the components of that manufacturing build. And the way he described it is it's hard to get on a meeting with people on a spreadsheet of, you know, 600 lines and go through a manufacturing process cycle and plan that out. But it's a lot easier in a 3D space to be side to side with other people. And around you is this bill of materials. So you can go piece to piece and examine those with your hands and sort of bring up a web page for each one. And that that melding of experiences is, I think, one of the best parts of collaborating in virtual reality or immersed or mixed reality, because you you break away from the video call plus the 2D spreadsheet or doc or, or mural board, and you bring that into one medium. So you're embodied in that space, but you're also interacting with content in that space. So there's no longer that side-by-side division. It's It's all one thing. It's a lot easier to manage, and that's why I think it might be better Long term for people to relate that way. Yeah, no that that is um one of the more compelling I think um convergence of two things inside this ecosystem that I've heard so far, which is really around you know people seeking you know or or trying to solve a problem specifically what it sounds like uh, mental health and obviously that's one aspect of it. We've heard that a couple times uh, use cases around VR and AR for mental health, but then having you know the new forms of uh, whether it's collaboration, whether it's, you know, um, kind of what you just said in terms of like bill of materials for that specific uh, event, um, and that also being a VR experience. Um, so again, it, it's taking what you're building, what someone else is building, where they're seeing traction, and you are a tool, you know, a uh, a c- kind of commercial use case um, and a relationship for that. So that's pretty interesting for sure. You know, talk about the... 
we, we tend to have three questions for every guest as as we kind of send them off, which is, you know, what inning you personally think we are in terms of like, quote unquote, the metaverse, you know, baseball's one to nine innings, one through nine. Um, what do you think, uh, what inning we're in? Yeah, I, I guess, I guess three. I think I, I just kind of recalling back to what I thought earlier. I think there was a first phase with the uh, behind closed doors VR and, and high end simulation stuff to the commercial available stuff. And that was like 2014 or so. And we had to plug them into computers and they were really kind of nerdy and niche. But now we broke out of that inning too, was maybe standalone devices that most people would use. Like my family uses them for fitness and, and playing around. And that's the stage two. I think we're in, we're just about into stage three or inning three, third inning with, um, with these mixed reality devices. So I, I'd probably say that sounds accurate to me as far as how many stages we are away from a persistent all day use, most of economic activity and social life existing in some kind of, you know, digital reality. I think that's probably a ways away. I think we're about a third of the way there, maybe. Great. And then one project, I mean, you did talk about a couple projects uh, were interesting, but maybe you have one more in the back of your mind. Uh, one project that, uh, uh, that really excites you. As far as Noda goes? Just in general. I mean, it, whether it's, it's Noda specific or outside of Noda, but specific my, to the AR, VR, you know, space. Yeah. My, my keenest interest at the moment is the kind of, I think, of parallel trends of machine learning and AI and then um, blockchain or Web3. So I, I consider myself kind of on the, on the track of immersive technologies now. And I see those next to me and I'm, I'm most interested about the convergence of those things. So I, I play around with ideas, I, I poke at things, I try other people's projects on both sides of those tracks, and I'm, I'm curious, most interested in projects that are putting those together in new ways. I think there's a huge potential there for that competition. And lastly, question number three is, you know, the hype around the metaverse, is it, uh, you know, overhyped, underhyped, um, or perfectly, you know, balanced in terms of the hype that uh, we're hearing today? Uh, well, it, it ebbs and flows. I think at the moment, uh, I would say trending towards over overhype for where we are now and for how long it'll be before this is um, what's kind of being imagined and sort of talked about and promised. I think at the moment, we're at a stage, a couple stages back from where that hype would be the right the right tone. So I, I would expect that there would be a, um, a, a little bit of a, what they call it, a trough of disappointment after this level of hype. I think there's going to be a building phase that fulfills some of these use cases in small and targeted ways. So uh, I'm, I'm happy. I've seen maybe t this is my second hype cycle and I'm, I'm, I've been through the first drop and now I'm seeing that second one rise of hype. And I, I, I always like it because it brings a lot of validity to the, the scene. It's easier to talk to people about the project now, but it is, uh, it's inevitable that that level of hype can't be sustained. So there will be kind of a retreat, I think. And then, and then people will keep building. Uh, there's, there's always great things that happen in those quiet moments when the hype has moved to some other area. So sure, maybe at the moment overhyped. Cool. Yeah, we, we get a lot of that uh, same kind of uh, tone and feeling, just given the level of hype that has has been out there in terms of headline news versus you know what's being built. You know that is it. You know Noda.io is where you can find more uh, about the company and kind of see all the cool things that they're doing. You know I appreciate Brian for you coming on, sharing your product, the story, um, and good luck on everything. We'll speak soon. Thanks, Sean. Really appreciate it. Take care. That's great. You know, thanks, Brian, for coming on uh, once again. And we'll talk in the future um, about what continuing to build there. You know, this next one here that we're about to have is is Arom Ibrahim. Um, super fascinating. You know, he is viewed as, you know, a leader in this space and has been ranked so many times across, you know, the globe in terms of uh, his impact in VR. He's from Nigeria. Um, again, going back to the concept of, you know, VR, AR, metaverse type concepts is actually bringing the world the world closer together uh, in many different ways because it allows cultures to experience cultures uh, in a way that is immersive and didn't exist uh, years and years ago. Uh, you heard a little bit about that um, with Vic Victory XR uh, as well, experiencing other kind of uh, environments um, that you just simply couldn't. So uh, we're going to have Rome here in a second and bring him on to discuss you know what he's doing, what he's building. Uh, he's the you know founder, chief metaverse officer at Experius Immersive. Um, so let's go ahead and bring him to this series.
All righty. So next up is our Rome Ibrahim. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. So I am in Miami, Florida. You are where exactly? So I'm currently in Zagreb, Croatia. Awesome. Nice. So you are in Croatia. You do a lot of your work in Nigeria, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. So what's fascinating is, is again, how, you know, this space is opening up the world um, to new participants that can experience, you know, what's happening here and build in, in this ecosystem. You're the chief metaverse officer at Experius Immersive. Um, you know, talk about yourself, your upbringing, and then also, you know, how are you involved in the space? I see, you know, I've seen plenty of the top 100 lists and things like that that you've made. So congrats on that. But just tell us a little bit more about, you know, what makes you so interesting. Thank you so much, um, Sean. Um, so my journey basically is an interesting one. Um, I'm from Abuja, Nigeria. Um, brought and bred in the capital city of Nigeria. Um, I'm the first born in a family of five. I have three amazing sisters and um, a brother who's the last born. Uh, so my journey into XR has been super amazing. My my, my first experience with the VR headset was in uh, 2016 when I attended uh, a meta event in, in Abuja, the capital city. And that was like the first time I was able to use the Oculus Go headset, right? And I, when I when I put it over my face, I had a VR experience of the Taj Mahal in India. Oh, wow. right? so imagine me being in Nigeria and being virtually in India. The experience was just mind blowing. And I told myself, I just have to jump on this, right? And um, I put together a team made up of close friends, and we just built a startup called Experience Immersive. And um, I remember saving up to buy our first headset, which was the Quest One. And um, we still treasure it up to today. Like it's still our pride and joy, right? So for us, XR is is a tool to make amazing content that showcases the the real impact currently going on in Africa and just um, sharing stories that can really transform our future generation. Yeah, no, that that's obviously inspiring um, to say the least. You know, talk about you know I think what a lot of people try to kind of dissect within the concept of the metaverse. And again, that's the point of the this super series is really trying to distill it, show the relevant, you know, use cases, what it's being used for, removing kind of the hype around it, um, and really get down to the core of like, you know, what is this space? So from your point of view, and, and obviously you built a business around this, what is your definition? What are the use cases that you think are being solved here um, within the metaverse from your point of view? So for us, coming from um, a developmental part of the world, like um, more, more like a developing nations, right? Technology is is a huge player, right? In terms of enabling um, so many sectors to to be transformed. So for us as experts, we are really focusing on um, three sectors, which is education, um, arts and culture, and also tourism. We believe these 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 sectors are really impactful for Africa and for education. It's just seeing how we can leverage on the technology, especially augmented reality, because on the continent, we have close to 500 million people that have access to mobile devices, which is a huge market for for the AR for the AR space, right? So leveraging on AR to create content that kids can use to learn in the classroom and also at home, because we notice most of them don't visualize what they're being taught in the classroom, which will also translate to performances in some school-based examinations. So teaching the students about um, STEM and also building it around AR will help them to see some topics and also subject matters within their own space and they can learn better. In terms of arts and culture, um, to be sincere, like Africa is super blessed in terms of rich heritage, rich cultural experiences, but a lot of people cannot physically come down to engage with it, right? So we want to see how we can digitize it and make it available in virtual platforms for people to learn about our culture and also our heritage. And also tourism is, is super impactful because that's more like a revenue earner for most countries on the continent. Tourism is like a huge earner for them. and then. Logging in XR into it, we believe, will help bring more people to the continent because they can see before they actually come and see how amazing the place is and make some insightful decisions about their trip. Interesting. Yeah. So the education space makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think some of the more prestigious, call it educational universities, lower, uh, you know, first grade, second grade, all that, you know, some of the more prestigious ones benefit from teachers, but also the resources they have around a lot of the physical stuff, physical buildings. Um, I think XR, VR, totally bring down that wall, right? Because what it allows with a $400 device 
in some countries cheaper, some countries more expensive. Uh, and, and again, there'll be a whole range of devices that ultimately opens up the door for, you know, digital kind of recreations of what uh, some of the best universities may look and feel like, but in a digital form. What, um, speak more on the education side, like how are you seeing it used um, in an educational setting? Okay, great. Um, let me give you a scenario, for example. Um, so my brother came back from, from school. He was taught to, he was taught to draw the human skeleton. Right, so he's somebody that has never seen a physical skeleton before, right? So I just um, put up a 3D model of the skeleton um, from Sketchfab and created an AR experiences experience out of it, and um, I gave him my mobile device and he just shared it in our sitting room and environment, and he was super excited because he's somebody that has never seen a skeleton before, except in textbooks, was seeing it in his own sitting room, right, and being amazed about how unique it is and be, being able to basically study it in detail and give like definitions for each part of the human body is something that will be that is really impactful. Right. So for us it's just plugging into plugging in XR to enable visualizations in learning and training because we have a lot of students we have a lot of students currently on the continent that um are undergoing through they are basically undergoing technical courses, for example engineering and sciences and the hardware are not available in the classroom can be made available using XR. Interesting. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, the educational side makes a lot of sense. Um, and the immersion, how immersed it sounds like the analysis or the, the reviewing of the skeleton was an a, a immersive experience yeah. where, you know, I think you get layers deep, uh, into what's going on there. Talk yeah. about the, the next step, which I, I think your, your, your second focal point is really around, um, culture. culture, right? So arts and culture, I, I find it, fascinating is there any experience that you can highlight in terms of how you how kind of culture is being showcased to the world um through the form of like xr and vr yeah sure um so during the pandemic um a lot of museums on the continent were under lock and key right it a typical example was um the emc shalom museum here in um, in lagos nigeria which is like the, the largest private art museum in nigeria with close to ten thousand art collections on display right so um, at the peak of the pandemic, they were looking for um, an avenue to engage with their clients and their um, customers in terms of um, art enthusiasts and um, curators. Um, so we, 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 they reached out to us and we had a partnership whereby we digitized the entire museum in 360 VR right, because we were looking for a platform and a medium for people to adopt easily right, and not be bothered about buying a VR headset per se because that's quite expensive for most people here in Africa to buy. Right? But we're able to leverage on 360 VR and um, digitize the entire museum, right? close to a thousand artworks that were curated for that particular experience. And then um, when we're done and we share the link with them, they made it available on their website, especially at the peak of the pandemic. And the feedback we got was close to 10,000 people were able to see that right? using their devices. So imagine 10,000 people going to a museum virtually from anywhere in the world. You could talk wow. from Japan to the States. People were able to take a tour of the entire museum. And what we did was we worked closely with the curators to get the stories behind each and every sculpture or artwork there. Right? So during the tour, um, the audience can click on a hotspot and learn about that particular artwork. So those are some of the scenarios that has helped so far to digitize our culture. Because most, most relics, most sculptures are going more like, should I say, into extinction, right? People are not documenting it, but with XR, we can preserve that history for our kids to be able to experience what we're currently enjoying at the moment. Yeah. So again, on the on the on the second one, it sounds very similar to the first area, which was immersive. It, it's more immersive. It's more detailed. The skeleton. Now you can be more detailed in terms of reviewing the skeleton, right? Um, the culture, the art, the where the story behind the art. Understanding that as well. Talk about tourism, because again, I think you're seeing kind of this chain where, you know, people are getting more educated. Um, people are getting more immersed in art, which then could have a feedback loop in terms of uh, more tourism. How are, How is tourism being implemented in terms of opening up the, or opening up the curtain for people to figure out, Hey, we want to go to this part of the world. Let's experience it first in, in VR, AR before we maybe we go and, and maybe any companies or anything you, you, you've experienced at all uh, that's working in that space. Yeah. Um, so I would love to share a project of my friend in Botswana. Um, so he's currently working on, um, he's partnering with 
the the Botswana diamond industry, more like a corporation there, to tell the story and the journey of the Botswana diamond from Africa to the rest of the world, right? Because we notice that most people buy diamonds, but they don't know where they are gotten from. They don't know the story behind those diamonds being on their wrist or over their neck, right? So it is what he did was he was able to he used the 360 VR camera, right, to document the journey of the raw diamond from when it is excavated, processed, and finally sold to the end users, and basically capture the story and the history behind it. Right. So for us, we feel XR being fused with tourism can give creators and artists an opportunity to document their stories, their journeys, right, and share it with the rest of the world. And that experience alone has helped a lot of people to understand about where the Botswana diamonds comes from and um, how they can really treasure it because a lot of energy and effort is put into um, getting that um, diamond out of the Earth's surface. So being able to learn about it and how it came about to help them to treasure it um, for their future. Yeah, you know what it sounds like more and more is, you know, a lot of people talk about how, you know, uh, AR and VR may actually, you know, uh, make people less connected. But I think what you're actually hearing is is more global connection because of it, as opposed to the opposite, yeah, um, sure. you know, it may not, you may not be as connected to the person right next to you, but you're, you're connected to the world potentially if you're using it in, in certain ways. Um, you know, we, we tend to ask every guest three questions. Um, and before we, we, we end it, you know, the first one is really around what are some interesting, what's the most interesting kind of like project that you're seeing in this space that kind of excites you? Ah, interesting. Uh, it's a lot, actually. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I love what Mark is doing with um, the Horizon, right? Even if it's it's a crazy uh, project, but it's it's something I feel that would really connect a lot of people, irrespective of your geographical location or, or or what you're currently doing. But being able to have like a virtual version of yourself in an environment you can customize to tell your own story is just super amazing. Okay, and then the metaverse. We like to, you know, what, where are we in that process? You know, I, I like baseball. Um, innings one through nine. So one through nine. What stage do you think we're in? I feel um, five. Five. Okay, cool. So you think we're like right in the middle, huh? Yes. Um, interesting. And last question is really around the hype around the metaverse. Do you think it is overhyped, underhyped, or perfectly hyped? Uh, should I see? It's in between perfectly and um, overhyped, <laughs> funny enough. The metaverse is it's, it's there, right? But we are still trying to understand how it will fully work, right? Understand some key concepts in terms of its operations, implementation. But well, businesses are jumping into it super fast, which is good. But I believe with time, we need to have like a real focus and a real part to building sustain, something sustainable. Cool. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. You know, last little thing for you is, you know, where people can find more about what you're doing in the metaverse and and maybe uh, your company in, in general. Just share. I'll give you a, a second before we uh, we head off. Very great. Thank you so much. Um, so the can reach us at um, our website, which is um, www.expressmsuit.com. I'm available also on LinkedIn at um, Arum Ibrahim. Uh, you can just search for me. I guess I'll pop up due to my activities. <laughs> in the cool. Yeah. Awesome, Arum. Well, you know, thanks for coming on and joining us for this session. Uh, you know, with that, we'll let you go and, and good luck in the future. Great. Thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. All right. Aram, good luck. Uh, and thanks for coming on. Now we have Daniel Pickle, you know, the CEO of Chatbot. Um, you know, he, he's a developer, a builder. Uh, and from talking with him before, I think that is ultimately what you're going to see here. Similar to Aram, I think, that, you know, he's, I believe, out of Croatia. He'll, he'll explain a little bit more where he is today. Um, but he will, you know, uh, again, it just emphasizes more around the global nature of this ecosystem. And, you know, they're building a lot of stuff on the creative side, the marketing side. So we've, we've gone through like education, travel, um, we've gone from, from the investment side to, you know, healthcare side to now it's, you know, around marketing and creative. Uh, so hopefully we can learn more about what he is doing, what ecosystems are thriving uh, and where this, you know, what he sees as the future in the space. So uh, let's bring on Daniel. All right, we have Daniel Pickle, the CEO of Chatbot. Welcome to our series, uh, and and just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, so that the audience is fully aware of what you're doing 
uh, in the space around VR, AR, um, and just chatbot. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a AR VR developer from Croatia. My company is called Chatbot because uh, I started with Chatbots in 2016. We brought them to Croatia and we started business marketing, Facebook advertising, CRMs, and Chatbots, of course, uh, back back then. And in the last three years, I I went into let's say another direction, and that is uh, augmented reality. Uh, I I found out uh, about uh, Spark AR, which is a platform to build uh, AR filters for Instagram and uh, Facebook uh, Meta. And after that, uh, I started building uh, filters for Snapchat and uh, recently for TikTok. So I, I'm like a specialist in AR, social AR. I called it social AR. And uh, I think th that those channels are currently the best because they have a large audience. Most people have uh, those applications already installed on their mobile phone. Uh, big player that is coming is, of course, uh, WebAR. But uh, WebAR uh, have some advantages and disadvantages. Ad advantages are that uh, WebAR doesn't requ require uh, installation of, of any app. You can access it through default uh, web browser. And uh, socially, are anybody anybody got it? Uh, I like to make uh, tests and some new experiments with uh, Spark AR mostly, uh, and I'd like to test some new things with. Uh, let's say world there are uh, I built uh, this first uh, drivable car for Spark uh, I made some projects with uh, AR dinosaurs walkable dinosaurs and then I uh, uh, made uh, this NFT collection out of it and uh, that's that's it in, in short uh, about interesting it. yeah so talk about you know social AR specifically Across platforms, it sounds like, again, this isn't just happening on one platform. It's happening across multiple platforms. What are people doing in social AR that gives you, I guess, the the, the confidence to build a business around this um, in terms of AR, VR? Like, what are you seeing from some of the, whether it's advertisers or marketers or these platforms that gives you that confidence that this is something that's going to continue to grow over the next, call it three, five, ten years? Okay, so each platform has uh, his own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I would say that Snapchat is currently the top AR building platform. Lens Studio is the, is the application for building AR uh, experiences. And they got uh, the most advanced uh, app with machine learning and uh, physics and so on. Uh, the problem is that they don't have such such large amount of users. Meta, on the other hand, and Instagram, of course, uh, have the largest currently population, and their platform is not so advanced, but it is it is advanced, but not so as uh, as uh, Snapchat. And there is uh, there is a new player in town, and there is TikTok. I mean, it's not new, but uh, new in in the terms of uh, AR building custom AR experiences, and uh, their platform is something uh, somewhere between. Snapchat and uh, somewhere between Instagram, Spark AR. So people are, uh, as I as I'm seeing, uh, using the complete potential and uh, possibilities that those platforms uh, can give you. And uh, there, are, I, I I saw many different uh, and awesome, great uh, AR creators. People who are doing this uh, like to call them AR creators, and I see see every day really fantastic and awesome stuff on on all three platforms twitter is really good channel for this uh, niche ar is really good there and uh, i think that uh, uh, it, it is it is still new uh, especially here uh, where i'm from in croatia people don't understand the possibilities and what what can they achieve in uh, marketing pr and i don't know sales even sales with these technologies so uh, we are constantly educating people and presenting them what it is, what can they have, and uh, what will they get because they can have better sales, better, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, they can uh, prosper in, in short terms. Got it. So there's social and then there's more commerce. You know, I think I've seen where uh, companies, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's retail, 
using AR experiences, whether it's trying on glasses for the first time, um, what kind of, I guess, unique projects have you seen that, uh, whether it's retail or uh, more on the commerce side, where it's actually enticing people to buy something? What have you seen on the, on the commerce side that excites you, whether it's AR and VR uh, within these platforms? Okay, so uh, when we speak about e-commerce, uh, for, first niche that uh, come to my mind is uh, um, furniture. Okay, mm. it, it, it is uh, it is the most common thing because uh, when you see those beds, chairs, or tables inside right right inside your home, that is the trigger that you need, and you can instantly buy it online. You don't need to go to the shop or to the store to see it in live, but you can buy it uh, right away. Also, uh, stuff I that I like in AR uh, and e-commerce, of course, is uh, try-on feature. Try-on features uh, like for shoes, uh, we have feet recognition on, uh, we have it on Snapchat, and we have it also in WebAR. And uh, uh, companies that implemented this uh, technology into their uh, web shop, uh, they, they 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 are telling that the percentage of conversion is rapidly going growing, like I don't know, thirty or 30, 40 percent, and uh, reclamations uh, they they lower the percentage of reclamations, I think around thirty percent, which is awesome because people uh, can see those shoes right away, they can try it, and they know. If they like it, they, they can feel it right or right on sure. their their yeah. feet, and uh, it, it is really really interesting in technology. Also, there is um, body recognition, uh, so you can try any any type of clothes, shirts, t-shirts, hoodies, I don't know, jackets, uh, trousers. So this is something uh, that is uh, let's say exploding in the last few months. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, we've heard the same thing anecdotally of hearing a lot of. Um commercial use cases for AR with snapping again, the leader in the space, just given they, they started out with filters and then kind of progressively have moved that direction, you know, yeah. talk about um, like bigger picture now, which is the, the, the point of this whole super series is really around the concept of the metaverse. Um, you know, AR is going to be an important aspect of this reality that we're, we're talking about, you know, how do you think about that word, the metaverse? You know, what problems do you think are being solved? I think that's how we like to frame it instead of trying to define it. Like, what is the metaverse? It's more what problems are being solved by the investment in this concept that is reality. I mean, you just talked about some use cases uh, where you're, again, taking a digital, physical, typical, typically a, a, a physical environment, moving it into a digital environment, whether, whether it's trying on shoes um, and basically speeding up the process of purchase and potentially uh, reducing the amount of, you know, refunds and things like that. Um, talk about your thoughts around the metaverse as a whole, where AR, uh, augmented reality, plays in that space. Um, anything you have around that concept? Okay. So uh, as metaverse was the hype buzzword in the last few months, it, it is right now it's like uh, slowing down. Okay. And uh, for me, metaverse uh, isn't uh, just VR or AR. I think there is more like combination of AR, VR, and there is mixed reality. Okay, so uh, combination of uh, this uh, uh, AR, uh, I mean mi mixed reality with, with the with the real world. So you can combine all those uh, together. And uh, right now, uh, it, it is hard to define. Uh, if you ask 10 people, uh, each one will have their own explanation of what metaverse really is. And uh, right now, we don't have this uh, finally unique uh, uni uh, metaverse. And uh, I think that in the near future, we will have like tens or, or maybe even hundreds or thousands different metaverses, those virtual worlds, which will be uh, interconnected and you can easily uh, jump from one to another and uh, s uh, companies will build those uh, interconnectors let's call them zapier for metaverse so you can easily go from minecraft like uh, metaverse to i don't know some 4k hyper realistic ultra k uh, graphics and uh, people will uh, start to use it more and more uh, you can see that uh, those uh, mixed reality glasses are start to pop from uh, everywhere. Uh, people are unboxing uh, this uh, Oculus Quest Pro. They just received it two days ago. 
we 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 have uh, Oculus three, I think, in the January, if I remember correct. And the final, the best uh, glasses are coming, and those are um, Apple glasses, which we don't know how they will how will they look, but uh, they will certainly be some, let's say, re- revolution or uh, new product. I'm sure of that. Yeah, what was, what was your your basic thoughts around the announcement of the Quest Pro? Uh, I mean, uh, I I saw it uh, how it looks and uh, how it feels. I'm using uh, uh, right now Meta Quest uh, Two, Oculus Quest. Sorry, right yeah. now uh, I start with uh, uh, Samsung Go, then uh, Oculus One uh, and Oculus Two. Probably I will buy uh, number three and maybe this Pro. But I I I think I will save my money for the <laughs> for the Apple glasses, and uh, of course, I would like to uh, check these uh, snap, snap, snaps, uh, spectacles from uh, Snapchat, and uh, I, I would like to see those uh, s- uh, small glasses which uh, everybody is talking about uh, from uh, Facebook. They they have this uh, Ray-Ban, but those are not uh, the real uh, AR glasses. So the future will tell. Uh, I think we can expect uh, smaller and lighter glasses, even lenses which are already available i saw them uh on the internet and uh, uh mobile phone will go will go away very soon huh. interesting yeah so i think that that's the um that's a big statement um but it, but, <laughs> but but you can also see how that possibly could happen maybe not necessarily go away but have kind of a complementary product that goes along with it um I, again you're seeing it with all of the heart like Ironically, these aren't, these aren't even hardware manufacturers. They're turning into hardware manufacturers. But you're seeing it everywhere from, again, Ray-Ban to Snap to Meta to, you know, TikTok to, uh, you know, Razer to, the, you name it. Everyone is gunning yeah. for uh, trying to build the hardware that's potentially going to be the operating platform uh, of how we experience everyday life. Um, you know, I have three questions I tend to ask everyone as we close out kind of this session, which is number one, in, in baseball terms, um, what inning do you think we are in terms of the metaverse? And what I mean by that is, are we early or are we late? So one to nine, what, what one being early, very early, nine being very late. Where do you think we are uh, from that spectrum? Uh, you mean, where are we now? Or Yeah, where do you think we are in terms of building out from where this could possibly be, which sounds like... Oh, okay. I understand. Have, yeah. We are very, very early. I, I would say two or three. Got it. Okay, cool. What's I, I guess one project uh, that have you seen or that you've seen that excites you? Project in uh, metaverse project. Yeah, anything metaverse related, I mm. AR related. I mean, again, it all kind of uh, all this stuff morphs into a single thing. So uh, probably anything you've ever worked on or anything you've heard about is probably. Well, <laughs> it, it is hard to choose one project. I don't know. I like these uh, new digital clothes, for example, and I'm waiting uh, those platforms. I'm, I'm building uh, air experiences to have this body recognition so I can build them too. All, right now, it, it, this is only Snapchat, but I'm uh, waiting for TikTok and uh, uh, Spark AR from uh, Meta to have these possibilities. Got it. Okay. And then last question is around the hype. Uh, around the metaverse, do you think it is overhyped, underhyped, or perfectly kind of hyped um, today? In your view, uh, if you if you asked me this question uh, two months ago, <laughs> I would uh, I would say it's okay. But I I think that it was really overhyped, and uh, we need to slow down. But as technology progress, and uh, in the terms of AI, which exploded in less few months, I, I I'm also into AI in a couple of last months, and it's really exploding this image to text to image, text to video, text to 3D. It is really exploding, and I think the technology will really, really fast, going really fast, and it will expand, and uh, this real metaverse, we need. We don't need to wait those metaverses so long as we thought that we need to do it. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think the, the term metaverse is overhyped. The technology that's being built, I think, is underhyped. Um, yep. so, so I agree with you kind of in that concept, you know, um, that is it for today. You know, Daniel pickle, the CEO of chatbot, uh, I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us everything that you are doing in this space. Um, and with that, yeah, we'll, uh, move on to our next session. All right. Thanks, Daniel. And, uh, again, good luck. Uh, now we have Andrea, uh, and she is the co-founder CEO of Numena. 
um, you know, very talented. And, you know, she has a company, again, around architecture. We had Archeo before. Um, we had the opening video, which highlighted some of the, you know, concepts around, you know, uh, uh, design and, and in, in, uh, in, in interior design and, and uh, architecture as well. Uh, Numena, you know, she's a developer, builder. Um, and Andrea will come on here in a second and share with us what she is doing at Numena. This will be the last one. We'll wrap up there. Uh, but again, I think so far, you know, these have been 12 or so guests that have really kind of f created a full circle around what is happening in this space. So let's bring on Andrea and bring her on here to help us learn more about Numena. Alrighty, we are here with Andrea Ayan Kojukaru. Um, she is the co-founder of Numena. She's the CEO of Numena. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, so you're doing a lot of interesting stuff um, within, you know, VR, um, you know, AR, and the, and the whole like metaverse space. Uh, the the point of you know this session today and and all the guests we've had on is really kind of go behind the curtains of what's happening in the space. Understand, you know what the developers are building, how the gamers are playing, how real commercial business is being developed. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing at Numena, uh, and then we'll go from there. I am a VR developer. I'm also an architect. And my entire company comes into the space uh, from architecture as a background. And we believe we have a unique angle to virtual reality because as architects, we understand the connection between space and behavior in space, human behavior in space. Um, and we're interested in finding out in what ways is this particular technology transformational? Because we, we believe all technology changes you and we are working on projects that explore how this particular spatial technology can change you. Got it. So, so talk about, you know, what are you trying to do specifically at Numena yourself, um, what kind of value are you trying to bring to the table that you don't think exists today in the current environment of, call it the 2D world? We believe that transformational tools should be made transparent. Developers should be clear to the end users how those transformational tools exactly work, how the users will be affected. And we believe in putting the controls in the hands of the users. So within that framework, we are pursuing two types of projects. The first type is looking at how these tools can change and transform the individual and how the individual can take control of that process and how these tools can transform communities. So how that looks like at a level of the community. And we have projects going on on both sides of, of, of this. Got it. And, and are these, these projects, uh, I'm assuming, are, again, more based off of you know, your, your background, which is architect. You know, we've seen a lot of use cases around architecture where, you know, seeing spaces in a in a virtual environment, in a kind of 3D world, um, and whether it's building, you know, a, a building from the ground up, uh, whether it's retrofitting inside of the building, um, you know, talk about, you know, some of the use cases that you think VR brings to architecture um, that doesn't exist. Like what kind of tools, like from a, like a, a, a valuable use case that you think can be extracted in 3D that is just totally different from VR? Um, so we can understand, you know, what all the hype is about specifically in, you know, metaverse and, and, and 3D, VR, AR, mixed reality um, as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's start with the individual level. Uh, because of virtual reality, architecture for the first time can become someone, something everyone does. It, it doesn't cost millions or tens of millions, hundreds of millions anymore to experience space. You can put a headset on and you can play around with designing a house or with the proportions of your living room um, without actually putting the money to, to experience that change and how that space makes you feel. And we have our own in-house tool in which we put clients that come to us for architectural services. And we experience little miracles um, all the time. We have had clients design their own kitchens, design their own terraces, furnish their own living room. And the degree of freedom and to some extent, personal transformation that these people experience when they go and customize things that previously they thought were way out of bounds for, for their abilities um, is just amazing to see. And at the, at the level of communities and society, we have a big project coming up um, 
very, very soon, so I can't give too many details, but it's looking at the idea of virtual urbanism and how we can use virtual reality, not just for architecture, but at the urban scale. And what does that mean for those the communities that potentially can form or be transformed uh, by having a tool that allow us allows us to tackle such large, large scales? Yeah, no, interesting. You know, speaking of communities, obviously, you know, where are you located today? We've, 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 uh, as I said, mentioned before, you know, there's a lot of globalization happening in the VR space. Um, I think a lot of that has to do because, you know, because it is VR, because it is, you can transport in a sense um, to other communities in in real time or the community is in space, I guess, um, that uh, it's different than, than some of the other uh, kind of platforms that exist today. Um, You know, talk about, you know, obviously where you're from, why you think, uh, VR has potentially taken off in terms of maybe the developer community um, where you are uh, and just globally in general, what's your thoughts around, you know, the globalization of VR in terms of talent and development? You mean from the, from the implementation perspective? Just in general, like from talent, from a talent perspective, we've noticed that talent is much more global than kind of traditional technology. Um, I think uh, like 10, 15 years ago, a lot of the technology talent was located in Silicon Valley you know, mm-hmm. and what you've seen, I think, over the last, call it five, 10 years, um, is a migration outside of that, uh, and actually some of it forming in other countries. Um, talk about, you know, talent in general. Are you, f- where you are local, you know, what's the talent look like relative to, let's say, you know, five, 10 years ago? Uh, is it continuing to blossom up, um, uh, stay the same? Uh, just your, your views on global talent and, and where it is. We don't think of local talent anymore. <laughs> I guess this is the oh, that's a good way to the, put it. Yeah, the answer to your question. We we hire people from all over. We we do not take into account uh, the local community in 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 any way anymore. Communities are now formed primarily over the internet. They might have local chapters where people meet in person, but uh, all the communities I'm I'm part of, including uh, my own people, were all over the world. So. That's that's absolutely the reality today. But there's a second angle to this that has to do with VR specifically. Because it's a new technology and we're still figuring out what this is about, we're actually having people from dif- different disciplines step into what until now or, or what many see as a technology field or as something that's for maybe people with a background in computer games. So we come from architecture. There are people that come from theater, for example. There are people that come from all sorts of other, other backgrounds and disciplines uh, to produce you know, award-winning uh, virtual applications. So the, the shift in talent doesn't have to do necessarily with, with geography, although that shift is definitely massive, what's going on right now. It has to do with uh, breaking disciplinary boundaries. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, you're seeing a lot of, there's a lot of creatives in the space, um, just in general. And I think, again, architect, gaming, creation, you know, uh, you know, music, other things I think are you're seeing a lot of elements of that. You talked about art and and um, uh, and some other areas that you, you mentioned. You know, speak a little bit about maybe you've been doing this for a while now. Some of like what what is your favorite like tools that you use that are you know VR AR related outside of you know some of the the projects that you guys are doing internally. The beauty of being in a new industry is that. Um... The situation with the tools that we have at our disposal is a bit of a mess. And for people like myself, that's really exciting. And we started, and when we started a company as architects in virtual reality, we we realized that, all right, um, the obvious thing to do would be not to design architecture in a with a using a traditional 2D screen-based 3D modeling tool, uh, is to just do it in inside VR. But there was no tool for that at the time. So that's how we decided to build our own in-house mm. tool. So speaking of tools and workflows, um, we started by building our own and that has grown and grown and taking us down interesting paths. So the, um, there are many, many hardships, including like, oh, we don't have the right kind of tools. Um, but those opened up, at least for us, uh, absolutely humongous opportunities as well, because we embrace the fact that we need to make our own and we wrote our own tools. Yeah, wow. That's, um, yeah, it's builders building, you know, where, where, where nothing exists. Um, or limited stuff exists, and and obviously you've seen the ecosystem continue to grow and grow and grow. So more and more tools, and you know it's it's the ecosystem helping the ecosystem. As someone makes a tool for you that maybe you didn't have the time and resources to build, 
um, they're building that, and then you're building something that potentially they're using, and and kind of that that virtuous cycle. You know, um, speak about you know some of the the different platforms that are out there. Obviously, you 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 built some of your projects. Um, you know, there's Oculus, obviously, or Meta um, in terms of their store. Uh, there's other platforms that exist as well. Like talk about the ecosystems on the respective platforms. Uh, you know, where's your general focus at? Is it, you know, metas or is it some of the others? Right now it's meta because that's where the users are. So the most popular headset at the moment is the quest. And, um, we are all hoping in a community that more competition will enter that space. And we all believe that it will, uh, it has to. For many, many reasons, we we need more competition in terms of the ecosystems that are able to attract users. Uh, because for us as developers, we need to deploy our applications in ecosystem that already have at least some degree of users um, inside them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, in the in the the mobile phone era, obviously the two there's it's basically a two ecosystem. You know, it eventually became a two ecosystem race. Um, do you think the, you know, this space is going to be probably somewhat similar? I think a lot of people are waiting for Apple to come out with something, uh, which keeps, you know, some of the iOS developers kind of probably somewhat engaged uh, on that space and building there. Um, you know, do you envision this being, you know, I, I doubt it'll be a, a single ecosystem, um, but in general, it, it, it probably, as we've seen, you know, whether it's computing, whether you have, you know, Apple again and Microsoft, and then, you know, on the mobile side, you have Google and 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 uh, Apple, do you think a VR slash AR is going to be a similar dynamic? Um, or do you think it's going to be, you know, multiple, multiple different platforms that exist in this space relative to historical norms? My hope is multiple, but there's a caveat to that. We really need standards. And many, many teams with brilliant people are in the industry are working right now on standards. Because even if you look at the situation right now with mobile apps, it costs small indie developers a huge amount of money and effort to develop for Android and then for iOS uh, because they're not compatible with each other. So there is a fair amount of headache uh, in developing and maintaining those two different versions of the same game or of the same application. So I am hoping we will have a lot of platforms in the ecosystem. I think that is very healthy for developers. Uh, because the more options we have, of course, the more we can demand and the, the friendlier they have to be towards us developers. But but they really need to agree on standards, because if we are in a situation where we have to develop and maintain the same application for 10 different platforms and they all require 10 different types of inputs and technical requirements, then we're just not going to see much improvement. Then developers are going to give up. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. You know, like 10 years ago, we made a, an application and, and and building for, you know, the Android ecosystem was a mess, just given that, you know, there was different form factors. So you weren't only just building for the platform, you were building for the device. Um, and that was even a challenge, which is, you know, I think part of the reasoning why, you know, Apple at the time had a single device with a single form, fa uh, form factor, um, which made it easier for developers to build on. And it speaks to what you're talking about, where, you know, Yes, the developer can get leverage if you know there's multiple and there's like competition going on, but does the complexity over overweigh the you know leverage that you would be getting in terms of let's say revenue share and things like that? Uh, big picture, um, there's some sort of balance in there. It's probably hard to you know judge uh, where that eventually lands. Um, you know, talk about the Meta Quest Pro. I don't know if you or your colleagues have you know tested it out, learned about the specs, seen what it does. Um, you know, any idea of, you know, this is different from the Quest 2. Uh, clearly, it's a different product. It's much more around, you know, mixed reality as opposed to just purely virtual reality. What does that do to someone like yourself and, and the, the company you're building? Um, given architect, I think, you know, architecture in general, it, it's a collaborate, uh, collaborative effort uh, that tends to happen there. Um, talk about the new device and, you know, your just initial thoughts on, on what that means and signals to the rest of, you know, VR, AR and, and the world. I have not tested a new device because they're they are illegal in Germany, and actually wow. this also speaks to 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 a lot of things. Um, when when Meta decided all of a sudden that they're going to force people to use Facebook accounts and eliminate mm. Oculus accounts on the user side, um, the German government sued them, and that is still ongoing. So uh, the day after the Quest 
Pro was announced, um, it was also announced in Germany that um, selling them in, in Germany is not permitted yet. So it's a, it's a good example of the turmoil going on sometimes in, in the ecosystem and the kind of difficulties that we're dealing with on many levels. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's probably why, obviously, they, they within the last you know six months, I think it was like six months ago, now you can have uh, a Quest account or a meta uh, quest account, as opposed to, yep. you know, using your Facebook login. So that was, that's obviously to try to allevi- alleviate uh, that issue that's going on there. Um, you know, we have, you know, a couple more minutes here uh, until we branch off, but we, we, we tend to try to, you know, have three questions for every guest. Um, first is, you know, what inning do you think we are in terms of calling, call it the, the metaverse? Um, it's a baseball game. We love baseball games, but one through nine is essentially how, we're thinking about it. What inning do you think we're in? One through nine. Two and a half. Two and a half. That's right in the ballpark of, of a lot of people. I mean, we, we had someone that uh, the game hasn't even started yet. Uh, <laughs> and then we've had some people talk about, you know, the fourth inning. Um, the next question is really around, you know, what project, what's one project that you've seen um, outside of, again, your your what you're doing? And you could even use that as an example if you want, but that really excites you uh, generally. People trying to reinvent language and how we type to make that something more suited for the spatial affordances of virtual reality. Because if you've ever tried to type on a on a virtual keyboard, you you probably realize quite fast that it's an absolutely horrendous thing. So if we want to be able to type in this space, we really need to rethink everything about keyboard and fingers. Yeah, no doubt. Did did you see the 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 Meta Connect event where they had the uh, the neural kind of ability to kind of type slash move things around uh, without even moving your fingers? I thought that was uh you know they bought Control C T R L I believe it uh, is is what it is you know like a couple of years ago, um, and I think people were questioning like what is this thing? And, and sure enough, now we're starting to see you know the ambition, which I think it just speaks to the problem they're trying to solve, which I think is what you talk about, um, which is trying to figure out ways to make you know, it much more uh, a seamless experience for typing, uh, less controllers, uh, more control without, you know, physical objects. Um, it's pretty fascinating. You know, last question. Do you think, you know, the metaverse is overhyped, underhyped, uh, or perfectly hyped? I don't think we really know what it is. So I would, I would stay neutral on that. In terms of what the media is writing on, what they seem to think the metaverse is definitely overhyped. Yeah. No, in they, terms of what I believe it is and what many people in the VR community think it is, um, we're, we're just at the beginning and it's underhyped. The true metaverse is underhyped. Sure, sure. That's funny. We've gotten like similar, uh, <clears throat> similar responses uh, where, you know, the term overhyped the actual building happening underneath the, t- the scenes, behind the scenes, which, you know, in the media, you're typically hearing about, you know, avatar legs and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and some other things, um, as opposed to, you know, we had a use case where someone was talking about uh, doctor training or surgery training uh, that's happening in the space. So, you know, preventing actually a live surgery to be your first surgery as a doctor and actually doing some of this stuff in, in virtual spaces is not only smarter, uh, but it's, you know, it's cheaper and, and more, uh, you know, productive in terms of the outcome. Um, but we don't really hear about that, you know, in terms of, you know, when you turn on the television every day. Um, so that's the stuff I think that you're elaborate, you're talking about, which is a lot of that kind of utility is being underhyped relative to call it the term um, metaverse. Um, cool. You know, with that, I wanted to give you one second to, you know, where people can find more about you uh, and your company and kind of just follow along some of the projects that you guys are building. Uh, it's best to get in touch with me over Twitter and LinkedIn uh, over the Numena handle. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, that is it. I appreciate you coming on today and we'll speak soon. Thank you so much. Alrighty. So that is it. Andrea, again, thank you for coming on here and all the guests that kind of presented their companies, their ideas, um, their beliefs. I think you saw a very strong um, uh, view in terms of where this is all headed. I think, again, focusing on use case over kind of idea and definition of a single term um, was the strategy here. And I think what you got from today, hopefully, was a lot 
of use cases that are tangible, that are big, um, a lot of energy around it. Um, there's obviously, you know, some balanced views as well in terms of where we are in that journey. Um, but I think, again, what you're hearing more and more again is really around this is an evolution around the computing platform, the future computing platform, where there's a, there's a lot of evidence and already companies being built that are successful. You know, Amal shared some of those at the beginning, Tipitat as well, because, you know, they're investing in many of these companies. You heard the energy coming from Zim, um, you know, Chatbot doing a lot in, in creative um, from Daniel. Noda, uh, again, .io has a lot of energy around it. Arkeo seems like something that, you know, is a incredible looking product slash company, and they are already successful today, I've raised uh, some money there uh, as well. And, you know, I think the future is bright in this space. And, you know, separating kind of the noise and headlines from what's actually happening and being built, I think is super important here. You know, the infrastructure and technology is ultimately the foundation of this because all of this is is computing. Um, and what that ultimately means for those building for this space, I think is important as well. You know, our belief, again, to quickly summarize, is anything that can be digitized, any physical things that can be digitized to improve outcomes and reduce costs will do so. You heard some of those today. Uh, whether again, it's simple things like wedding planning and having to travel to do that, um, or education and actually having you know a surgery education training happen uh, <clears throat> in a virtual environment as opposed to a live individual, um, I think goes a long way. Um, so that is it. You know, this was our super series around the metaverse. If you have any questions whatsoever, reach out to our team, team at averyco.com. That is T E A M at Avery, A V O R Y C O.com. That's our email address. You know, you can find us on Twitter at Avery Co. Um, or hit me, hit me on Twitter um, at underscore Sean David, S E A N D A V I D, uh, at Sean David. Um, and, you know, again, we have so much research that we do put out there. We're pretty transparent with everything we do on the research front. Uh, and again, we wanted to bring these, these conversations to light. Most of these conversations, we didn't necessarily have. Uh, a pre-conversation to go uh, going into it to ensure that you know these conversations were you know super authentic in terms of you know what's their true beliefs of this space. Uh, again, I think that's how research needs to be done. With that, we will end there. I hope you enjoyed the series, and this will be out all across uh, you know our different channels. So thanks again for joining us today. Have a good one.